Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity by Eugene McCarraher Narrated by Paul Bamer Prologue Once upon a time the world was enchanted. Rocks, trees, rivers, and rain pulsated with invisible forces, powers that enlivened and determined the affairs of tribes and empires as well. Though beholden to the caprice or providential design of a variety of spirits and deities, the world of enchantment could be commanded by magic or humbly beseeched through prayer. But, with the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and industrial capitalism in Europe, the company of spirits was evicted from the cosmos. If the medieval church had preserved the pagan phantoms in its sacraments and saintly relics, its sober and industrious Protestant antagonists began the demolition of enchantment. Gradually, the sciences dispelled the realm of mystery. The prose of reason hushed the poetry of superstition. Greed and calculation fostered callous disregard for the earth and the bonds of community. Dispossessed from their ancestral homes, the remnants of enchantment fled into our private chambers of fantasy or faith, and as science, technology, and capitalism come to embrace the entire globe, the enchanted specters of other peoples will be duly banished or sequestered as well. Entitled The Disenchantment of the World by the German sociologist and historian Max Weber, this story is the predominant account of modernity in the West and increasingly beyond, and capitalism plays a pivotal role in the course of releasing the making and exchange of goods from traditional restraints, capitalism evacuated sacredness from material objects and social relationships. Once capable of linking us to divinity or of binding us to one another, things lost their souls when they became commodities made and exchanged for profit. Avarice, once one of the seven deadly sins, morphed into the self-interest or initiative indispensable to wealth and innovation, while the inscrutable ways of providence yielded to the laws of supply and demand. And if enchanted forces received our devotion, entreaty, and gratitude, disenchanted forces could be mastered with money and greater technological prowess. As the economist Robert Heilbronner once summarized the conventional wisdom, capitalism is not sacred but secular and would be impossible in a sacralized world to which men would relate with awe and veneration. Indeed, nothing seems more thoroughly secular than the modern business corporation, the leviathan of the 21st century and the preeminent institution of our gilded age. To its admirers, the corporation is the servant of a democratic market, an unfairly maligned and underappreciated creator of abundant, commodified marvels. To its detractors, it is a remorseless gargantua despoiling the planet, an insatiable, globe-encircling syndicate reliant on mendacity and exploitation. Yet, both admirers and detractors of the corporation agree on its thorough disenchantment. Corporations must mobilize profit and accumulate capital, organizing money, expertise, and technology with sober judgment and utmost efficiency. Whatever their owners, managers, or workers may believe in their homes or office cubicles, corporations cannot and dare not rely on magic, divination, or prayer. They must organize every factor of production, from fiber-optic cables and human resources to the dream of the ad department, and calibrate the marginal utility of every expenditure, exertion, and longing. 
no beatitudes here, no works of mercy, no yearning for paradise. As we are reminded every time there is the slightest complaint about the lack of decency or justice, out of this disciplined hunger for money comes the splendor of capitalist civilization, its protean energy, its surfeit of pleasures, its exotic gallery of images, its ingenious, bustling, and exuberant indulgence of every paying desire. The roles of patron and moralist once assumed by religion are now leveraged by capital. The arts, athletics, and scholarship receive plentiful corporate largesse, while brands, slogans, and advertising supplant icons, chants, and commandments. For the four decades before the financial crisis unfolded in the fall of 2008, capitalism's lavish indifference to piety was a major selling point. In the flesh pots of American suburbia, where the armada of SUVs ferry the heavily indebted through the consumer republic, the spectacular reign of money seemed well nigh ubiquitous and irreversible. And to cultures still mired in the backwaters of enchantment, capitalist modernity was marketed as the greatest jubilee season in history. Breaking the shackles of immemorial customs, capitalism offered the sale of commodities, not the dutiful worship of relics, the fulfillment of the self, not subordination to the past, the romance of the present and the promise of the future, not the veil of tears and a hope beyond the grave. In the words of journalist Michael Lewis, Capitalists are practitioners of liberty who do not suffer constraints on their private ambition and who work hard, if unintentionally, to free others from constraint. Firmly committed to the real world of disenchanted, manipulable forces, they represent the spiritual antithesis of religious fundamentalists who thwart this labor of liberty in the name of some putatively higher power. Karl Marx wrote much the same thing a century and a half earlier, with greater flourish and prophetic grandeur. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. Capitalism's most unlikely celebrant, Marx observed how the market, far from being a bastion of conservatism, dissolves all fixed, fast-frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices. History's assassin of enchantment, capitalism, drowns the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor in the icy waters of egotistical calculation. Yet, Despite the secular veneer of capitalist life, it's not at all clear that enchantment lies lifeless in the Arctic mercenary deep. To journalist Naomi Klein, the neoliberal economics of the past forty years amounts to a veritable creed, the contemporary religion of unfettered free markets. Indeed, corporate business has always had a deep New Age streak, she observes, with branding as the most advanced form of corporate transcendence. The Nike swoosh, the Starbucks siren, and other trademarks are neoliberal totems of enchantment. Journalist Barbara Ehrenreich discovers that, despite its reputation for a ruthless focus on the bottom line, corporate business is shot through with magical thinking inspired and mesmerized by a burgeoning portfolio of New Age quackery and bunkum. Evangelicals refer to Jesus Christ as their CEO or personal investment advisor, while management writers cull from Lao Tzu, Buddha, Confucius, and Carl Jung. Counting out seven habits or four competencies or sixty-seven principles of success— Business advice books can be as comically arcane as end times prophecy, the oracles of Nostradamus, or another Dan Brown novel. 
Some writers see a sacramental significance in contemporary consumer culture. Material things are shot through with enchantment. New York Times columnist David Brooks informs us. Suburban acquisitiveness stems from a sacramental longing, Brooks believes, a desire to enter a magical realm in which all is harmony, happiness, and contentment. Historian Steve Fraser believes that even in the stampede for consumer goods slumbers a sacramental quest for transcendence, reveries of what might be. In search of some material grace, more Americans than ever seem willing to be impaled on William Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold. Contemporary writers are not the first to note the persistence of enchantment in capitalist societies. Reflecting on the misery of industrial England in the 1840s, Thomas Carlyle detected the presence of invisible enchantments that bewitched the plethoric wealth that had yet made nobody rich. Owners and workers walked, spellbound in the clutches of a horrid enchantment, beguiled by some power that lurked in the factories and inhabited the things they produced. Carlyle traced this sorcery to the gospel of mammonism, the good news that money possessed and bestowed a trove of miraculous faculties. While this could be dismissed as rhetorical flourish, even Marx and Weber used the language of enchantment to explain the power of capitalism. The capitalist, Marx and Engels wrote in the Communist Manifesto, is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld he has called up by his spells. Later, in the first volume of Capital, Marx included a seminal passage on the fetishism of commodities, the attribution of human and supernatural qualities to manufactured objects. Four decades later, after marking the epoch of disenchantment, Weber mused that many old gods ascend from their graves, resurrected as the laws of the market, spirits of the gospel of mammonism. Far from being an agent of disenchantment, capitalism, I contend, has been a regime of enchantment, a repression, displacement, and renaming of our intrinsic and inveterate longing for divinity. There is more than mere metaphor in the way we refer to the worship or idolatry of money and possessions, even if Many, if not most of us, believe in a disenchanted, desacralized cosmos, a universe devoid of spirits and other immortal but animate beings. Capitalism has assumed, in its way, the status of an enchanted world. Like the blood-sacrificial rites of nationalism that sanctify the modern state, Capitalism represents what the theologian William Cavanaugh has called a migration of the holy, a forced march of sanctity and devotion toward new, putatively secular objects of reverence. To be sure, enchantment can take a variety of forms. Magic, animism, the myriad shapes of the occult, or at its most elaborate, religion. Although Weber showed that capitalism, while an agent of disenchantment, had nonetheless received the sanction of Calvinist Protestantism, Walter Benjamin suggested almost a century ago that capitalism is a religion as well as a cult, with its own ontology, morals, and ritual practices whose spirit speaks from the ornamentation of banknotes. I take this as a point of departure and argue that capitalism is a form of enchantment, perhaps better, a mis-enchantment, a parody or perversion of our longing for a sacramental way of being in the world. Its animating spirit is money. Its theology, philosophy, and cosmology have been otherwise known as economics, its sacramentals consist of fetishized commodities and technologies, the material culture of production and consumption. 
Its moral and liturgical codes are contained in management theory and business journalism. Its clerisy is a corporate intelligentsia of economists, executives, managers, and business writers, a stratum akin to Aztec priests, medieval scholastics, and Chinese mandarins. Its iconography consists of advertising, public relations, marketing, and product design. Its beatific vision of eschatological destiny is the global imperium of capital, a heavenly city of business with incessantly expanding production, trade, and consumption, and its gospel has been that of mammonism, the attribution of ontological power to money and of existential sublimity to its possessors. The gospel of mammonism sanctions the printing of counterfeit promissory notes, for the love of money misdirects our sacramental desire to know the presence of divinity in our midst. The world is charged with the grandeur of God, as Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. A freshness spoiled, he ruefully added, seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. The Enchantments of Mammon is an extended assay of the moral and metaphysical imagination. Our ideals of self and the common good that emerge from the way we understand the nature of the cosmos, what philosophers and theologians would call our metaphysics, ontology, or cosmology. What Carlyle dubbed the Gospel of Mammonism is the meretricious ontology of capital, in which everything receives its value and even its very existence through the empty animism of money. It proclaims that capital is the mana, or pneuma, or soul, or elan vital of the world, replacing the older enlivening spirits with one that is more real, energetic, and productive. Yet, as Hopkins recognized, the dearest freshness is never spent. The sorcery of capital can ravage and deface, but can never defeat the grandeur of God. The history of capitalism in America has been a tale of predation on that dearest freshness, an ambitious but inexorably grotesque and destructive endeavor in the manufacture of beatitude, and that story is arguably winding down to its conclusion. What better time to trace the outlines of that history and inquire into the possibilities that lie dormant in the present? I've written The Enchantments of Mammon out of the conviction that, rather than bewail or curse the twilight of American economic and geopolitical imperium, we should welcome the demise of our misenchanted way of life as an opportunity for repentance and renewal. But redemption can only come if we tell a different story about our country and its unexceptional sins. How has the story of disenchantment been told? And why is now an opportune moment to revise it? The most cogent account is Weber's, contained in several scattered essays, and in The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, 1905. According to Weber, the enchanted universe was inhabited by mysterious, incalculable forces who animated or controlled the natural world. The enchanted world fused ontology and ethics, an account of what is was united with an imperative of what one ought. And so, the most ultimate and sublime values formed part of the world's metaphysical composition. This infusion of the everyday world with sublimity undergirded enchanted communities. Divinities of varying power and character provided the pneuma that swept through the great communities like a firebrand. Embedded in the ontology of enchantment, the production and exchange of material goods were believed to partake in these forces, so they could never be left to the unregulated activity of free or impersonal markets. 
there was no economy unto itself, separate from other sacralized social relationships. As the historian Karl Polanyi explained in The Great Transformation, 1944, man's economy as a rule was considered by pre-modern peoples to be indivisible from custom and law, magic and religion. Protestant theology and capitalism played crucial roles in Weber's tale of disenchantment rejecting the foolish and doctrinaire idea of a direct causal link between the two, Weber argued that the connection inhered both in the elective affinities of Protestant theology and capitalist enterprise and in the psychological drives for accumulation sanctioned by the new religious doctrines. The elective affinities of Protestantism and capitalism originated in the repudiation of Catholic sacramentalism, a Christianized form, he implied, of the earlier enchanted universe, a cultic ensemble of rituals and relics in which matter and human relationships were believed capable of mediating the supernatural. In Weber's view, the marrow of Protestant divinity was a mistrust of such sensual and emotional elements in religion. Specifically, the sacraments, which Calvinists in particular rejected as magic. Lacking the assurance of salvation provided by Catholic sacramental rituals, the Calvinist allayed the inevitable anxiety through tireless labor in a calling. So the spirit of capitalism was not, Weber argued, just another term for greed. It was the rationalized accumulation of wealth undertaken. Calvinists convinced themselves for the sake of God's glory and majesty. In the process, Calvinist capitalists achieved a sanctification of worldly activity and cultivated an inner-worldly asceticism, which, once loosened from its theological moorings, became the classic trinity of bourgeois virtues, diligence, thrift, and self-restraint. Thus, the nexus of Protestantism and capitalism lay in a disenchantment of the world, which, by denying matter any sacramental character, unleashed upon it and upon human beings, both the capitalists' energies of mastery and acquisition and the scientists' desire for knowledge. While popular notions of disenchantment usually trace its origins to science, Weber insisted that capitalism was the primary culprit in the eclipse of the sacred. As the most abstract and impersonal element that exists in human life, money displaced mana and dissolved the enchanted bond between ontology and ultimate values. By demolishing this enchanted ontology, capitalist markets rendered the exchange of goods ever less accessible to any imaginable relationship with a religious ethic of brotherliness. Enchanted assumptions of abundance, fluidity, and generosity, articulated in the Jewish and Christian traditions by the opening verses of Genesis, gave way to the disenchanted verities of scarcity and competition, while shamans, magicians, and priests yielded to businessmen, bureaucrats, and technicians. Life in modernity's iron cage embodied Hobbes's infernal vision, a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. As Weber wrote in his bleak conclusion to the Protestant ethic, the disenchanted world labored under specialists without spirit, sensualists without heart, who presumed to have attained a level of civilization never before achieved. For Weber, the triumph of capitalism dispelled enchantment, mandated impersonality, and nullified the prospect of commerce as a material expression of beloved community. The consensus of disenchantment is so pervasive and stubborn that even religious thinkers take it for granted. Charles Taylor, for instance, one of the most renowned students of secularity and its discontents, 
restates the conventional narrative, with a twist, in A Secular Age, 2007. In the pre-modern epoch of enchantment, Taylor explains, the boundary that separated our world from the sacred was porous and indistinct. Traffic between the two spheres was frequent, if not always desired or friendly. Now, having left the enchanted universe behind, we, disenchanted, dwell within the moral and ontological parameters of an imminent frame. The world is apprehended through reason and science, bereft of immaterial and unquantifiable forces, structured by the immutable laws of nature and the contingent traditions of human societies. What Taylor calls the buffered self is a kind of imminent frame that insulates the inner from the outer world, thus precluding any sense of the numinous or any notion that nature has something to say to us. Although Taylor foresees that the hegemony of the mainstream master narrative of secularization will be more and more challenged, and hopes that its overcoming will open up new possibilities, the contour and substance of his account of disenchantment do not differ fundamentally from Weber's. Where he parts from Weber and the consensus is in the prospect he discerns along the unquiet frontiers of modernity for a re-enchantment of the world, not necessarily a return to religious orthodoxies, but a recovery of a sense of the numinous, adumbrated in romantic poetry and philosophy, and visible in New Age spirituality, untethered to traditional doctrines and institutions. Yet, any re-enchantment that presumes the hegemonic tale of disenchantment would likely prove to be an abortive exercise in willful self-delusion. It would seem difficult, if not impossible, to re-enchant the world without a paralyzing degree of self-consciousness. Like a deliberate effort at spontaneity, the re-enchantment of a disenchanted world would be a futile enterprise in psychological calculation. Such a re-enchantment would occur solely in our heads, where the irrefragable and irksome reminders of disenchantment would still lurk, repressed in the shadows. Whether as art, or poetry, or play, or spirituality, re-enchantment would amount to little more than a tenuous and self-defeating therapy of consolation. Thus, Taylor's hope for a re-enchantment of the world depends on telling a different story about disenchantment, one that does not rest on the ontological and historical foundations of the reigning account. To be genuine and enduring, a re-enchantment of the world must begin in a descent from the prevailing wisdom about disenchantment. Just as Bruno Latour has argued that we have never been modern, that we have never differentiated nature and society as cleanly and rigidly as we suppose, might it be better to claim that we have never been disenchanted? Perhaps the story we've told about the evacuation of the sacred from everyday life has been a fable. Perhaps the imminent frame has always been permeable, while the buffered selves that ward off transcendence have been more porous than we ever imagined. Weber himself left clues for a rather different account of our condition. In this story, we abide between two eras. We live as did the ancients when their world was not yet disenchanted of its gods and demons, as Weber speculated in Science as a Vocation, 1915. Only we, he wrote, live in a different sense. Antiquity witnessed a long twilight of the gods, only to be followed by the dawn of a new one, whose own demise appeared to be the final senescence and annihilation of all enchantment from the world. Indeed, Weber observed, while many old gods ascend from their graves, they are quickly disenchanted, 
taking the form of impersonal forces. But is that the only way to understand the different sense to which Weber alluded so nebulously, that modernity marks the crossing of the final Rubicon of disenchantment? Perhaps the sociologist who considered himself religiously unmusical heard faint notes of enchantment in modernity. Perhaps, despite their wounds, the old divinities had not risen to give consent to their euthanization. Were they really disenchanted when they assumed their secular form? Or do they still roam among us in the guise of secularization? Capitalism has long been presumed to be a powerful solvent of enchantment. All that is holy is profaned. Ecstasy is murdered in the waters of calculation. But what if those waters of pecuniary reason constituted a baptismal font, a consecration of capitalism as a covert form of enchantment, all the more beguiling on account of its apparent profanity? Simon Critchley and Terry Eagleton might lend support to this conception of secularization as a disguise for enchantment. In The Faith of the Faithless, 2012, Critchley rejects the axial assumption of most modern political thought, that the modernity of modern politics resides in its utter secularity, its lack of foundation in the will of divinity. Political order depends, he maintains, on allegiance to a fiction, an act of creation that brings a subject into existence, like something performed by a writer or a deity. This fiction, or original covenant, as Critchley puts it, is a sacred, unquestionable tale whereby a people is brought, or rather brings itself, into existence. If pre-modern polities traced their origins to the creative act of some divinity, modern, secular political forms are, in effect, no different in their fictional character, whether fascism, communism, or liberal democracy, they represent a series of metamorphoses of sacralization. Likewise, Eagleton has argued, in Culture and the Death of God, 2014, that the supreme being has proved remarkably difficult to dispose of. Ever since the Enlightenment, surrogate forms of transcendence have scrambled for the crown of the King of Kings, reason, science, literature, art, nationalism, but especially culture, providing cold, imperious reason with the wardrobe of mythology, poetry, literature, and art. Culture, its devotees fervently hoped, would successfully impersonate religion. Displacing the clergy, Philosophers and poets aspired to establish a new, post-Christian clerisy who would educate the masses with new myths, icons, and epiphanies, the sacred discourse of a post-religious age. But the modern project of surrogate transcendence failed. Even Nietzsche's Übermensch represented, Eagleton writes, a counterfeit theology. In our incorrigibly ironic era of postmodernism, the venerable questions of meaning and destiny are sloughed off as unreal and coercive, meta narrative. Even revolutionary hope, another grasp at transcendence, yields to the conquest of cool, the imperium of a hip plutocracy. The only aura to linger on, Eagleton sadly concludes, is that of the commodity or celebrity. Although Eagleton insists that capitalism is fundamentally irreligious and totally alien to the category of the sacred, his perception of an aura around the commodity suggests that capitalism is a surrogate form of transcendence, another metamorphosis of sacralization, a modern vessel of primordial enchantment decked out in the apparel of secularity. As Marx himself hinted, despite the ostensible profanity of its pecuniary ethos, capitalism is hardly post-metaphysical. 
its metaphysics, is money, the criterion of reality, meaning, and identity in a competitive commodity culture. In Grundrisse, 1857, Marx referred to the divine power of money and its status as the god among commodities. As the realm of the commodity widens, money not only purchases everything, it also seems to bring things into being from nothing, performing all manner of astonishing feats of moral and metaphysical alchemy. Money can buy you love, as the young Marx mused in an early reflection on the power of money in bourgeois society. Money enables its possessor to say, I am ugly, but I can buy for myself the most beautiful of women. Therefore, I am not ugly, for the effect of ugliness, its deterrent power, is nullified by money. Under capitalism, money occupies the ontological throne from which God has been evicted. I want to go one step further than Eagleton and Critchley. The world does not need to be re-enchanted because it was never disenchanted in the first place. Attending primarily to the history of the United States, I hope to demonstrate that capitalism has been, as Benjamin perceived, a religion of modernity, one that addresses the same hopes and anxieties formally entrusted to a traditional religion. But this does not mean only that capitalism has been and continues to be beguiling or fetishized, and that rigorous analysis will expose the phantoms as the projections they really are. These enchantments draw their power not simply from our capacity for delusion, but from our deepest and truest desires. Desires that are consonant and tragically out of touch with the dearest freshness of the universe. The world can never be disenchanted, not because our emotional or political or cultural needs compel us to find enchantments, though they do, but because the world itself, as Hopkins realized, is charged with the grandeur of God. Hence, the importance of theology for this book as I root my affirmation of the persistence of enchantment in a theological claim about the world, that the earth is a sacramental place, mediating the presence and power of God, revelatory of the superabundant love of divinity. In Christian theology, another way to say that the world is enchanted is to say that it is sacramental. In Graham Ward's words, the material world bears the watermark of its Creator. Of course, Christians are not alone in perceiving a sacramental quality in ordinary things. As anthropologist Marcel Mauss documented in The Gift, 1922, tribal and ancient societies believed in various forms of what the Maori of New Zealand dubbed mana, an unseen presence that resided in things and knit together those who exchanged them. To be sure, unlike notions of mana, Christian theology, like its Jewish and Islamic relatives, asserts that things in themselves have no power apart from God. Still, material life has sacral significance, and how we make and use material goods has a sacramental and a moral dimension. There are sacramental, as well as perversely sacramental, ways of being in the world. Moreover, Christian ontology entails the conviction that abundance and peace are the true nature of things, not the scarcity and violence that leaven the cosmology of capitalist economics. As Pope Francis reiterated the sacramental imagination in his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, while the Judeo-Christian religious heritage certainly demythologized nature, stripped it of divinity in itself, it nonetheless insists that divine love is the fundamental moving force in all created things, 
another world is, illuminated by the love which calls us together into universal communion. That longing for universal communion is corrupted by a lack of trust in God, and our love spoils into a lust for power that mars the development of civilization. Without faith in the sacramental nature of the world, we anchor ourselves in the illusory and inevitably malevolent apparatus of domination. Patriarchal lineages, property lines, police departments, surveillance networks, military-industrial complexes. This is what Augustine called the earthly city, our inexorably unstable and unsuccessful attempt to construct a celestial city on the fissured foundation of our aberrant loves. Whether true or errant, our love makes us what we are. So, if we are what we desire, History is the convoluted record of our loves in all their magnificent and ignoble forms. As the theologian Eric Gregory asserts, love is the key to understanding world history. Norman O. Brown once expressed much the same insight in psychoanalytic terms. The riddle of history is not in reason, but in desire. Not in labor, but in love. Capitalism is one such desire for communion, a predatory and misshapen love of the world. Capitalism is a love story. However significant theology is for this book, I have relied on a sizable body of historical literature on the symbolic universe of capitalism. Much of this work suggests that capitalist cultural authority cannot be fully understood without regard to the psychic, moral, and spiritual longings inscribed in the imagery of business culture. As Jackson Lears puts it, the corporation may well be a triumph of bureaucratic rationality, but its advertising speaks lissomely to desires for release from Weber's iron cage of disenchantment. Attuned to popular anxieties, about an increasingly rationalized and impersonal world dominated by large institutions, Lears demonstrates that advertisers use a variety of aesthetic strategies to generate a reanimation of the world under the aegis of major corporations. Likewise, Roland Marchand observed how corporate image professionals attempted to reanimate the corporation itself. Since the late 19th century, when it was first defined as a legal person, the corporation has often figured in popular culture as a soulless leviathan, destructive of the creativity and moral virtue once located, so it was thought, among proprietors and local communities. Responding to this crisis of moral legitimacy, public relations departments conjured, Marchand argued, a corporate soul, an image of the corporation as a friendly neighborhood behemoth solely interested in community service. It would seem that the iron in the cage of secularity has been leavened with enchanted materials. Because I emphasize this enchanting carceral quality, some listeners may complain that I overlook the real advances in human flourishing made possible by capitalism. Although I consider this objection a red herring, I want to make clear that I am not one of those churlish reactionary radicals who see nothing in capitalist modernity but one long, unrelieved nightmare of greed, brutality, and desiccating rationalization. The technological achievements of capitalism have surely improved the social and material conditions of billions of people as none other than Marx asked in the Communist Manifesto, what earlier time had even a presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor. Still, and this needs to be reiterated at a time of wavering, but nonetheless ascendant capitalist triumphalism, these improvements would also not have been possible without labor unions, radical movements, welfare states, 
and political parties that mobilized unremitting popular struggle against the imperatives and institutions of capital. Moreover, it is essential to remember that, as Benjamin observed, every document of civilization is also a document of barbarism. During the tragically dialectical epoch of class struggle, all human achievement is tainted by oppression. It's a ruefully ironic observation with which Augustine would, I suspect, have concurred. Marveling in the City of God, at all the arts discovered and developed by human genius, Augustine still insisted that the aims and means of these arts could nonetheless be dangerous and harmful on account of our corruption. Thus, in the spirit of Augustine and Benjamin, I don't deny the reality of progress, but I contend that the problem of progress is not as Christopher Lash posed it in The True and Only Heaven, 1991, Progress and Its Critics, but rather The Meaning of Progress. Despite caricatures of Luddism or technophobia, almost none of my anti-capitalist protagonists desired a reversion to pre-modern technology and social relations. It is more accurate to say that the moral and ontological primacy of money in capitalist civilization has valorized a particular conception of progress that was, in their view, humanly and ecologically destructive despite all the material benefits it has conferred. Even Marx succumbed to it. Yet they did not call for the restoration of earlier social orders, nor did they believe that hammers and hoes would exhaust the technical possibilities of a world after capitalism. Their example suggests not that we should resurrect the past, but that we need to revisit what we mean by progress and not change the subject by invoking cyberspace or holding up the newest version of the iPhone. Digital commodities now comprise the most recent items in the perverse iconography of consumerism. But this book is not yet another lengthy screed about mindless, materialistic consumers, because they often reduce consumption to a moral issue Critics of consumerism engage in a tiresome and largely ineffectual moralism. But historians and theologians might remind us that consumption is far more than a moral affair. However deftly and beguilingly the culture industries prey on some of the worst features of human nature, consumerism is a structural imperative of the modern capitalist economy. Preaching Jeremiads religious or secular, has been of little discernible avail against the necessities of accumulation. Talking about consumerism is a way of not talking about capitalism. And besides, matter is good. Material life should be cherished and savored as the sensuous gift of creation. Indeed, a sacramental sensibility and imagination constitute, in my view, the most compelling alternative to a pecuniary, instrumentalist desecration of people and the rest of the world. Thus, rather than rail against consumerism, I affirm John Ruskin's magnificent adage that there is no wealth but life, as well as his distinction between wealth, that which helps produce full-breathed, bright-eyed and happy-hearted human creatures, and ilf, that which causes devastation and trouble in all directions. The arc of my narrative traces the enchantment of capitalism since the seventeenth century. Emerging from the fields and factories of industrializing England, capitalist enchantment migrated to the American continent and became the marrow of a proprietary dispensation represented enthusiastically by Puritans, Evangelicals, Mormons. In the late nineteenth century, the proprietary order gave way to the corporate dispensation with a soulful corporation at its center. Through much of the twentieth century, 
The corporation presided over the Fordist endeavor to build a heavenly city of business, a celestial metropolis of capital, achieved through the mechanization of production and communion. By the early twenty-first century, capitalism has reached its highest meridian of enchantment in the neoliberal deification of the market. The enchantments of mammon have had their critics, to be sure, but pride of place in this volume will go to intellectuals, poets, novelists, and artists with profoundly religious sensibilities, from Gerard Winstonley and Ruskin to Herman Melville. James Agee and Kenneth Rexroth, from John Muir, William James, Vida Dutton Scudder and Dorothy Day, to Lewis Mumford, Mark Rothko, Theodore Rozak, and Thomas Merton, a pedigree of prophets saw capitalist enchantment as a desecration of some invisible grandeur. As Henry Miller realized, the earth is a paradise. We don't have to make it a paradise. It is one. We only have to make ourselves fit to inhabit it. Words such as paradise or love or communion are certainly absent from our political vernacular, excluded on account of their utopian connotations or their lack of steely-eyed realism. Although this is a book about the past. I have always kept before me its larger contemporary religious, philosophical, and political implications. The book should make these clear enough. I will only say here that one of my broader intentions is to challenge the canons of realism, especially as defined in the science of economics. As the master science of desire in advanced capitalist nations, economics and its acolytes define the parameters of our moral and political imaginations, patrolling the boundaries of possibility and censoring any more generous conception of human affairs. Under the regime of neoliberalism, it has been the chief weapon in the arsenal of what David Graeber has characterized as a war on the imagination. A relentless assault on our capacity to envision an end to the despotism of money, insistent, in Margaret Thatcher's ominous U case, that there is no alternative to capitalism. Our corporate plutocracy has been busy imposing its own beatific vision on the world, the empire of capital, with an imperial aristocracy enriched by the labor of a fearful, overburdened. And cheerfully servile population of human resources. Every avenue of escape from accumulation and wage servitude must be closed, or better yet, rendered inconceivable. Any map of the world that includes utopia must be burned before it can be glanced at. Better to follow Miller's wisdom. We already inhabit paradise. And we can never make ourselves fit to live in it if we obey the avaricious and punitive sophistry professed in the dismal pseudoscience, the grotesque ontology of scarcity and money, the tawdry humanism of acquisitiveness and conflict, the reduction of rationality to the mercenary principles of pecuniary reason. This ensemble of falsehoods that comprise the foundation of economics must be resisted and supplanted. Economics must be challenged, not only as a sanction for injustice, but also as a specious portrayal of human beings and a fictional account of their history. As a legion of anthropologists and historians have repeatedly demonstrated, economics, in Graeber's forthright dismissal, has. Little to do with anything we observe when we examine how economic life is actually conducted. From its historically illiterate myth of barter to its shabby and degrading claims about human nature, economics is not just a dismal, but a fundamentally fraudulent science as well, akin as Ruskin wrote in *Unto This Last* to alchemy, astrology, witchcraft. And other such popular creeds, Ruskin's courageous and bracing indictment of economics arose from his romantic imagination, and this book 
partakes unashamedly of his sacramental romanticism. Imagination was, to the romantics, primarily a form of vision, a mode of realism, an insight into the nature of reality that was irreducible to, but not contradictory of, the knowledge provided by scientific investigation. Romantic social criticism did not claim the imprimatur of science as did Marxism and other modern social theories, yet the romantic lineage of opposition to disenchantment and capitalism has proved to be more resilient and humane than Marxism, progressivism, or social democracy. Indeed, it is more urgently relevant to a world hurtling even faster to barbarism and ecological calamity. I wrote this book, in part, out of a belief that many on the left continue to share far too much with their antagonists, an ideology of progress defined as unlimited economic growth and technological development as well as an acceptance of the myth of disenchantment that underwrites the pursuit of such expansion. The romantic antipathy to capitalism, mechanization, and disenchantment stemmed not from a facile and nostalgic desire to return to the past, but from a view that much of what passed for progress was in fact inimical to human flourishing a specious productivity that required the acceptance of venality, injustice, and despoliation, a technological and organizational efficiency that entailed the industrialization of human beings and the primacy of the production of goods over the cultivation and nurturance of men and women. This train of iniquities followed inevitably from the chauvinism of what William Blake called single vision a blindness to the enormity of reality that led to a Babylon builded in the waste. Romantics redefined rather than rejected realism and progress, drawing on the pre-modern customs and traditions of peasants, artisans, and artists. Craftsmanship, mutual aid, and a conception of property that hearkened back to the medieval practices of the commons. Whether they believed in some traditional form of religion or translated it into secular idioms of enchantment, such as art or beauty or organism, romantic anti-capitalists tended to favor direct workers' control of production, the restoration of a human scale in technics and social relations, a sensitivity to the natural world that precluded its reduction to mere instrumental value and an apotheosis of pleasure in making, sometimes referred to as poesis, a union of reason, imagination, and creativity, an ideal of labor as a poetry of everyday life and a form of human divinity. In work, free of alienation and toil, we receive the reward of creation, as William Morris described it through a character in News from Nowhere, 1890, the wages that God gets, as people might have said time agone. Rendered gaudy and impoverished by the tyranny of economics and the enchantment of neoliberal capitalism, our sensibilities need replenishment from the sacramental imagination. As Americans begin to experience the initial stages of imperial sclerosis and decline, and as the advanced capitalist world in general discovers the reality of ecological limits, we may find in what Marx called the prehistory of our species a perennial and redemptive wisdom. We will not be saved by our money, our weapons, or our technological virtuosity. We might be rescued by the joyful and unprofitable pursuits of love, beauty, and contemplation. No doubt, this will all seem foolish to the shamans and magicians of pecuniary enchantment. But there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of on Wall Street or in Silicon Valley. Part 1 
the dearest freshness, deep down things. Capitalist enchantment in Europe, 1600 to 1914. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Gerard Manley Hopkins marveled in the winter of 1877. For Hopkins, the earth was a place of grace, a vast and glorious sacrament. It was not inanimate, but rather charged, enlivened, always quickened by the presence of divinity. Since God dwells among us, the universe is radiant, like shining from shook foil. Yet, oblivious to God's enchantment of the earth, generations have trod, have trod, and as a result of our industrious inattention, all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. The labor enforced by the lust for profit disfigures the face of creation. The malevolence and tyranny of money effaces and blasphemes the majesty of God. But Hopkins refused to despair, for despite our sacrilege, nature is never spent. Even when despoiled, it confounds our defilement and remains a vessel of grandeur. God resides at the exuberant heart of creation and will not be dispossessed. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. God protects and mends the despoiled world, watchful, forgiving, and resplendent. The Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and, ah, bright wings. Hopkins bore a hopeful witness against the desecration of the enchantment of the world. Indeed, he believed that the waning of traditional religious faith and the future of capitalism, the death of God, and the social question were inextricably bound together. In the summer of 1871, Hopkins had written to a friend about the bloody suppression of the Paris Commune. In a manner I am a communist, he confessed, for the ideal of communism is nobler than that professed by any secular statesman I know of. Besides, he added curtly, it is just. It is a dreadful thing, he continued, for the greatest and most necessary part of a very rich nation to live a hard life without dignity, knowledge, comforts, delight, or hopes in the midst of plenty, which plenty they make. Though Hopkins's manner of being a communist would surely have failed any test imposed by Marx and his comrades in the First International, Hopkins was certain that reverence for God's grandeur demanded the end of capitalist iniquity. Yet, even if some great revolution is not far off, Hopkins worried that workers had been mortally infected with the spirit of the iniquitous order. With its ruthless and irrepressible dynamism, capitalism had extinguished or broken off all traces of the old religion, learning, law, art, etc. In books, music, and stone, medieval Christianity had preserved the ideal of a fellowship leavened by love, but that invaluable edifice was now succumbing to the mercenary forces of wrecking. It was only from the memory of the past, Hopkins implied, that workers could fashion a communist future worthy of their human dignity. But, thanks to the demolition of history by their exploiters, the working classes know next to nothing of this inheritance— and since most of its custodians were indifferent or hostile to their demands, the workers cannot be expected to care if they destroy it. Hopkins echoed a long tradition of prophecy. The age of capitalist enchantment began in England in the 16th and 17th centuries, sweeping away the sacramental moral economy of the medieval commons, a capitalist vanguard of landowners and merchants constructed a regime of improvement.
spearheaded by Puritan improvers, the historical point men of capital, were not disenchanting mechanical accumulators. Their Protestant ethic was perfectly compatible with omens, portents, and marvels. Protestant capitalists reworked the sacramental imagination of medieval Catholicism, aligning its conviction of metaphysical enchantment with the imperatives of dispossession, enclosure, and profit. From Puritan divines such as Richard Baxter to John Locke and the godfathers of liberalism, English Protestants espoused a systematic theology of the divine right of capitalist property. But other Protestants dissented from the gospel of improvement, sanctified by Puritan divinity. Epitomized by Gerard Winstanley and the Diggers, a sacramental communist materialism prefigured the modern secular left. By the early 19th century, the Puritan era of capitalist enchantment had given way to the evangelical successor, proclaiming themselves heralds of a science of wealth whose laws had been decreed by God, Christian political economists were more widely read and admired than Adam Smith or David Ricardo. For the clerics of evangelical enchantment, God had manufactured the capitalist cosmology of property, market, and enterprise, with scarcity and struggle as his paternal inducements to labor, innovation, and riches. Marveling at the dreadful beauty of a strife commanded by the Creator, English evangelicals preached and imposed the gospel of capitalist freedom. As the Industrial Revolution, triggered by improvement, advanced through the 19th century, a motley array of opposition to the gospel of capitalist enchantment arose. Karl Marx, for instance, detected the persistence of the spirits in capitalist modernity. From the oldest fabrication of gods and spirits to the superstition of commodity fetishism, human beings had projected their own inherent powers onto illusory but oppressive beings. Through the science and practice of revolutionary socialism, human beings would reclaim their alienated powers. God would finally be exposed as humanity, and humanity would come into its own as God. Less scientific than Marx, Romantic writers affirmed a natural supernaturalism, the unorthodox heir to sacramental theology. The Romantic sacramental imagination became prophecy in the work of Thomas Carlyle, John Ruskin, and William Morris. Carlyle's invective against the gospel of mammonism stemmed from a romantic theology of wonder, yet, for all his rhetorical thunder, Carlyle ended his career as a champion of the work ethic and the captains of industry. The most renowned and formidable art historian of the 19th century, Ruskin was also a heretical political economist. Though derided, then and now, as a cranky medievalist scourge of technological progress, Ruskin was rather a passionate exponent of an alternative, sacramental modernity, countering the dismal science with one that taught the laws of the economy of heaven. Following Ruskin, Morris longed to re-enchant the world, but without Ruskin's Christian theology. Like utopian socialists, anarchists, and members of the arts and crafts movement, Morris tried to revive the tradition of the commons, hoping to suffuse the people's republic with a naturalist replica of enchantment. Chapter 1 About His Business The Medieval Sacramental Economy The Protestant Theology of Improvement and the emergence of capitalist enchantment. The disenchantment of the world is a myth. To be sure, the enchanted universe of medieval Catholicism collapsed, succumbing to Protestant theology, the new science, and its quest for technological mastery, and the pecuniary reason and Promethean ethos that emboldened capitalist enterprise. But Protestantism was a reformation of enchantment, not a herald of disbelief in an animate world. 
The new science replaced the old animate cosmos with a new mechanical philosophy of enchantment, a cosmology of matter and spirit conducive to industrial exploitation. Arising within the new metaphysical imagination, capitalism emerged as the moral and political economy of modern enchantment. The medieval moral economy was enveloped in a sacramental worldview, in Brad Gregory's words, in which the material world and the social life could reflect and convey divine grace and power. For serf, lord, merchant, and artisan, as for pope, archbishop, and scholastic philosopher, all of life was sacramental, pervaded by the presence of the triune God. Epitomized in the sacrament of the Eucharist, medieval culture displayed a profound conviction of material beatitude and beloved community. As Eamon Duffy observes, the crown of the sacraments could be used to sanction the most oppressive power relations only because the language of Eucharistic belief and devotion was saturated with communitarian imagery. The medieval landscape was a topography of enchantment. Churches, chapels, shrines, grottos, all manner of sacred spaces. Merging orthodox religion and beliefs in magic, sorcery, and other brands of the occult, popular religion featured cults of veneration of saints and relics, as well as numerous feasts and holy days when the ordeal of labor was suspended. Even the culture of carnival held enchanted eschatological meaning. At its pinnacle in the Feast of Fools, when lords and serfs changed places for a day while laity mocked priests and bishops, carnival included the temporary, utopian erasure of social hierarchies. Carnival was a glimpse of the beatific vision in fleshly, joyful plenitude. For a day, the gates of heaven opened, the future paid a visit to the present, and carnal splendor could provide a robust foretaste of the impending kingdom of God. Preparation for that kingdom was the point of economic life in the Middle Ages. Superintended by God the Almighty Father, Patriarchal family and kinship relations were the models for all social and political affairs. Manners, fiefs, and kingdoms were considered patrimonies, not sources of revenue, polities governed by divinely sanctioned elders. Leavened and structured throughout by Christian metaphysics and morality, this theological economy, as Diana Wood has characterized it, was bound up with the medieval conception of a communitas communitatum, a community of communities that embraced families, manors, guilds, cities, courts, parishes, fraternal associations, universities, and monasteries. With both earthly and beatific destinies in mind, property was hedged with innumerable restrictions, enveloped in a latticework of moral rules, legal codes, guild charters, and spiritual meanings. To be sure, the distribution of goods, money, and property buttressed the rule of nobles over serfs, artisans over apprentices, clergy over laity, men over women. The channels of medieval patriarchal dominion, the alleged handiwork of God, that contained the calamitous consequences of the fall. But philosophers... Canon lawyers and municipal officials constructed elaborate systems of just prices, just wages, and financial regulation to hold pandemonium at bay as well. Though regularly flouted or circumvented, medieval prohibitions of usury, for instance, reflected a view of interest on loans as an offense against both humanity and God. According to the 13th century prelate and homilist Jacques de Vitry, Usurers eat not the Eucharist, but rather the bread of impiety. Usury was, in this view, a desecration of the sacrament. The arduous and ultimately futile effort to control pecuniary delirium, to keep money embedded in the theological economy of Christian charity and piety, vexed theologians, lawyers, merchants, and municipal leaders throughout the Middle Ages.
Every other sin has its periods of remission, warned Caesarius of Heisterbach, another thirteenth-century moralist, but usury never rests from sin. Though its master be asleep, it never sleeps, but always grows and climbs. The sacramental imagination imbued the urban guilds that arose in the 10th and 11th century, as well as the rural moral economy of the feudal countryside. Besides furthering the material interests of merchants and artisans through restrictions on entry, trade, and production, the essential aim of medieval guilds, Anthony Black writes, was to sacralize the cohesion of their members. Before the 11th century, most guilds had been religious in character, dedicated to a patron saint. Guild rules and charters codified this spirit of communion, enjoining mutual aid, support for orphans and the poor, endowment of churches, hospitals, and universities, and the use of money not for unfettered accumulation, but for charity. Thomas Brinton, a 14th-century Benedictine monk and canon lawyer, asserted that merchants and faithful mechanics were the left hand of the mystical body of Christ. As late as the 15th century, Florentine leaders beckoned to guilds as molds of beloved community. We long to preserve such a divine being, one municipal official exalted in 1427, and to direct towards it our energies, love, loyalty, concord, truth, and our soul as loving the universal good most of all. In the countryside, a similar moral and theological economy prevailed. The commons, as it was called in England, commons meant not only the common fields and forests of a manor, but also the assignment to the whole community of power to determine property rights, the provision of subsistence, and the organization of labor. Before the Norman invasions of the 11th century, village land in Saxon England belonged not to individual people or families, but to all residents of the village. Individuals enjoyed rights of use, not ownership. Even after the Norman conquest, when village lands belonged to a lord, common rights remained, conditional on fealty and tribute to the manorial noble. Thus, the commons was no utopian ideal. It reflected the historical and everyday experience of cooperation and mutual aid. In England, the two documents that enshrined the commons in law and morality, the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, both forced on King John in 1215, possessed, in Peter Leinball's words, the aura of power, the glamour of colour, and the solemnity of religion. Because the world was a sacramental place, a violation of the commons, like the extraction of usury, put one's soul in eternal peril. Though subordinate to the interests of the seigneurial class, it offered the subaltern both political leverage and a trove of moral imagination. The commons also pointed to a barely repressed desire for communism that lurked as the political unconscious of medieval Christendom. The ideal, if only man's nature could rise to it, was communism, as R. H. Tawney long ago recognized. Private property was considered a rueful concession to the circumstances of a fallen world. Property was either a necessary evil, a right of use, or a social trust. One's land, workshop, or manor was a means of subsistence and a contribution to the common good, not a means of increasing one's wealth or of fostering accumulation as an end in itself. Under the medieval cope of heaven, property had to be directed toward the common good, not employed or aggregated for private gain distributed as widely as possible, not concentrated in ever fewer hands, and dispensed to the poor after the requirements of one's station in life had been met. Monastic orders quarantined communal ownership in the otherworldly asceticism of their members, 
while scholastics such as Thomas Aquinas sublimated the desire for communism into the universal destination of goods. God's creation belongs to all, in Aquinas's formulation, but after the fall, private property oriented toward the common good would ensure that wealth is produced and distributed fairly. Yet, the desire for communism surfaced with unprecedented force in the 12th and 13th centuries as commercial and monetary relations spread in both the cities and the countryside, leading to more pressure on serfs, more rural and urban destination, and more righteous fury among the exploited. Often drawn from the ranks of heterodox mystics and dispossessed peasants and artisans, medieval communists blended a powerful sense of divine imminence with common ownership, voluntary poverty, egalitarianism, and millennial proclamations of impending deliverance. They included Joachim of Fiore and his heterodox eschatology of the Three Ages, the last of which was dawning. The lay mendicant, beguines, and beggars, exemplified by the ill-fated Marguerite Poret, and the Brethren of the Free Spirit, perhaps the most notorious, whose antinomianism owed a great deal to both Joachim and Poret. Convinced that love and property were tokens of friendship with God, these groups espoused what Simon Critchley has dubbed a faith-based communism, in which common possession of material goods was believed to reflect the life of the Trinity. Many who remained within the bounds of orthodoxy witnessed to the ideal of communism. The popularity of St. Francis of Assisi in the early 13th century is incomprehensible outside the idealization of poverty and dispossession. A century later, William Langland asserted in Piers the Plowman, his fourteenth-century moral allegory, that Christians should hold their riches in common and none covet anything for himself. Where devotion to mammon wrought misery and death, love, Langland wrote, is the physician of life, the direct way to heaven. Medieval millenarianism suggests that a beatific, communist promise resides at the heart of Christianity, a promise whose vindication was rooted in a metaphysics and theology of sacramental love. To be sure, the medieval theological economy was no golden age of communion. The world we have lost was one that most pre-modern men and women would almost certainly not want to recover. The failure of medieval Christendom, Gregory writes, stemmed from the pervasive, long-standing and undeniable failure of so many Christians to live by the Church's own prescriptions and exhortations. The Latin Church's own clergy were among the most notorious and most vilified malefactors. Many in the episcopate, and especially the cardinals and popes in the Vatican, spurned lady poverty and befriended mammon through simony and luxurious consumption. Barons and guildsmen were hardly ever paragons of chivalry. Nobles lived off the sweat of peasants. Merchants cheated their customers. Artisans exploited their journeymen. Bankers turned the screws on creditors. Scholastics like Aquinas wrote summas and ruminated on the nature of being because serfs were treated like beasts. As Raymond Williams reminds us with stark and compelling gravity, for the uncountable thousands who grew crops and reared beasts, only to be looted and burned and led away with tied wrists, this economy, even at peace, was an order of exploitation of a most thorough-going kind, a property in men as well as land, a reduction of most men to working animals, tied by forced tribute, forced labor, or bought and sold like beasts, protected by law and custom only, as animals and streams are protected, to yield more labor, more food, more blood. Yet, the innumerable transgressions against the sacramental order underscores the significance of its exalted character as offenses against charity and justice could be identified as evils 
rather than as prices to be paid for abundance. The volcanic peasant uprisings that erupted in the 14th century, the Jacquerie in France in 1358, and the Peasants' Revolt in England in 1381, led by Watt Tyler and John Ball, were triggered not by aspirations for market freedom or liberal democracy, but by violations of the medieval moral economy. The typical peasant, Rodney Hilton observes, felt a permanent rage against nobles whom he blamed, as a whole, for not having fulfilled their duty of protection, which tradition and mutual obligation demanded of them. Utterly bereft of illusions about the perfectibility of the human condition, medieval people were thereby free from the delusion of a concord achieved through venality. So, as Tawney shrewdly observed, if medieval moralists were naive in expecting sound practice as the result of lofty principles alone, they were also innocent of the contemporary form of credulity which expects it from their absence and their opposite. Indeed, medieval moralists had steadily more of that absence or their opposite to confront as the European commercial economy expanded from the 11th to the 16th centuries. The old medieval moral economy endured, if in an increasingly fragile form, as business practices and relationships remained enmeshed in networks of family and marriage until well into the 16th century, while monetized transactions proliferated most obviously and ostentatiously in towns from Florence and Venice to Bruges, Antwerp, Paris, and London, money and profit-maximizing practices had encroached into more and more rural areas by the 13th century. By the 15th century, well-to-do urban Christians could worship in opulent cathedrals, adorn themselves in sumptuous clothing, and donate to the poor and to religious orders, thanks to their sophisticated banking, credit, and accounting systems. As commercial activity burgeoned in northern Italy and Flanders, and the lures of filthy lucre multiplied, merchants, lawyers, and theologians gradually relaxed or abolished many of the traditional restrictions on interest-bearing loans. Guilds bestowed more benefactions on charities, priories, universities, and hospitals, and avarice stepped out of the shadows of hell and into the light of respectability, if not of heaven. The new glorification of riches and acquisitiveness was evident among Renaissance humanists such as Poggio Bracciolini, whose fifteenth-century treatise, On Avarice, marked a halfway covenant between medieval and modern attitudes. Though careful to condemn avarice as a sin, Bracciolini noted nonetheless that without it, all the magnificence of cities would be removed, all culture and ornament would be destroyed, no temples would be built, no colonnades, no palaces, all arts would cease, and then confusion of our lives and of the Republic would follow. The unabashed delight in wealth was a gorgeous effrontery to the old morality of Christendom. When in 1515 Erasmus told his portraitist to depict him as a merchant, complete with purse and broadcloth gown, it was clear that the medieval ideal had waned, and that some new, more brashly venal world was coming. Thus, from the standpoint of economic cosmology and ethics, whether or not England, the Dutch Republic, or the Italian Renaissance city-states represented the first modern, or capitalist economy is less important than the beleaguered persistence of the sacramental worldview. It was in the midst of this waning sacramental economy that the Reformation demolished the theological and institutional coherence of Latin Christendom. Yet, neither the magisterial reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, nor their radical counterparts, Anabaptists such as Thomas Münzer and Menno Simons, and, as I'll argue, 
Gerard Winstanley and the Diggers, were avid enthusiasts of competitive, endlessly expanding enterprise. Scandalized by the extravagance of the church and the clergy's connivance in the corruptions of the rich, the reformers believed, as Gregory puts it, that economic behavior needed a massive overhaul through an infusion of biblical morality. They wanted not to liberate but to restrict the runaway greed and sinful selfishness they saw among prelates and their wealthy benefactors. Some, Münzer, John of Leiden, the Swiss Brethren, Mennonites, and Moravian Hutterites, invoked the medieval ideal of communism, establishing, usually short-lived, experiments in community of goods, while Calvin and his brethren in Geneva enforced a tightly regulated commercial economy even as they ended traditional restrictions on usury. But if Protestantism did not cause capitalism, the Reformation did clear moral and metaphysical ground for a new theological economy, one that, as we have heard, had been gathering momentum for several centuries. By destroying the Catholic sacramental architecture that sacralized medieval society, Protestantism made possible the transvaluation of values that culminated in capitalist enchantment. With its rejection of what Weber called the magical power ascribed to the sacraments, the Protestant repudiation of Catholic ritual, especially in its most virulent form in Calvinist theology, led to what Weber called the sanctification of worldly activity, the consecration of a calling in which ordinary people served God in their daily labors. Ironically, the rejection of works as a means of salvation entailed a gospel of work. However worldly or secular these callings appeared, work inherited the sacral efficacy formally ascribed to Catholic ritual. At the same time, by commencing the desacralization of nature, the denial of any sacramental character in matter, Protestants set the stage for pecuniary enchantment, the unwitting metaphysics of capital. Yet, just as the Reformation did not immediately usher in capitalism, so it did not immediately disenchant the world. Indeed, what one scholar describes as a distinctively Protestant popular religious and magical culture continued to flourish in the 16th century and beyond. Protestants throughout Europe beheld omens and portents, revered relics, visited holy places, and attended to special providences that warned of damnation or heralded salvation. Familiar with the sacraments of the devil, they dreaded sorcery and divination, consulted astrologers, and prayed against demonic possession. The Protestant cosmology of enchantment embraced agricultural life, particularly in England, where medieval and Renaissance conceptions of nature as a living, nurturing, provident being long outlasted the 16th century Reformation in England, pervading almanacs, manuals, and planting and harvesting rituals, maypole dances and offerings to spirits, English agricultural enchantment reflected a view of nature as, in Carolyn Merchant's words, an animate mother, subservient to God, yet a powerful actress in the mundane world. Far from being an inert, soulless heap of resources, nature was God's vice-regent in the universe. Even the mechanical philosophy that was emerging as the intellectual armature of modern science was not as mechanical as it seemed. In early modern Europe, and especially in England, educated Protestants became a new clerisy of enchantment. Like their ritual compatriots, they inherited a view of nature as a vibrant, spirit-filled realm. Their openness to science demonstrated that belief in an enchanted world did not preclude the pursuit of rational investigation and technological control. Sir Francis Bacon blended the animistic universe and the new mechanical conception of nature. 
Steeped in alchemical and Rosicrucian lore, Bacon believed that nature was liberally suffused by spirits or pneumaticals that thrived in the pores of matter. In Bacon's view, even inorganic matter held spirits. Gems, diamonds, and emeralds possessed virtues that comfort and exhilarate those who wear them. A similar animate cosmology flourished among Cambridge Platonists, who depicted a universe vivified by Spiritus Mundi, or world spirit, which took life force from the world soul, or Animo Mundi, and infused it into the world body, or Corporea Mundi. Many among the Protestant intelligentsia, whether the Puritan clergy or the Anglican members of the Royal Society, took an avid and erudite interest in supernatural phenomena, occult practices, and esoteric cosmologies. If Puritan theologians, such as William Perkins, condemned magic and astrology, pioneers of the mechanical philosophy, such as Bacon and Robert Boyle, championed hermetic philosophy and Paraclesian alchemy. As Isaac Newton's alchemical and Rosicrucian passions suggest, Protestant enchantment and scientific thought overlapped well into the era of modernity. Though often regarded as the pious and steely vanguard of desacralization, English Puritans epitomized this Protestant enchantment. Just as the Protestant ethic has been seen as the template of sober and methodical labor, the Puritan conception of providence has been considered a precursor of scientific law. Yet, the Puritan doctrine of providence accommodated a colorful array of wonders, portents, and prodigies. As Keith Thomas observes, the Puritan inclination to see omens and marvels in nature sprang from a coherent vision of the world as a moral order reflecting God's purposes and physically sensitive to the conduct of human beings. Comets or eclipses did not cease to be seen as divine warnings when it came to be appreciated that they had natural causes and could be predicated. Precisely because of their faith in a divinely appointed order, Puritans still lent credence to premonitory dreams, illustrious providences, and presages of death and disaster. Though they associated much of magic and the occult with the lingering pestilence of Catholicism, they believed nonetheless in the diabolical efficacy of witchcraft, divination, alchemy, fortune-telling, and astrology. They feared the powers of cunning men and wizards no less than they despised Catholic priests. Late Tudor and Stuart England witnessed the proliferation of a vast elite and popular literature of Puritan enchantment. Reminding Christians that the world was the theater of God's judgments, 1597, Thomas Beard, clergyman, theologian, and teacher of Oliver Cromwell, reflected that in and behind every object and occurrence lay the invisible hand of God. Is there any substance in this world that hath no cause of his subsisting? Doth not every thunderclap constrain you to tremble at the blast of his voice? Although they assisted in the inaugural stages of the scientific disenchantment of nature, Puritans saw no incongruity between a universe governed by natural law and a cosmos rife with monstrous births, punitive hailstorms, and portentous comets. At the same time, with their self-proclaimed delight in secular employments, enchanted Puritans emerged as the avant-garde of capitalism, archangels of divinely commanded improvement, the use of land for the profitable production of commodities. Puritan ministers revered and publicized the work of pamphleteers, such as Edward Misseldon, Thomas Munn, Nicholas Barbon, and William Petty, advocates for greater freedom in monetary policy, international trade, and enclosure. Through enclosure, the termination of rights to the commons, the transformation of customary land tenures into rents, the fencing of common land, and the dispossession of tenants, Puritan nobles and gentry hastened the capitalist transformation of English agriculture.
Meanwhile, Puritan merchants, especially those involved in overseas ventures in Africa, East India, the West Indies, and the Atlantic seaboard of North America, spearheaded a similar metamorphosis of urban trade and manufacturing. Moving from commerce into production, the new merchants joined agrarian entrepreneurs in enforcing the regime of improvement. Puritans were also the shock troops in what Peter Burke has called the triumph of Lent, the reduction of holy days, the curtailment of feasts, the grim cancellation of carnival. Since Protestant theology and enchantment was the reigning religious culture of 17th century England, improvement required the sanction and discipline of God. Echoing older Catholic warnings against avarice, Puritan ministers admonished merchants, artisans, improving landowners and tenants, and others for whom thrift and diligence were cardinal virtues in the newly competitive society of Stuart England. Exhortations to pursue one's calling, one's secular employment, ordained by God, were hedged with reminders of the hellfire that awaited the covetous. Puritans constantly reminded themselves that they could not serve two masters. The mixture of God and mammon in men's love debaseth and destroyeth religion. The minister and theologian Richard Baxter warned in a Christian directory, 1678. Over the past three decades, many historians of transatlantic Puritanism have taken these invocations of godly commonwealth at face value. As Stephen Innes argues, the Puritans sincerely believed that they labored in the service of God, not mammon. Contemporaries were less impressed by Puritan professions of antipathy to mammon. In Thomas Hobbes's view, Puritans condemned lust and gluttony, but never inveighed against the lucrative vices of men of trade or handicraft. What Christopher Hill rightly identified as the Puritans' cultural revolution was rooted in their indomitable and lucrative faith in the divine imperative of profit. When duty was so profitable, as Tawney asked sardonically, might not profit-making be a duty? This sense of a mercenary calling was rooted in the Puritans' cosmological architecture. The same God who ordained the world's wonders and marvels made the market for pecuniary glory. Contrary to the oft-reiterated claim that Puritans separated the religious and economic realms, the saints affirmed that profit-making followed the grain of the universe. Cosmological enchantment and pecuniary calculation were complementary, not antagonistic. As a result, the Puritan conscience displayed considerable elasticity where prophets were concerned. The cosmology of the saints harmonized much of the traditional dissonance between God and mammon. Indeed, the Puritan God commanded his saints to befriend the unrighteous mammon. The coins that poured into Puritan coffers were signs every bit as revelatory as comets, storms, and apparitions. The Puritan God was the celestial improver with unrelenting demands for more. As Baxter ominously declared in his Christian directory, If God show you a way in which you may lawfully get more than in another way, without, of course, wrong to your soul or to any other, then, if you refuse this and choose the less gainful way, you cross one of the ends of your calling and you refuse to be God's steward. Of course, Baxter cautioned, we may not pile up riches for our fleshly ends, but, in subordination to higher things, the pursuit of wealth was justified, even mandatory. Seldom has so plentiful and inexpensive a line of moral credit ever been extended. Formed in the crucible of improvement, the Puritan doctrine of calling was the first covenant of theology of capitalism. Wrought under the aegis of Protestant enchantment, the Puritan transvaluation of values eased the traditional tension between God and mammon. 
The Puritans ensured that later generations would trod and trod and trod, seared with trade and bleared with toil. But Puritan avarice also revealed the depth of a sacramental desire. Especially during the reign of Charles II, Puritan clergy produced their own version of the abundant literature on enclosure and agricultural improvement. Addressing upwardly mobile merchants, artisans, and farmers, the clerics discerned a sacramental dimension in the life of capitalist enterprise. The ritual of improvement was the subject of volumes such as William Spurstow's The Spiritual Chemist, 1666, Edward Berry's The Husbandman's Companion, 1677, and William Bagshaw's Trading Spiritualized, 1696. In The Weaver's Pocketbook, 1675, for instance, John Collinges, a Presbyterian minister in Norwich, sought to spiritualize the craft by raising heavenly meditations from the several parts of their work. John Flavel, a Presbyterian clergyman in Dartmouth, was even more insistent on the capacity of improvement to bring the worker closer to God. Flavel's Husbandry Spiritualized, 1669, and Navigation Spiritualized, 1671, were among the most popular booklets in the religious literature of improvement. The material world delivered spiritual sweetness. Flavel wrote, Do we not feed with angels? As Flavel reminded his readers, nature, to the eye of the believing Christian, was transparent to the radiance of God. The world below is a gloss to discover the world above. Flavel marveled. Natural objects bear the figures and similarities of many sublime and heavenly mysteries. Indeed, our diligent laboring with the earth could have more sacramental efficacy than the Eucharist. Through skillful and industrious improvement, we could experience a fuller taste of Christ and heaven in every bit of bread, in every draught of beer that we drink, than most men have in the use of the sacrament. Other Protestants could be equally adept in the sacralization of improvement. From his vicarage in the rural parish of Bemerton in Wiltshire, George Herbert dispensed advice to young priests when not busy writing poetry. In The Country Parson, 1652, Herbert composed a clerical manual of agrarian capitalist enchantment. His sacramental conception of land reflected the metaphysical concerns of his verse. Our Saviour made plants and seeds to teach the people. Herbert mused, for he was the true householder. Since rural folk lack the time and talent for intellectual appreciation, God instructs them by familiar things that slip more easily into the hearts even of the meanest. In the grass, flowers, trees, and animals of the Wiltshire countryside, Herbert saw monuments of his doctrine, remembering in gardens his mustard seed and lilies, in the field his seed corn and tares. Plows, hatchets, bushels, and other things of ordinary use could serve for lights even of heavenly truths. Herbert nowhere voiced the slightest unease with the new regime of enclosure and improvement, pointing to the industrious and accumulating farmer as the moral ideal of the future. Set on the improvements of his grounds, by drowning or drawing or stocking or fencing, the rural proprietor made profitable use of God's sacramental monuments. Echoing Baxter and other Puritans, Herbert reasoned that since riches are a blessing from God, then all are to procure them, honestly and seasonably, when they are not better employed. Improvement literature gave birth to a new utopian genre, the utopia of incessant research, innovation, industrial development, and economic growth. The prototype of industrial utopias was, of course, Bacon's the New Atlantis, 1627, in which a band of English sailors discover the island of Ben Salem.
a sanctuary of abundance and beloved community directed by a scientific and technical elite, sworn to the enlarging of the bounds of human empire, to the effecting of all possible things, the wizards work in Solomon's House, a research and development center whose devotion to innovation and efficiency prefigured the ethos of modern laboratories and corporate bureaucracies. Solomon's House is the hub of a network of research, production, and amusement, engine houses for machinery, mathematical houses for computation, numerous other sites for the fabrication of silks, jewels, perfumes, and a host of culinary delicacies. Ben Salem also sports an entertainment industry with devices for feats of juggling, false apparitions, impostures, and illusions, as well as for imitation of motion by images in what resembles film or holograms. The island's intelligentsia relies on merchants of light, businessmen who, concealing their identities, procure knowledge and inventions from all over the globe. The New Atlantis spawned five centuries of technological beatific visions. Yet, while Bacon's celebration of human empire affirmed the desacralized, instrumental view of nature indispensable to capitalist enterprise, the search for what one character called natural divinations also suggests the persistence of enchantment. Bacon's ambiguous allegiance to alchemical and Rosicrucian ideas, recall the spirits or pneumaticals in which he believed, was evident in the mystical atmosphere of Ben Salem and its scientific magi. As the sailors approach Ben Salem, they see a great pillar of light rising from the sea up toward the heavens, at the top of which is a cross of light, bright and resplendent. The mandarins explain that the pillar is a true miracle, a suspension of natural law for some divine and excellent end. Far from secular, the technicians and researchers' daily routine includes hymns and services, as well as prayers for the illumination of our labors and the turning of them into good and holy uses. As the prayers suggest, Bacon clearly feared that the growing inventory of natural divinations could be turned to fraudulent purposes. The denizens of Solomon's house aver that they have so many things truly natural that induce admiration that they could easily deceive the senses, disguising the products of human artifice to make them seem more miraculous. Despite his commitment to the extension of human mastery, Bacon worried that the new empire of science and technology could conjure a host of counterfeit enchantments, works of human participation in the power of divinity that wrought malevolence in the guise of good. Similar utopian tracts appeared in the 1640s and 1650s, all positing an indelible link between the human and divine activities of mastery. Gabriel Platz's a Discovery of Infinite Treasure, 1639, and The Famous Kingdom of Macaria, 1641, as well as Samuel Gotts, Nova Solima, The Ideal City, or Jerusalem Regained, 1648. Gotts' theology of industrial utopianism was overtly sacramental. The world, one of the new Jerusalem's inhabitants, explains is the idolum or imago of the deity, who is a wise and active and indwelling spirit, motes in a sunbeam. Human beings resemble the fantasies and spectres of an active brain. We are the poems of God. Platts, an alchemist and agriculturalist who influenced John Winthrop, Jr. in his colonization of Connecticut, called on his compatriots to abandon doctrinal disputation and to concentrate on wealth, the real pith and substance of religion, in his view. If they identified the finger of God in their creation, the industrious, Platt maintained, could enjoy the intimate companionship of his presence, without whose blessing all is vanity and lost labor. 
Platts outlined a capitalist kingdom of innovation and technological deliverance, calling for the abolition of feudal land tenures and their replacement with contractual wage relations. Platt contended that new property relations would leave both landlord and tenant free to try experiments and improve to the utmost. Thus, well before the invention of classical political economy in the 18th century, capitalism had acquired not only moral approval, but also religious significance. Enclosures certainly prepared for the proletarianization of the common people, as Leinbaugh observes, but they did not, as he claims further, destroy the spiritual claim on the soil. In shredding the charter of the medieval commons and writing their own covenant of work, English improvers recast but did not abrogate the spiritual claim on the soil, or on the workshop, or the counting-house. Contrary to Weber, Protestant capitalists did not disenchant the world, rather they renegotiated the terms of enchantment. If they no longer held that Catholic sacramental ritual was efficacious for salvation, they believed that they encountered God in the midst of material creation and wealth. If Protestants had rejected Catholicism as a gospel of works, a scheme of salvation through enchanting external rituals rather than inward faith, the Protestant ethic was a gospel of work with riches as the new Eucharistic tokens of communion with divinity. To Puritans and other improving Protestants, the golden rules of capitalism codified a post-medieval theological economy. Even John Locke thought of God as the almighty sponsor of improvement. Some scholars have attempted to rescue Locke from the ideological lineage of what C. B. Macpherson called possessive individualism, stressing his objections to the unfettered accumulation of wealth, his admiration for small proprietors, and his Christian suspicion of the morally corrosive impact of prosperity. Yet, Locke's own moral imagination is thoroughly leavened with a pecuniary sensibility an advisor to the first Earl of Shaftesbury, an improving landlord and colonial investor, Locke was steeped in the agricultural literature of late Stuart England. Read against that background, his second treatise of government, 1690, is much more than a patristic text of liberalism. It is a theological manifesto of Christian capitalism, an early promulgation of commercial metaphysics. Although Locke has been credited with espousing a labor theory of value in the second treatise, "'Tis labor that puts the difference of value on everything," a closer examination reveals that money is the final standard of valuation. Locke observed that God has given the earth to men and women to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. Indeed, we are sent into the world by his order and about his business. Left without attention to his business, land that hath no improvement is called, as indeed it is, waste. Like Baxter, Locke measured advantage and convenience and improvement in almost wholly pecuniary terms. Improvement meant not just the art of cultivation, but the science of profitable enterprise. An acre of land in America may be as fertile as an acre in England, he observes, but it is not worth one one-thousandth of the English acre, for all the profit an Indian received from it were it valued and sold here. The value of the acre to the Indian as subsistence means little or nothing to Locke. What matters is the creation of exchange value, assessed in monetary terms and underwritten by the covert metaphysics of capital. Locke's remarks on money offer an early intimation of his new pecuniary metaphysics. Distinguishing between use value and monetary value, Locke interpreted the latter as a human creation with far-reaching, transubstantive consequences. 
By making it possible to acquire more things than one could use, money, he wrote, altered the intrinsic value of things. Their utility, as a vehicle of desire, created and maintained in motion by the tacit agreement of men, money, in effect, transformed, or rather cancelled, intrinsic value, and wrought what amounted to a metaphysical metamorphosis. At the same time, as Locke's comparison of European and Amerindian acreage indicated, money displaced labor and utility as a stand of valuation. Land in England and land in America possessed the same intrinsic value he conceded, but they now differed in monetary value, hence his dismissal of all the profit an Indian received from it. Locke remained well aware of the purely conventional nature of monetary value. He expressed astonishment that a little piece of yellow metal could be worth a great piece of flesh or a whole heap of corn. But in the end, money's moral and metaphysical authority, affirmed by the profitable improvement it made possible, sufficed to muffle any further objections. Thus, in Locke's view, Improvement, not labor, confers a right to property. Improvement understood as God's appointed business of increasing profitable production. His business is capitalist business. The systematic entrepreneurial development of land through enclosure from the commons. For Locke, the whole point of the commons is to be steadily diminished by gainful improvement. The land and labor themselves are evaluated in the terms of pecuniary reason and ontology. So, despite, or rather precisely because of, his concern for the small agricultural proprietor, Locke remains, along with Hobbes, one of the premier ideological architects of possessive individualism. Far from offering an apologetic for labor, Locke vindicated the divine right of capital, supplementing Hobbes's fabrication of enchantment in Leviathan, 1651, where the commonwealth is a mortal god with a theology of improvement. At the same time, in sanctioning the dispossession of indigenous peoples for their lack of prowess in his business, the second treatise contained a theological warrant for English colonization and genocide. For Locke, as for Baxter, Herbert, and subsequent chaplains for the mercenary armies of improvement, capitalism bore the mandate of heaven, and its emissaries held a divine license to consign their opponents to eternal damnation. If Protestant enchantment sacralized his business, it also inspired prophecy against the brave new world of money and improvement. The religious allure of the new capitalist order obsessed numerous Elizabethan and Jacobean writers, from poets and playwrights to political economists and commercial pamphleteers. Mammon, Philip Spencer wrote in The Fairy Queen, 1590, is god of the world and worldlings, greatest god below the sky. Ben Jonson satirized the commercial culture of Jacobean London in Volpone, 1606, whose eponymous protagonist, a greedy and salacious Venetian nobleman, greets the dawn with a gilded prayer. Good morning to the day, and next my gold. Upon the shrine that I may see my saint, hail the world's soul and mine. Let me kiss, with adoration, thee and every relic of sacred treasure in this blessed room. Our summum bonum is commodity, Robert Burton lamented in The Autonomy of Melancholy, 1621, and the goddess we adore, Deo Moneta, Queen Money, to whom we daily offer sacrifice. Queen Money poisoned souls, divided friends, parted lovers, and reduced patriarchs, lords, and emperors to abject servility. She made a mockery of piety and revealed the face of perverse, sublunary desire. 
Take your heaven. Let them have money. Denunciations of Mammon and his minions persisted throughout the seventeenth century, even among Puritans, especially after the abandonment of the Republican cause of the 1640s and 1650s and the restoration of the Stuart monarchy. From the ranks of artisans, traders, and other less successful members of the elect came John Bunyan, a tinker and a poor man, a Puritan tribune convinced that God's people are most commonly of the poorer sort. His morality tale set against the gaudy fleshpots of Restoration England, The Pilgrim's Progress, 1678, is also a melodramatic homily of Puritan populism. En route to the celestial city, two pilgrims, Christian and faithful, come upon Vanity Fair, whose urbane and callous inhabitants deal in houses, lands, bodies, souls, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones. Faithful is murdered, but Christian makes his way to Beulah, an enchanted ground whose vapors overwhelm him. Later, Christian's wife, Christiana, crosses over Beulah and encounters the infamous Madame Bubble, mistress of the world, who reveals herself as the enchantress. It is by a virtue of her sorceries that this ground is enchanted. Christian awakens and proceeds to the celestial city, builded by pearls and precious stones, and whose streets are paved with gold. In other words, the elements traded in the sinful markets of Vanity Fair. The city is the reality of which Vanity Fair is the enchanting but insidious simulacrum. Yet, despite Bunyan's insistence that, as Christian says, the soul of religion is the practical part, he counseled resignation to the inevitable sway of sin and mercenary morality. Bunyan surely looked backward to the old laws which are the Magna Carta, the sole basis of the government of a kingdom. But Christian never avers that Vanity Fair can be destroyed, reformed, or redeemed. Like Christian, we must carry our crosses and expect no justice in this vain and fallen world. Light years different from Bunyan in theology and sensibility, John Milton's bold and truculent disparagement of Calvinist predestinarianism, though I may be sent to hell for it, such a God will never command my respect, encapsulated his religious and political radicalism. Milton's radicalism stemmed in part, scholars now agree, from his embrace of an animist materialism, an ontology in which the distinction between spirit and matter has been abolished. As the angel Raphael explains to Adam in Paradise Lost, 1667, One first matter all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live of life, but more refined, more spirituous, more pure. In Paradise Lost, angels eat, drink, and make love. Milton's animist materialism, a heterodox brand of sacramentality, could inspire a communist vision and a critique of accumulation. Paradise, the angel Raphael explains to Adam, is an image and likeness of the celestial homeland. God hath here varied his bounty as with new delights, as may compare with heaven. Eden is innocent of propriety, enclosure, and hierarchy. With love as their sole propriety, Adam and Eve share a happy rural seat of various view, without mine and thine, or master and servant. Among unequals, what society can sort, what harmony or true delight? While work is to be done in Eden, it is pleasant and moderate, uncompelled by profit or productivity. Before the fall, they performed, no more toil than sufficed, to recommend cool Zephyr and made ease, more easy. Once Satan slithers into the garden, 
this earthly beatitude ends, and the sinful regime of toil and accumulation commences. Milton suggests that the ethic of improvement is the spawn of mammon. Milton's mammon is the perfect example of perversion, a being who reveres and desires creation even more than he loves its creator. The least erected spirit that fell from heaven, for even in heaven his looks and thoughts were always downward bent, admiring more the riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold, than aught divine or wholly else enjoyed in vision beatific. Milton portrays Mammon as the demon of possessive individualism. While Moloch and Belial rally the fallen angels for a second offensive against God, Mammon advises not merely resignation, but strenuous, defiant self-reliance. Rather than be vassals in heaven, we damned, Mammon thunders, can seek our own good from ourselves and from our own live to ourselves, free and to none accountable, preferring hard liberty to heaven's easy yoke of servile pomp, Mammon robustly preaches the work ethic, admonishing his fellow condemned to work ease out of pain, through labor and endurance. Indeed, Mammon voices the hidden desire at work in capitalist enterprise, the construction of a parody of the heavenly city. This desert soil wants not a hidden lustre, gems and gold, nor want we skill or art from whence to raise magnificence, and what can heaven show more? As the prototype of industrious improvement, Mammon leads the excavation crew for Pandemonium, the capital city of hell, and they erect a temple with golden architrave. As Milton makes clear, the construction of pandemonium is the paradigm for later human despoliation of the earth. Just as mammon fractures the soil and mountains of hell for building materials, so men, by his suggestion taught, seek to plunder and desecrate creation. They have ransacked the center and with impious hands rifled the bowels of their mother earth for treasures better hid. Paradise Lost records the experience of defeat shared by partisans of the good old cause, the abolition of monarchy, the disestablishment of the Church of England, the creation of a republic, and, at its most radical, the eradication of class. Milton gave melancholy voice to a desire that had been thwarted by Cromwell and the Stuarts, a godly, sacramental communism. The cultural revolution launched by the Puritans was not the only one envisioned in England. In the 1640s and 1650s, dissenters from Anglican and Puritan orthodoxy, itinerant craftsmen and displaced cottagers, often in league with young, iconoclastic graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, attempted to stage an alternative cultural revolution, one that looked backward to the tradition of the commons, but also pointed to an egalitarian future. In the maelstrom of religious and political turmoil that defined the English Revolution, these nomadic, masterless men and women formed an underground of plebeian saints. From the dispossessed rabble, they believed, the Holy Spirit would ascend and Christ would, in Gerard Winstanley's phrase, rise up in sons and daughters, to establish his earthly republic of love. Before Cromwell's protectorate quashed the good old cause in 1653, England abounded with groups determined to turn the world upside down. Levelers, familists, fifth monarchy men, Adamites, ranters, and true levelers or diggers. Like less radical Protestants, they blended magic, astrology, and alchemy with the mechanical philosophy. Rejecting rituals, doctrines, and often the Bible itself, religious radicals placed more credence in individual judgment and mystical consciousness, repudiating priestly meditation for a wider democracy of sacramental experience. 
With sin defeated and consigned to oblivion, many radicals sought to re-enter the splendor of the Garden of Eden before the fall. However, temporarily, the party of Carnival held Lent at bay and rehearsed for the People's Republic of Heaven. My most excellent majesty and eternal glory, proclaimed Abiezer Kopp, an Oxford-educated ranter, resides in me, who am universal love and whose service is perfect freedom and perfect libertinism. God is that mighty leveller, Cop avowed, who would, upon the glorious return of his son, overturn, overturn, overturn. The most profound challenge to the new regime of enclosure and commerce came from the diggers, whose spokesman, Win Stanley, addressed the question of property with remarkable theological bravado. In April 1649, Win Stanley and several others occupied a piece of common land on St. George's Hill in Surrey, just outside London. After tearing down fences and other enclosures, they planted vegetables and invited all to come in and help them. Reviving the ethos of the medieval countryside, they declared that England would never be free until all enjoyed a free allowance to dig and labor the commons. Harassed in court and bullied by local landowners, the diggers were forced to abandon St. George's in August. The summer of love ended, and the sinful reign of law and order was restored. Other digger colonies cropped up throughout England, but they too were quickly and ferociously suppressed. Never trained in philosophy or divinity, when Stanley forged his Christianity out of his own experiences of misery, doubt, and epiphany. Born in 1609, he had been a cloth merchant in London, but when his business failed in 1643, he was forced to move to Cobham where he labored as a cowherd. In the tracts and pamphlets that he began writing at this time, when Stanley denounced the dubious ethics of commerce, recalling unscrupulous traders, including perhaps himself, who demanded, sometimes too much, for their goods. Having fallen into rural wage labor, when Stanley now knew from bitter experience the hardships and indignities of poverty, sickness, frowns of friends, hatred of men, losses of his estate by fire, being cheated by false-spirited men. Official religion had offered no help, though he had been an eager hearer of sermons and a blind professor and strict goer to church. No denomination offered the poor anything beyond chastisement, or the afterlife. From this maelstrom of personal ruin and despair, when Stanley fashioned a daring and compelling theology of communism. In an extraordinary four-year burst of writing, 1648 to 1652, when Stanley published pamphlets and treatises that fused theology, metaphysics, history, and politics, convinced as he proclaimed in The True Leveler's Standard, Advanced, 1649, that the great creator reason made the earth to be a common treasury, when Stanley narrated a story of original fraternity, descent into private property, and redemption back into communism. A great mystery had been unfolding on St. George's Hill, he believed, a spiritual revolution seen by the material eyes of the flesh. It was the fullness of time, he and the diggers believed, that scripture which saith the poor shall inherit the earth is really and materially to be fulfilled. The end of the world appeared to be impending, when Stanley's invocation of the Creator reason has led Hill his most influential interpreter, to claim that when Stanley was, if not an outright rationalist, at the very least, a religious precursor to modern, secular communism. The poetic, mythopoeic style came naturally to him, Hill contends. When Stanley, 
was struggling towards concepts which were more precisely, if less poetically formulated, by non-theological materialisms. He was certainly unorthodox, mystical, and anticlerical. The conventional notion of God held him under darkness, he confessed. He recounted ecstatic episodes of vision, voice, and revelation. Vision in dreams and out of dreams, as well as prophecies, visions, and revelations of scriptures, of prophets and apostles. He despised the Anglican clergy for their unctuous obeisance to crown and property, and he scoffed at the divine inspiration of the Bible, freely engaging in allegorical interpretations. Yet, Hill's contention that when Stanley was poetically struggling towards ideas articulated, more precisely, by non-theological materialisms, reflects all the unexamined assumptions that underlie the narrative of secularization, especially that poetic or mythopoeic forms of understanding and explanation stand in absolute, intractable antagonism to scientific, historical, and technological terms. If Hobbes's political imagination was thoroughly mechanistic, when Stanley's recalled the enchanted medieval sacramental worldview in which the divinity of reason allowed it to speak in a variety of dialects, nature, prophecy, revelation, and the rising up of Christ in sons and daughters. At the same time, the position that pre-modern revolutionary ideas must be somehow liberated from their confinement within religious language rests on the assumption that religion is incapable of generating a genuinely revolutionary imagination. But when Stanley did not need dialectics of class analysis to respond to injustice, he denounced private property and the theft of the commons, because they violated God's original communist mandate for creation. And that was enough to impel him to action. A representative of plebeian Protestantism, when Stanley was not a proto-deistic infidel, but rather a political theologian of the radical wing of the English Reformation. He was not struggling toward anything other than a prophetic remonstrance against the Lucifer of enclosure. His materialism was sacramental, his politics were religious, and his communism was redemptive. Though resolutely unorthodox, when Stanley's theology of communism was robustly sacramental, permeating all things without being identifiable with matter, when Stanley's God was purely, radically imminent, pervading and enlivening the material world. He does not reside above the firmament or constitute a state of eternity untouched by the vicissitudes of time and place. The Father is not confined to any one particular place, for He is in every place and in every creature. He wrote in Truth Lifting Up Its Head Above Scandals, 1649. The whole creation he observed, is the clothing of God. The body of Christ is where the Father is, in the earth, purifying the earth, and His Spirit is entered into the whole creation, which is the heavenly glory where the Father dwells. Later, in The Fire in the Bush, 1650, when Stanley reiterated that God fills all with Himself, He is in all things, and by Him all things consist. But creation had fallen from the heavenly glory, and the diggers proposed to lead the way back to paradise before the fall. With the earth as his clothing, and with men and women as his undefiled image and likeness, God had ordained common ownership of the planet as the original state of nature. When Stanley repeated, in post-dogmatic terms, the medieval ontology of love and abundance, the living earth is the very garden of Eden, wherein that spirit of love did walk. Imbued with love and reason, every single man, male and female, is a perfect creature of himself, and the same spirit that made the globe dwells in man to govern the globe. 
Though man was created a perfect creature, the fall was an act of idolatry, committed when man began to delight himself in the objects of the creation more than in the spirit of reason and righteousness. This perverse delight led inexorably to private property, class conflict, and tyrannical government. Civil propriety, as he called the system of dominion that held the vast majority in mesmerized servitude. Civil propriety blighted all of creation. The air and earth is all poisoned, and the curse dwells in both, through man's unrighteousness. The form of idolatry and bondage that Winstanley's rural contemporaries knew was the disturbing devil of capitalist property. The earth was hedged in to enclosures, he observed in a declaration from the poor oppressed people of England, 1649, while men were subjected to the demon of money, the great God that hedges in some and hedges out others. Enclosure was the mark of perverted desire for the sacramental goods of the earth. A year later, delivering a New Year's gift for the Parliament and Army, 1650, when Stanley extended his prophetic range to include the entire political system, sounding the inaugural notes in what would become the tradition of modern anarchism. There are two kinds of kingly power, he explained. One, that of Almighty God ruling the whole creation in peace, the power of universal love. And the other, the power of unrighteousness, which indeed is the devil, the monarchy that superintends the satanic regime of enclosure and money. When Stanley believed that the end of this infernal tyranny was nigh, to be followed by the restoration of the original communist state of nature. We see it to be the fullness of time, he wrote. The new Jerusalem was imminent, and the glory of the Lord shall be seen and known within the creation. But we shall not do this by force of arms, he declared, but rather through the streaming out of love in our hearts towards all. Citing the book of Acts, he described the descent of the Spirit on the brethren. The rich men sold their possessions, and gave part to the poor, and no man said that aught that he possessed was his own, for they all had things common. In the communist democracy of a new English Eden, the great cheat of buying and selling would cease, as would class, clergy, monarchy, and enclosure. Universal love would overwhelm the insidious enclosures of the devil, and men and women would re-enter the state of simple plain-heartedness or innocency. That they are resolved to work and eat together, making the earth a common treasury, doth join hands with Christ to lift up creation from bondage and restore all things from the curse. The world turned upside down which is to say, the world turned right side up and inside out, was a people's republic of heaven, more a herald of liberation theology than a harbinger of modern secularity, when Stanley illustrated the radical potential of the sacramental imagination. And yet, the garden remained padlocked and guarded. When Cromwell became Lord Protector in 1653, he imposed a military government. God did not overturn, overturn, overturn. And when Charles II reclaimed the throne in 1660, Providence seemed to put a royal seal on the plutocracy of enclosure and improvement. Auguring the defeat of the good old cause, when Stanley had reflected melancholically on the failure of his attempt to re-enter Eden, knowledge why didst thou come to wound and not to cure? Milton and other radicals retired from politics. When Stanley himself fled into respectability, becoming a prosperous corn merchant, a member of the Society of Friends, and a resident of the fashionable Bloomsbury district of London, 
the beatific vision of St. George's Hill must have seemed like the folly of a dream. Chapter 2 The God Among Commodities Christian Political Economy Marks on Fetishism and the Power of Money in Bourgeois Society By the end of the 17th century, the juggernaut of improvement had accelerated the pace and scope of rural enclosure. By 1750, having seized control over the labor of agricultural workers and struggling skilled workers, urban merchants were taking the initial steps in the degradation of artisanal labor, the unleashing of the unbound Prometheus, the industrial revolution against the order of craft the making of the English working class. Meanwhile, new, more permissive attitudes toward consumption developed among the urban middle classes, eager to emulate the tastes of the aristocracy, who in turn escalated the standards of consumption to stay ahead of upstart bourgeois. Whether or not Hanoverian England was the first consumer society, it witnessed a profound metamorphosis in attitudes toward pleasure and consumption. How did a frugal and striving class of improvers give way to avid consumers of textiles, pottery, and luxury items? Certainly, the old Puritan strictures against luxury retained much of their force. Fears of degenerate, emasculating ease persisted into the nineteenth century. But, among Enlightenment luminaries such as Bernard Mandeville, David Hume, and Adam Smith, the ideals of simplicity and asceticism were being supplanted by a rehabilitation of desire, in Christopher Lash's words, in which the incessant, indefinite multiplication of material wants was lauded as the engine of progress. Mandeville's Fable of the Bees, 1714, was notorious for its exuberant cynicism about the benefits of vice, writing in Of Refinement in the Arts, 1752, Hume contended that by stimulating initiative, ingenuity, and sociability, the pleasures of luxury and the profit of commerce promote an increase of humanity, an expansion of the sphere of moral concern and capacity for generosity. Industry, knowledge, and humanity are linked by an indissoluble chain, and are found to be peculiar to the more polished and luxurious ages. In The Theory of Moral Sentiments, 1759, Smith mused on the beneficent ruses of avarice. Enchanted with the distant idea of felicity, a poor boy, charmed with the beauty of the luxuries abounding in the blue-blood world of pleasure, will work and cultivate his talents to fulfill his desire for riches, only to discover that wealth and greatness are mere trinkets of frivolous utility. Yet, it is well that nature imposes upon us in this manner, Smith observed, for, it is this deception which rouses and keeps in continual motion the industry of mankind. Yet, the rehabilitation of desire was not purely a secular project of liberation. As Colin Campbell has argued, a nascent culture of consumption gestated within Protestantism itself. Beginning in the mid-seventeenth century, a loose coalition of moral pioneers— Cambridge Platonist advocates of spiritual sensation, Arminian rebels against the rigors of Calvinism, and Lockean advocates of sensationalist psychology, forged what Campbell dubs the other Protestant ethic, an affirmation of emotional experience that eventually culminated in evangelical religion and romanticism. Through this other Protestant ethic, the enchantment formally attributed to the external world was relocated in the individual self. In the three centuries after the Reformation, Campbell argues, wonder, marvel, and other qualities once considered features of the medieval sacramental cosmos gradually became aspects within, not outside the self, 
subjective reactions to an otherwise desacralized world now understood by the standards of science. If the world was disenchanted, the self was not. This enchantment of subjectivity sanctioned a Christian sentimentalism in which individual sensibility served as the register of moral and religious truth. Idealized in the man of feeling, who was exquisitely attuned to the emotions of others, Christian sentimentalism celebrated the experience of delight in righteous conduct, while Christian sentimentalism leavened an ethic of benevolence and humanitarianism that issued in abolitionism, factory reform, and the extension of the suffrage, it also constituted a new form of enchantment that provided the English bourgeoisie with a moral license to participate in fashionable consumption. Thus, Campbell implies, modern capitalism rests on a metaphysical fault line, a profane, inanimate external world given over to calculation and control, and a hedonistic, enchanted internal realm of daydream, fantasy, and romance. In a world increasingly understood in terms of Newtonian physics and mechanism, what John Brewer has dubbed the pleasures of the imagination became new enchantments of capitalist modernity. Yet, for quite some time, the advance of rationalism, empiricism, and other secular forms of consciousness was not incompatible with Protestant enchantment. Take, for instance, Joseph Addison and Richard Steele's Spectator, one of the first periodicals to represent the worldview of the Hanoverian bourgeoisie, aiming to enliven morality with wit and to tempo wit with morality. The Spectator would seem to epitomize what historians have depicted as the urbane and stylish secularism of the English Enlightenment. As Whigs, Addison and Steele were enthusiastic promoters of commercial expansion, industrial development, and the civilizing pleasures of consumption. Yet, they also saw the Almighty everywhere, even in the delights of the senses. As Addison wrote in a July 1714 issue of The Spectator, his being passes through, actuates and supports the whole frame of nature, his creation and every part of it, is full of Him. His substance is within the substance of every being, whether material or immaterial. Whether or not this is pantheism matters less than its avowal of metaphysical enchantment, the truth of which Addison added, reason as well as revelation assures us. In another issue, Addison mused further that we may taste and see how gracious He is by his influence upon our minds, by those virtuous thoughts, secret comforts and refreshments, ravishing joys and inward satisfactions. Almost a month later, Addison concluded his religious reveries with an eloquent testimonial to the pleasures of enchantment, discerning in the fulfillment of our physical senses the voluptuous presence of divinity. Why? he asked rhetorically, should we exclude the satisfaction of these faculties, which we find by experience as inlets of great pleasure to the soul? Blending virtue, reason, and comfort, Addison's apologia for the pleasures of the imagination, ratified in his genteel sensibility by God's pervasive presence in creation, was a Whiggish precursor to the evangelical cosmology of industrial capitalism. In the Christian political economy that arose in the early 19th century, British evangelicals defended unfettered markets and the new regime of factories and labor discipline as features of the harmony and beauty, the symmetry and order of that system which God and nature have established in the world, as one early expositor explained. Indebted to Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill and other worldly philosophers, God's evangelical economists espoused a theological economy of the Protestant Enlightenment. The laws of the market, discernible by science, were the edicts of an active and ever-present Almighty. 
thus fusing the moral vernacular of sentimentalism with the idiom of modern science christian political economists recast the theology of capitalist misenchantment and as representatives of a rising class of merchants factory owners managers and technicians they refashioned the work ethic in terms of industrial technology and managerial authority like the puritan universe of improvement and omens evangelical cosmology blended capitalist modernity with belief in enchanted powers as alison winter has demonstrated many evangelicals were enthusiasts of mesmerism much like the many victorian scientists who investigated mesmerism hypnosis trances and other paranormal phenomena evangelicals straddled the boundary between the vestiges of occult and the canons of natural science belief in influences correspondences and animal magnetism was rife among the victorian middle and upper classes and many evangelicals either feared or succumbed to what one acknowledged as the mysterious and subtle agency of mesmerists like puritans assessing the value of magic evangelicals disputed not the efficacy of mesmerism but its contribution to spiritual health one of the leading evangelical economists richard whateley anglican archbishop of dublin was a mesmerist and mesmeric patient who founded the london mesmeric infirmary in the 1850s despite whateley's open and passionate practice of mesmerism he was never reproached by his brethren whateley considered mesmerism both a spiritual practice and a body of knowledge akin to the political economy he taught at oxford in the early 1830s like his fellow christian economists whateley held that the laws of the universe had been decreed by a mysterious but resplendent god In his introductory lectures on political economy, 1831, Whateley declared that political economy was a branch of natural theology, providing evidence of striking marks of wisdom similar to those in astronomy or physiology. A Scottish Presbyterian clergyman, as well as a lecturer on divinity, mathematics, and political economy at St Andrews and Edinburgh. Thomas Chalmers maintained that economic laws were beautiful as well as utilitarian, celebrating the thriving interchange of commodities in the application of Christianity to the commercial and ordinary affairs of life. 1820, Chalmers marveled at the beauteous order of the market wrought by the presiding divinity who compasses all his going. God's grace could enrapture and fructify the apparently sordid dealings of business, impregnating our minutest transactions with the spirit of the gospel. Chalmers explained the plenitude of grace available to all who asked, a great stream of supply which comes direct from heaven to earth. This grace-filled abundance ensured success in the market, the sign and seal of a beauteous character. but as thomas malthus and other christian economists proved such beauty truly was in the eye of the beholder scarcity evil and suffering played positive roles in the evangelical theodicy of capitalism to many of the evangelical economists our expulsion from the garden of eden was not a punishment but an opportunity in the evangelical gospel of scarcity privation was excellent news the lashes of adversity and competition would compel us into moral and material improvement malthus and nassau senior led the way among evangelical economists in redefining evil as a necessary good in his infamous essay on the principle of population 1798 malthus an instructor at haileybury college the training school for administrators of the east india company as well as an anglican pastor asserted that want conflict and other agonies were parts of a godly metaphysical and moral architecture human life he asserted is 
a state of trial and school of virtue preparatory to a superior state of happiness. Departing from the mainstream of Christian theology since Augustine, Malthus argued that moral evils and natural calamities were absolutely necessary to the production of moral excellence, instruments employed by the deity to spur industriousness and ingenuity. Malthus's insistence on the goodness of disaster rested on a toilsome, penurious sacramentality, an ontology of dearth and meanness designed by an omnipotent but skinflint deity. Life is the mighty process of God, he insisted, a process necessary to awaken inert, chaotic matter into spirit. The finger of God is indeed visible in every blade of grass that we see, and among the animating touches of the divinity is the salutary character of evil. Evil exists in the world not to create despair but activity. If it failed to spur industry, then, Malthus wrote in the 1826 edition, we should facilitate, instead of foolishly and vainly endeavouring to impede, the operations of nature in producing this mortality, that is, the death of the poor. Senior, first professor of political economy at Oxford and a protégé of Whateley's, told students in 1830 that God and nature decreed that the road to good shall be through evil, that no improvement shall take place in which the general advantage shall not be accompanied by partial suffering. So, rather than look to reform or revolution to end their miserable condition, evangelicals such as Cobden advised workers that they should abide by the principle of competition which God has set up in this wicked world as the silent arbiter of our fate. The God of love consigned the poor and dispossessed to a lifelong Calvary road. By the 1840s, many workers had been acquainted with that principle of competition through subjection to the industrial division of labor. Misenchanted and driven by the same imperatives that propelled earlier agrarian improvers, Victorian manufacturers and merchants patented industrial forms of enclosure. The Industrial Revolution was a social and political process in which artisans and craftspeople were dispossessed, stripped of traditional skills which were then rationalized and embodied in new technologies and subjected both to an increasing subdivision of labor and to the control of overseers and managers. The transformation of skilled workers into factory hands, the proletarianization of craft, a process every bit as coercive as the eviction of peasants from the commons, was essential to the introduction of industrial technology. As Andrew Urey acknowledged in the Philosophy of Manufacturers, 1835, skilled labor gets progressively superseded and will eventually be replaced by mere onlookers of machines. Yuri was aware that capital's most formidable enemy was the skilled worker, so self-willed and intractable that the worker's stubborn insistence on independence would inevitably do great damage to the whole. Of capital's plans, that is. To design the technical and moral artillery for its warfare against the workers, capital enlisted the skills of a new and specialized breed of improvers, managers, scientists, engineers, and consultants, the vanguard of industrial progress. As the first general staff of industrial capitalism, individuals such as Yuri and Charles Babbage devised the first strategies of modern class warfare. But Babbage and Yuri were also evangelists of management and chaplains of industrialism. Both were deeply religious men who thought of their work as a form of moral and natural theology. A mathematician who believed that the promotion of scientific education was also the promotion of true religion. Babbage was also an amateur theologian of science who claimed that his calculating engine could establish the invariability of the laws of divine creation.
While this was the language of natural theology, Babbage also employed an earlier rhetoric of magical enchantment. In On the Economy of Machinery and Manufactures, 1832, his manual on the arts of industrial techniques and managerial domination, Babbage had rhapsodized about the living miracles that proliferated throughout the natural world. This was a Christian language of sacramentality, and when he speculated about the technological future, Babbage hinted that modern inventors were the heirs of the discredited enchanters of old. The forces, dimly perceived by priests, shamans, and wizards, the unreal creations of fancy or of fraud, would obey a holier spell when, called at the command of science from their shadowy existence. With their enchantments purified by Christian faith, managers and inventors were the magicians of industry, the shamans of automation. Yuri was an even more versatile and popular enchanter of mechanization. Educated at Glasgow, Yuri was an evangelical polymath. In addition to his highly remunerative work as an industrial consultant to English, French, and Belgian manufacturers, he was also an astronomer, chemist, and scriptural geologist, one of a dwindling number who aimed to reconcile the growing geological evidence with a literal interpretation of Genesis. But Yuri's geological work was not merely another case study in fundamentalist folly. The same evangelical faith that inspired his geology also galvanized his managerial thought, for Yuri considered his philosophy of manufactures, a vindication of God's mechanical ways to human beings. An apparently mechanistic ontology underlay both Yuri's promotion of industrial technology and his case for managerial prerogative. God's universe was a vast machine composed of moral and material parts. Thus, in the philosophy of manufactures, Yuri could admonish the wise manufacturer to organize his moral machinery on equally sound principles with his mechanical. Yet, Yuri's philosophy of managerial dominion was also leavened by a capitalist misenchantment. An enchanted sensibility lay underneath the moralistic and mechanical veneer. The dour consultant doubled as a priest in the cult of technological fetishism. Despite his relentless concentration on the productive benefits of automation, Yuri revealed, on occasion, a profound allurement by the power and complexity of machinery. Yuri was unmistakably enthralled by the idea of a vast automaton composed of various mechanical and intellectual organs acting in uninterrupted concert for the production of a common object, all of them being subordinated to a self-regulated moving force. Elsewhere, drawing on classical mythology, Yuri likened the automated factory to a giant industrial gendarme. With the Luddite uprisings of the 1810s still terrifyingly fresh in his memory, and with chartist agitation for the suffrage gathering strength among the working class, Yuri looked to industrial and technical means to quell proletarian disruption. At the bidding of Minerva, the Roman goddess of crafts and commerce, an iron man, as the operatives fitly call it, sprung out of the hands of our modern Prometheus. By subjecting workers to the political fatigue induced by factory regimentation, this mechanical golem would restore order among the industrious classes and strangle the hydra of misrule. Whether in the workplace or on the gallows, workers were so many sacrificial animals offered up to the spirit of Minerva. Yet, Yuri also stepped forth as a herald of a beloved community of production— if allowed by virtuous owners and pliant workers to grace the factory, divine love could suffuse the division of labor, enabling a new life to circulate through every vein of industry. Yuri believed, devoutly, that the kingdom of heaven could enliven the automated factory. 
Yuri's technological beatitude represented the heaven of evangelical misenchantment. Evangelical policy in Ireland during the Great Famine of the 1840s embodied its infernal counterpart. To evangelical economists, the Almighty's didactic malevolence was evident. The starvation that racked the Irish people was the judgment of God on the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the Irish people, in the words of Sir Charles Trevelyan, prominent evangelical and chief administrator of famine relief. It was the direct stroke of an all-wise and all-merciful providence. Though some economists grumbled that providence had botched the job, Senior complained that a million deaths would scarcely be enough to do much good. God's painful but ultimately beauteous providence had a benevolent purpose, shoving the indigent Irish along the Calvary Road of industrial modernization. Followed with Malthusian piety, evangelical economics played a central role in prolonging and deepening the catastrophe in Ireland. To Christian political economists, the Great Famine was a beautiful, marvelous omen in the arduous comedy of God's judgment. Historians, seeking to burnish the penny-pinching image of Christian political economy, have pointed out that evangelical economists supported voluntary humanitarian schemes in poor relief, religious instruction, and education. Other scholars have traced the origins of British consumer culture to evangelical moralism, contending that middle-class Christians reconciled their newfound wealth with their stated devotion to parsimony by attributing moral qualities to commodities. Yet, such balancing acts were responses, usually inadequate, to the misery caused by the very policies blessed by evangelical economists. The brutal, impoverishing, and often lethal ordeal of proletarianization was, from their standpoint, an inextricable part of God's beauteous order. Evangelical capitalists and their fawning clerisy induced the disease to which they offered a paltry, sanctimonious remedy. John Ruskin, who, unconverted from his parents' evangelical faith, would later excoriate this heartless sentimentality. You knock a man into a ditch, and then you tell him to remain content in the position in which providence has placed him. He sneered in The Crown of Wild Olive, 1866. That's modern Christianity. Many of Ruskin's contemporaries were also dismissing modern Christianity, and placing their faith in the emerging social sciences. Throughout the nineteenth century, what Weber would term the disenchantment of the world was the major catalyst for the science of sociology. Sociology originated in the 1820s as a search for a secular religion, with French sociologists as the premier catechists of a new divinity for industrial society. Henri de Saint-Simon, for instance, contrived a new Christianity, stripped of its cultic and doctrinal elements, to infuse his idealized industrial technocracy. His missionary journal was entitled Le Catechisme des Industriels, the Catechism of the Industrialists. In the late 1840s, Saint-Simon's student and secretary, Auguste Comte, constructed an elaborate religion of humanity, complete with its own catechism, liturgy, sacraments, and theology. Society, for Comte, was le vrai grand être, the true great being who compels our worship. Less exotic than Comte, Émile Durkheim remained confident that religion could be recovered and recast in secular modernity. As he argued in The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, 1912, although there are no immortal Gospels, there is no reason to believe that humanity is henceforth incapable of conceiving new ones. If modernity had killed the traditional deities, its own gods were still being born. But if the inhabitants of industrial society sought modern equivalents of totemism, the emblems and objects believed by earlier peoples to possess extraordinary powers, they would have to look to industrial life
were the sources of modern enchantment. Under the circumstances, this meant that any modern totems would have to emerge from industrial capitalism. Modern people lived in a state of suspension. The ancient gods grow old or die, and others are not yet born. Weber foresaw a more melancholy future for secularizing capitalist societies. In the Protestant ethic, he predicted the reign of professional and managerial experts, specialists without spirit, hedonists without heart. The permanently disenchanted world would be a wasteland of mass-produced tedium and vanity, a monstrous development of ossification dressed up with a kind of desperate self-importance. Convinced that disenchantment was an irreversible condition, Weber dismissed the quest for new gods as futile and demeaning, and admonished the disenchanted to ignore the treacherous siren songs of religion. The godless must set to work and meet the demands of the day. He snarled like a burger in science as a vocation. Still, fearful of a future designed by soulless industrialists and technocrats, even Weber seemed at times to long for some renewal of the ancient verities of enchantment. Maybe, he mused in the Protestant ethic, New prophets will arise, and powerful old ideas and ideals will be reborn. Marx and Engels acknowledged the endurance of a longing for the world of old gods as well. Indeed, Marx focused his critique of capitalism on its fundamentally religious qualities. Despite its historical role as a force for secularization, as the Communist Manifesto put it, the pecuniary habit of mind, encouraged by the rage to accumulate, drowns the most heavenly ecstasies in the icy waters of egotistical calculation. Capitalism generated its own peculiar forms of religious deception. The alienation of workers from their own labor and production, the fetishism of commodities that emerges from market exchange, and the brands of technological idolatry that arise with machinery and modern industry. For Marx, if disenchantment is one of the progressive features of capital science and technology, it can only be fully achieved through the thorough disenchantment of capitalism itself, the exposure of its own alienations and fetishes as duplicitous and oppressive phantoms. Bound up with a radical critique of religion, Marx's account of alienation, our loss of control over our own powers and achievements, was part of a lineage of disenchantment. Like the left Hegelians, he eventually repudiated, Marx secularized the work of G. F. W. Hegel, according to whom history unfolded as a series of dialectical conflicts within an absolute spirit. Left Hegelians such as Bruno Bauer and Ludwig Feuerbach recast Hegel's spirit as humanity and contended that history was actually the story of human alienation and its eventual transcendence through scientific knowledge and philosophical materialism. In The Essence of Christianity, 1841, one of the most provocative and influential books of the 19th century, Feuerbach argued that God represented the hopes and capacities of humanity projected onto a heavenly screen and then worshipped and feared as a being outside us. Once we realized that human beings are thoroughly and irreducibly matter, we could reclaim those powers and aspirations, ameliorate our condition, and finally flourish in plenty justice, and love. We would, in other words, realize the essence of Christianity, that is, the essence of humanity. Working as a journalist and revolutionary agitator in the 1840s, Marx embarked on a kindred project of disenchantment. In his view, the problem with Feuerbach and other left Hegelians, indeed a problem endemic to the Enlightenment, was that by stressing the need to change consciousness, 
they downplayed the primacy of material conditions and political struggle in shaping that consciousness. Marx's famous conclusion in his Theses on Feuerbach, 1845, that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it, stemmed from a historical materialist position that consciousness, and specifically religion, arose from the evolving everyday realities of social and economic life. The origins of religion were indeed earthly, Marx agreed. But, after locating those origins, Feuerbach and his followers proceeded to leave them untouched and even unexamined. To abolish the alienation that culminated in religion, the wretched earthly situation that produced it had to be transformed through politics. The antidote to religion was not atheism, but revolution. After the earthly family is discovered to be the secret of the holy family, the former must then itself be destroyed in theory and in practice. In line with this historical materialism, Marx reworked alienation into a critique of capitalism. Like Feuerbach, Marx considered religion the most glorious and revealing mode of alienation. Limited by their material and social conditions, men and women could not realize their capacities for free, versatile creativity in harmony with one another and nature. Compelled to fulfillment in some form, however spurious, humanity invented supernatural beings in whom it then invested its wholly natural but historically elusive longings. The more man puts into God, the less he retains in himself, Marx asserted in the then unpublished but now renowned Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. Yet, if religion was the opium of the people, as he had written in an essay published earlier that year, it was also the soul of soulless conditions, an illusory happiness, the halo for a veil of tears. Marx admonished the enlightened radicals of his day that it was not enough simply to hector the oppressed about the opiate illusions of religion. They must mobilize the wretched to reclaim the means of humanity and thus eradicate their alienation. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. Again, religion would be overcome through political struggle and material development, not the secularist homilies of the intelligentsia. At the same time, Marx was reading voraciously in ethnographical literature on fetishism, the attribution of magical or supernatural powers to objects by archaic and ancient peoples. Fetishism is a religion of sensuous desire, he wrote in 1842, in which the worshipper fantasizes that an inanimate object will give up its natural character in order to comply with his desires. Marx plainly recognized the uncanny affinity of alienation and fetishism, and the two ideas wound up performing very similar labor in his writing. Marx first aligned them in the 1844 manuscripts, well before his discussion of commodity fetishism in the first volume of Capital. Tracing religious projection to the class relations of capitalism, Marx extended the concept of alienation to cover the process of capitalist production. With wage laborers divorced, both from the means of production and from their own products, capitalist alienation took a fetishistic turn, an ascription of life to objects produced by none other than the workers themselves. The life which the worker has given to the object sets itself against him as an alien and hostile force, he mused. If the product of labor does not belong to the worker, but confronts him as an alien power, 
This can only be because it belongs to a man other than the worker. The specter of this modern animism served to conceal the class rule of capital. By retaining control over the production process, capital also established a metaphysics of money that resembled and supplanted traditional forms of enchantment. For Marx, the power of money in bourgeois society animated a pecuniary way of being in the world. Money is yet another mark of estrangement. Like divinity, it represents the alienated ability of mankind, but after drowning traditional religious faith in the vat of pecuniary reason, money became the almighty being, the truly creative power, the de facto ontological basis of reality in capitalist civilization. As the realm of the commodity widens, Money not only purchases everything, like the god of Genesis, it also brings things into being from nothing and consigns all indigent things to oblivion. If I have the vocation for study, but no money for it, I have no vocation for study, that is, no effective, no true vocation. On the other hand, if I have really no vocation for study, but have the will and the money for it, I have an effective vocation for it. As the metaphysical common sense of market society, it defines and even bestows all manner of qualities. I am stupid, but money is the real mind of all things, and how then should its possessor be stupid? Money can even buy you love. I am ugly, but I can buy for myself the most beautiful of women. Therefore, I am not ugly, for the effect of ugliness, its deterrent power, is nullified by money. Money confers powers once believed to belong to shamans, priests, and gods. In the 1840s, Marx and Engels were confident that the secularizing momentum of capitalism would eventually dispel all modes of alienation and fetishism. As science and technology increased our power over nature, the need for supernatural narcotics would diminish, illusions would disappear, halos would fade, and the tearful veil would flower with the mortal splendor of material abundance. With the disenchantment wrought by the technological progress and revolutionary politics, alienation and fetishism would wane, hence the watery death of heavenly ecstasy proclaimed in the Communist Manifesto. But as Marx was gradually realizing, even as he wrote the Manifesto, the icy waters of capitalism do not drown the heavenly ecstasies. Rather, they pool to form a new baptismal font for alienation and religious projection. In the Grundrisse, unpublished notebooks from the 1850s, as well as in the first volume of Capital, the new prominence of fetishism indicated Marx's more vivid awareness that religion had assumed a new guise in the allegedly secular world of capitalism. His ruminations on the fetishism of commodities and the secret thereof, as well as on the enchantments of industrial technology and factory organization, demonstrate that the philosophical and religious concerns of his youth persisted into the more economic period. Yet they also suggest that Marx's talent as a diagnostician outstripped his perspicacity as a prophet of disenchantment. For Marx... The secret of the fetishism of commodities lay in their twofold character as use value and as exchange value. The use value of objects, he explained in Volume 1 of Capital, resides in their particular, qualitatively different, incommensurable uses shoes for feet, food for eating, shirts for adornment, etc. Their exchange value resides in their status as commodities, as objects produced for sale in the market 
for the purpose of capital accumulation. For these commodities to be exchanged for money, their incommensurable use values must be obscured or erased. They must somehow be rendered qualitatively identical to other commodities. This abstract equivalence of otherwise different objects is rendered in terms of the equally abstract equivalence of money. The God among commodities, as Marx dubbed it, in the Grundrisse. Objects thus become worth so much in money. Their value is defined in terms of money, not in terms of their utility for human purposes. In the market, this pecuniary alchemy induces the spell of fetishism, by which people attribute a kind of agency and independence to commodities, the products of their own labor. Later Marxists examined the culture industries of advertising, public relations, etc., which capture and cultivate the imaginative terrain opened up in the space between use value and exchange value. Pervaded and commanded by the God among commodities, objects are enchanted, enlivened by money, the metaphysical substratum of capitalist society. Thus, commodity fetishism is a specifically capitalist form of alienation, a modern recipe for the opium of the people. From the sardonic opening of the passage, the commodity, we learn, is a queer thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties, through the exposure of all the magic and necromancy that surrounds the products of labor, as long as they take the form of commodities— Marx maintained that commodity fetishism amounts to the sacramental system of capitalism. At one point, Marx compared the commodity fetish to the Eucharist. However secular their origins in property relations, commodity fetishism and the larger idolatry of the market are capitalist surrogates for enchantment. Fetishism also envelops modern industry, for which the secret thereof is also the enthralling alienation of human power. Machinery, under capitalism, has a twofold use value, the production of ever cheaper commodities for sale, but also, and in the end more important, the ever greater subordination of the worker to the will of the capitalist. As Marx noted in Capital, Technological innovation is propelled by capital's desire to reduce, to a minimum, the resistance offered by that repellent, yet elastic, natural barrier, man, made possible by the separation of producers from the means of production. The development of machinery, he observed in the Grundrisse, embodies the historical reshaping of the traditional inherited means of labor into a form adequate to capital. In both the Grundrisse and Kapital, Marx described the indelible inscription of capitalist authority into modern technology. First, capital destroys craft and artisan labor, in which the worker exercised both mental and manual acumen in production. After separating workers from direct access to productive property and mobilizing the latest science and technical prowess, capital dispossesses workers yet again, this time of their creative and intellectual skills, the very core of their human identity. The separation of the intellectual powers of production from the manual labor is followed by the conversion of those powers into the might of capital over labor. Together, science and industrial technology constitute the power of the master, in whose brain the machinery and his monopoly of it are inseparably united. This annexation of creative prowess by capital is the precondition for technological fetishism. Once skill has been materially relocated in industrial technology, it is the machine which possesses skill and strength in place of the worker, Marx wrote in the Grundrisse. The machine is itself the virtuoso, with a soul of its own in the mechanical laws acting through it. It towers over workers as 
a mighty organism. Later in Capital, Marx portrayed the industrial apparatus as a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories and whose demon power, at first veiled under the slow and measured motion of his giant limbs, at length breaks out into the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs. This was not mere melodramatic rhetoric, for it conveyed Marx's central condition about the nature of modern machinery and industry. That its demon power was, in the end, the stolen and disfigured productive potency of the workers themselves. Later Marxists would complement the master's insights into technology with attention to those who directly wield the demon power. The professional managerial class spawned in the division of mental from manual labor. Enveloped in the aura of science and expertise, managers and technicians conjured what Alfred Sonretl has called managerial fetishism, the belief that specialists possess recondite, almost esoteric knowledge obtainable only through years of formal education. But as with the phantasmagorical figures of religion and commodity fetishism, the source, both of technological enchantment and of managerial fetishism, lay in the expropriation from workers of their own inherent powers. For Marx, the industrial bourgeoisie is the class of magicians who oversee a mechanical sorcery. It is an enchanted, perverted, topsy-turvy world, this religion of everyday life, as Marx observed in the third volume of Capital. Yet, despite the allures of pecuniary enchantment, Marx and Engels believed that revolutionary theory and practice would disperse the charms of fetishism. With the sacramental glamour of capitalism exposed as the luster of their own alienated powers, workers would retrieve their own humanity, the natural source of what they now slavishly worshipped as divinity. Having recaptured mastery over the means of humanity, the communist society of the future would have no need for magical compensations. Yet, Marx and Engels themselves provided ample reason to doubt that what they called the prehistory of the species would end in a goethe demerung of enchantment. It was never clear that the reduction of the workers to industrial servitude would result in revolution, as money, that God among commodities, exercised a potent and increasingly untrammeled authority in capitalist society. If all traditional sources of moral and ontological truth were pulverized in the course of capitalist development, if indeed, as they proclaimed in the Manifesto, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, nothing, it would seem, could generate the spirit of resistance to the rage to accumulate. And as the metaphysical regime of capitalism... Monetary and commodity fetishism was at least as beguiling as any previous order of enchantment, especially as all its rivals were evaporating rapidly into quiescence or oblivion. If the moral imagination of the proletariat was so thoroughly permeated by pecuniary enchantment, and if the real subsumption of labor by capital was progressive and inexorable, why would the oppressed ever desire the transcendence of alienation and servility? With sufficient technical and political ingenuity, mass production, consumer culture, the welfare and regulatory policies of modern liberalism and social democracy, the sacramental sorcery of the system's fetishism could retard, assimilate, or even extinguish the growth of revolutionary consciousness. The fetishism of technology could prove equally impervious to disenchantment. There was, and remains, a real and intractable tension between the revolutionary objective of workers' control and the technocratic features of modern production. A dissonance reflected in the contrast between the romantic humanism of Marx's early writing 
and his later celebration of machinery and modern industry. Marx's youthful portrayal of the human essence as free, protean creativity echoed Friedrich Schiller's Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, 1799, where Schiller had elevated play as the mark of genuinely human activity. Vestiges of this vision persisted into the later, more economic work of both Marx and Engels. In Capital, Marx maintained that despite the industrial degradation of traditional skills, that process was, nonetheless, revolutionary. It both increased the amount of disposable time, which became the measure of wealth, and augmented the dexterity of the worker, giving birth to the fully developed individual, fit for a variety of labors, able and happy to give free scope to his own natural and acquired powers. Of course, these possibilities could only be realized in the world after capitalism, that is, in the world no longer bewitched by the fetishism of machinery. As Engels asserted in 1878, the old mode of production, the capitalist division of labor, must be revolutionized from top to bottom. Yet, according to Marxist theory, socialism and communism had to emerge from the crucible of capitalist enterprise, but if so the industrial edifice of production might well turn out to be resistant to revolutionizing, and hence to disenchantment. Abandoning his earlier hope that the realms of work and play could intermingle, Marx held in the Grundrisse that labor cannot become play. Work and free time were now conceived as strictly demarcated spheres of human life. The atrophy of this ideal stemmed in part from Marx's contention that machinery's use-value for producing goods would remain after the revolutionary supersession of capital, a use-value that he himself demonstrated lay in the systematic subordination of workers. Here, Marx regressed into liberal, technocratic bromides about the neutrality of technology. But if indeed, as Marx himself had asserted, capitalists reshaped labor and machinery in a form adequate to capital, then socialists would inherit a technological and organizational apparatus designed expressly for the purposes of exploitation and techno-managerial command. Pecuniary reason and enchantment had bred a gargantuan machinery of subservience, and neither Marx nor Engels explained how a technics so thoroughly imbued with the sensibility of domination could be made democratic. While industrial despotism was precisely what was supposed to be revolutionized from top to bottom, Engels employed the language of despotism itself to describe the process of revolution. As he insisted quite sternly in his 1872 essay, On Authority, a volley in his ongoing battle with anarchists, machinery is much more despotic than the small capitalists who employ workers have ever been. Because of the intricacy and precision of its mechanical elements and the vast interdependence it created, modern machinery... Engels admonished the anarchists, both exercised a veritable despotism independent of all social organization and underscored the necessity of authority, and of imperious authority at that, even after the revolution. Engels' authoritarian rhetoric was prima facie evidence that the revolution envisioned was not nearly profound enough as the despotism entailed by modern industry signaled the persistence of alienation, the precondition for fetishism. As Simon Weil later observed, if Marx fetishizes anything, it is surely matter, more precisely, history, the realm of labor and productivity. The open book of man's essential powers, as he wrote in 1844, Despite Marx's assertion that in the future wealth would be measured in terms of leisure, 
His portrayal of communism more often suggests a paradise of overachievers. His avowed mythological hero was, after all, Prometheus, and the ideal of perpetual achievement and innovation pervades his collected works. The work ethic of communism, as Marx described it, could seem more exacting than anything envisioned in the antiquated morality of Puritanism. As he declared in The Critique of the Gotha Program, 1875, in communist society, labor will become not only a means of life, but life's prime want. Although later sympathetic expositors, such as Herbert Marcuse and Marshall Berman, would contend that Marx's Prometheanism was balanced by an Orphic appreciation of ease and sensuality, the balance was never even or permanent. As Berman himself concedes, in the dynamic, expansive, ever-revolutionary conditions of modernity that Marx affirmed, such a friendship between Prometheus and Orpheus would require an immense amount of Promethean activity and striving. Marx's commitment to endless economic growth and technological expansion is nowhere more evident than in the third volume of Capital, where he offered a sketch of the realm of freedom in the stateless communist future. As work and play remain separated, the realm of freedom begins, Marx asserted, where that labor ceases, which is determined by necessity and mundane considerations. Yet, the realm of necessity seems never to recede, as the desires of post-capitalist humanity seem never to abate. With their rich and proliferating wants, communist men and women thereby enlarge the realm of necessity. With the colossal development of technology, the forces of production which satisfy these wants also increase. Thus, exponential generation and satisfaction of wants not only fosters, but also enforces the need to incessantly strive, perform, and accomplish. Communism would seem to erase the distinction between freedom and necessity, but in a manner that alarmingly mimics the capitalist rage to accumulate. Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer were right when they later surmised that Marx wanted to turn the world into a factory, and that his vision of communism resembled a gigantic joint-stock company for the exploitation of nature. Aside from the extensive ecological damage inflicted by this Promethean tempest, the fetish of productivity would appear to intensify the exploitation of workers, indeed, by none other than themselves. Under Marx's auspices, Prometheus morphed into a technically proficient and always preoccupied Sisyphus, ever in search of new mountains and boulders to exhibit his accumulating powers. This is the real danger of Marx's communism, not authoritarianism or lazy, flaccid repose, but the freely chosen and restless enslavement to work, productivity, and achievement. Storming the gates of heaven to prove their own divinity, the modern devotees of Prometheus would work themselves, and the earth, to death. Part 2 A Hundred Dollars, A Hundred Devils Mammon in America 1492-1870 More sensitive than most Americans to the brutal delusions of his country's messianism, Herman Melville discerned the sublimity and sham bound together in the national eschatology. In White Jacket, 1850, for instance, the eponymous narrator delivers an exhilarating oration on the destiny of America, expressing the vainglorious bravado of the Puritan errand and manifest destiny. We Americans are the peculiar, chosen people, the Israel of our time, he declares, predestinated for greatness. Unlike the Parisians, Romans, or other imperial peoples who conquered only to subdue and exploit, 
with ourselves, he proclaims, almost for the first time in history, national selfishness is unbounded philanthropy. When the new Israel steals land or takes commercial advantage, we give alms to the world. Elsewhere, Melville captured the beatific vision at the core of business eschatology. Describing the Liverpool docks in Redburn, 1849, Melville portrayed them as an epitome of the world, a global communion created through trade. In a grand parliament of masts, things and people commingle in fraternity. Canada and New Zealand send their pines, America her live oak, India her teak, Norway her spruce, and the Right Honourable Mahogany, member for Honduras and Campeche, is seen at his post by the wheel. Here, under the beneficent sway of the genius of commerce, all climes and countries embrace, and yardarm touches yardarm in brotherly love. Yet, Melville also discerned more insidious possibilities. The typical American he observed in Israel Potter, 1855, was intrepid, unprincipled, reckless, predatory, with boundless ambition, civilized in externals, but a savage at heart. Explaining the metaphysics of Indian hating, in The Confidence Man, 1857, Melville maintained that the dreams of expansion were fantasies of power lust. However crude and violent, the backwoodsman of the episode is a captain in the vanguard of conquering civilization, a figure akin to Moses in the Exodus, or the Emperor Julian in Gaul. The same will to power remained in force in the more polite market society that followed in his wake. Well versed in self-delusion, the confidence man would have known what to make of white jacket or of the long, misenchanted lineage of believers in American anointment and exceptionalism. The barely repressed madness that Melville detected in America's soul was also the spirit of malevolence at work in the expanding capitalist market. In The Paradise of Bachelors and the Tartarus of Maids, 1855, young girls work in a paper mill at the bottom of a hollow named Devil's Dungeon. In Greek mythology, Tartarus was the lowest region of the underworld. Imprisoned in the industrial division of labor, the maids are servants of capitalist technology, sacrifices to the cults of pecuniary enchantment and technological fetishism. Machinery, that vaunted slave of humanity, stood menially served by human beings who served mutely and cringingly as the slave serves the sultan. With their agony dimly outlined on the imperfect paper, like the print of the tormented face on the handkerchief of St. Veronica. The women stamp on their products the sacramental mark of their outraged human divinity. Later, in The Confidence Man, the shape-shifting cosmopolitan relies on misplaced confidence, that is, on manipulated faith. The riverboat on which the narrative unfolds is called the Fidel. The currency at the core of confidence becomes a sacramental token of evil. As a crotchety miser mutters at one point, and who better to know the enchantments of money, A hundred dollars? A hundred devils! Melville's sketch of a diabolical factory marked a denouement of the attempt to build a beloved community on the foundation of capitalism and in his ambivalence about the promise of America, he captured the treachery of capitalist enchantment. A little over two centuries earlier, the Puritans had embarked on an errand into the wilderness that became an errand into the marketplace. Bearing the gospel of improvement from England, the saints of New England believed that love could be anchored in acquisitive property relations. Resting on the corpses of massacred natives and funded with the credit from heaven, their city on a hill was the pious citadel of a covenant theology of capitalism. Yet, 
As the wages of piety mounted throughout the seventeenth century, the community wandered far from the errand and softly descended from the heights of the city. Although ministers censured this declension in the Jeremiad, a recollection of the errand and acknowledgment of failure and a call to rededication, they eloquently concealed the contradiction and futility inherent in the Puritan way. The tensions in the Puritan errand remained repressed and unresolved in subsequent forms of capitalist enchantment in America. Between the Revolution and the Civil War, evangelicals and Mormons rewrote the terms of the covenant theology of business, seeking to create a democracy of brethren while competing in the marketplace they pioneered some of the fundamental features of modern American economic mythology. The alignment of pecuniary reason with the amazing grace of Christian divinity and the self-made entrepreneur in cahoots with the mercenary arc of the universe. With Americans in league with the unrighteous mammon, the Puritan gospel of improvement morphed into the sublimity of technological progress and the Puritan errand became the manifest destiny of pious white proprietors. Like its counterpart in Europe, American Romanticism developed, in part, as a reaction to capitalist modernity. But its most penetrating sacramental witnesses were neither poets nor intellectuals. While members of Brook Farm and other utopian communities sought to savor some aromatic root of wisdom. Walt Whitman and Ralph Waldo Emerson affirmed the justice, fraternity, and ontological veracity of proprietary capitalism. Whitman's democratic vistas embraced the popular stampede for riches, while Emerson's sole economy was measured in money as beautiful as roses. Compounded of Christianity and African enchantment, the religion of the slaves contained a more ominous version of romantic prophecy. Epitomized in the confessions of Nat Turner, the slaves' faith in a sacramental universe afforded the clearest and most damning vision of American friendship with unrighteous mammon. Chapter 3 the Poetry of the Past Romantic Anti-Capitalism and the Sacramental Imagination Marx and Engels subjected other socialists to contemptuous dissection in the Manifesto, reserving the keenest vituperation for their feudal, Christian, and petty bourgeois rivals. Engaging in half-lamentation, half-lampoon, half-echo of the past, half-menace of the future, these socialists, they insisted, were hopelessly reactionary, clueless, or befuddled about the nature of industrial society. To be sure, reactionary socialists shed light on the hypocrisies of classical economists, called attention to the ruinous effects of the industrial division of labor, and excoriated the concentration of wealth and the wanton destruction of nature. But because they valorized peasants and artisans and hearkened back to priestly and aristocratic oppression, these socialists stood in the way of a real resolution of the social question. In a miserable fit of the blues, they sang haunting requiems for an epic that would never return. Christian socialists were especially hapless lackeys carrying the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart-burnings of the aristocrat. Four years later, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis-Napoleon, 1852, Marx underlined once again the delusion and futility of nostalgia. In times of revolutionary crisis, people may anxiously conjure up into their service the spirits of the past— borrowing costumes and language from history as they enacted something new. But in the end, modern revolution could not draw its poetry from the past. It can only draw it from the future. Whatever virtues and beauties the past may have possessed, they must not impede the forward march of progress. Revolutionaries must, 
Let the dead bury their dead. The poetry of the past composed a radical alternative to Marx and Engels, especially in the form of Romanticism. Usually considered a literary and artistic movement, Romanticism also produced a potent brand of opposition to the mercenary and instrumentalist values of industrial capitalism. But where Marx resolutely affirmed the spirit of capitalist modernity, iconoclasm, disenchantment, technological mastery, Romantics turned to pre-capitalist values and cultures for inspiration. Looking to the past for their sources of moral and political imagination, classical antiquity, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, peasant and artisanal communities, romantic anti-capitalists sought, if not to literally resurrect and reinstate the past, than to revive in some modern form the values they cherished from pre-modern societies. From Blake's declamation against dark satanic mills to contemporary ecological activism, Romanticism has been an enduring current of witness against capitalist modernity. Pervading an extraordinarily wide range of aesthetic, political, and religious movements, Romanticism, in the words of Robert Sayer and Mikhail Lovi, far from being a purely 19th century phenomenon, is an essential component of modern culture. The invocation of pre modern and pre capitalist values has raised the recurrent and not unjustified fear that romantic anti capitalism leads inexorably to irrationalism, reaction, and even fascism. Yet, Many Romantic anti-capitalists affirmed both the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. Whether sympathetic to Jacobinism, Blake, Percy Shelley, Heinrich Heine, Utopian and Libertarian Radicalism, Charles Fourier, Moses Hess, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Peter Kropotkin, or Socialism, William Morris, Ernst Bloch, Herbert Marcuse, the Romantic left has embraced the scientific, cosmopolitan, and democratic legacy of the Enlightenment while also criticizing its limitations. They experienced a sense of exile and homelessness from some true home in the pre-capitalist past, identified that moment when humane values flourished as a template for utopia and worked to reconstruct that lost paradise in some new form in the future. But where the Romantic right rejected the heritage of scientific reason and political democracy, the Romantic left considered what they called imagination as an extension and enrichment of the Enlightenment, sensing no fundamental contradictions among reason, democracy, and a re-enchantment of the world. The most incisive Romantic anti-capitalists did not seek to resurrect or retreat into the past, rather, they looked to the past for a critical perspective on the present that was more penetrating and promising than the future held out by the disenchanted heirs of the Enlightenment. Yet, if Romantics were champions of spirit, nature, and memory, some scholars have suggested that, like their Enlightenment counterparts, they cleared a path to secular modernity, hastening in M. H. Abrams' view, the secularization of inherited theological ideas and ways of thinking. While drawing on myth and legend, Romantics offered a historical hospice for dying religious beliefs, preparing them for a secular afterlife. The process of secularization, Abrams explains, has not been the deletion and replacement of religious ideas, but rather the assimilation and reinterpretation of religious ideas. As Abrams demonstrates, Romantics recast the Christian mythos of creation, fall, history, and redemption. Born into a primal unity of self and world, humanity, Romantics believed, was now riven by self-consciousness and alienation. By unlocking its powers of imagination, humanity could overcome the baneful effects of that fall and restore the old unity on a higher plane. In Abrams's words, Romantic eschatology envisioned a rebirth in which a renewed mankind will inhabit a renovated earth where he will find himself thoroughly at home. 
Yet, what Abrams dubs their natural supernaturalism was nothing more than the last refuge of enchantment. If, as Bernard Reardon has argued, Romanticism named the inexpungible feeling that the finite is not self-explanatory and self-justifying, that there is always an infinite beyond, then natural supernaturalism was the heir to Christian's sacramental imagination. The visionary or rhapsodic quality of Romanticism was a sacramental consciousness, a capacity to see or sense divinity in the minutia of finitude. In a poetic, rather than a theological idiom, romantic metaphysics often envisioned some reality that both transcended and pervaded the sensible world, some abiding mystery that left its alluring traces in the world of appearance. Some of the signature passages of Romantic poetry are modern sacramental epiphanies. In his Auguries of Innocence, William Blake beckoned us to see a world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Later, in Tintern Abbey, William Wordsworth recorded, a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of thought, and rolls through all things. The sacramental rapture of those passages might serve to reinforce the caricature of romantic hostility to reason. Yet, romantic writers of all kinds made clear that their nemesis was not reason, but rather reason torn from the fabric of nature and humanity, a rupture that made a demon and idol of reason, a despoiled wreck of nature, and a beguiled slave of humanity. The single vision that terrified Blake was more than the abstract formulas of physics and mathematics. Single vision meant the occlusion or deception of sacramental sight, the optics of mastery and exploitation, the inability to see the world as anything more than material resources for misenchanted exploitation. Though divorced from orthodox theology, Romantic humanism echoed the traditional harmony of reason, love, and reality. When Romantics praised enthusiasm, reverence, and imagination, they restated the venerable Christian wisdom that reason is rooted in love, that full and genuine understanding precludes a desire to possess and control. Against the imperious claims of Eurizen, Blake's fallen Prince of Light, your reason degenerates into measurement and calculation. Blake countered that enthusiastic admiration is the first principle of knowledge and its last. To know a thing, what we can call knowing. Thomas Carlyle surmised in Heroes and Hero Worship, 1841, we must first love the thing, sympathize with it, Arising from a sacramental sense of the world as a region of the wonderful, Carlyle's incessant admonitions to reverence and wonder were, at bottom, exhortations to love. Imagination was the name romantics gave to this erotic and sacramental consciousness. Yet, imagination was not only a subjective enchantment, a lineal descendant of the other Protestant ethic. In the romantic sensibility, Imagination was not a talent for inspiring fantasy, but the most perspicuous form of vision, the ability to see what is really there, behind the illusion, or obscurity produced by our will to dissect and dominate. For Blake, imagination provided access to the real and eternal world, of which this vegetable universe is but a faint shadow. If, to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, reason is the power of universal and necessary convictions, 
the source and substance of truths above sense, imagination was its vibrant, sacramental partner, the living power and prime agent of all human perception, a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation, in the infinite, I am. For romantics, imagination did not annul, but rather completed rationality. During the French Revolution, Wordsworth observed, reason seemed, most intent on making of herself a prime enchantress. Though warning of the brutality of instrumental reason, our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things, we murder to dissect. Wordsworth described imagination as reason in her most exalted mood. Imagination is the ecstasy of reason. In forging a sacramental imagination for modernity, romantics posed a religious opposition to pecuniary capitalist reason. The spirit of Langland, Joachim, Milton, and Winstanley resurfaced in romantic anti-capitalism, aiming to root out the spirit of evil in things heavenly, Blake traced the origins of desecration to the human capacity for idolatry. Man must and will have some religion, Blake warned. If he has not the religion of Jesus, meaning not the official Christianity of the churches, but the undogmatic, everlasting gospel of love and creative exuberance, he will have the religion of Satan. In one of his earliest poems, Mammon, Blake recounted how one morning, while praying for riches, he realized that he had prostrated himself before the demon deity of money. I took it to be the throne of God. Blake identified Mammon as the sponsor and architect of industrial capitalism, the proprietor of those dark satanic mills that augured death and eternal damnation. Urizen is his factory manager the great workmaster. Bankrolled and designed by the zealots of Mammon, the expanding apparatus of industrial might was a Babylon builded on the waste, founded in human desolation. Here was Yuri's vast automaton and Marx's mechanical monster, unveiled as a temple of Mammon. Other English romantics agreed that pecuniary enchantment sent humanity to its knees. Robert Southey bewailed the undisputed and acknowledged supremacy of the spirit of mammon in England. Commercial nations, if they acknowledged the deity whom they serve, might call him all gold, Southey wrote, warning that mammon is a more merciless fiend than Moloch. Wordsworth recoiled from the commercial frenzy of London, lamenting that rapine, avarice, expense— these are idolatry, and these we adore. Money. Money is here the god of universal worship, he complained to his sister Dorothy. To the middle classes, rapacity and extortion, he continued, were glory and exultation. Coleridge had rued that Britain had become a monstrous mammon-bloated Dives, a wooden idol of stuffed pursemen. Dismissing the maxims of evangelical economists as solemn humbug, Coleridge surmised that what was true, of the little that is true in their dogmatic books, was the moral and religious wisdom of any good man. Sadly, without a chariot of fire, the visionary intensities of a Blake were unavailing against the sanctimonious humbug of capital. Though evocative of a deeper and more extravagant order of generosity and beatitude, romantic verse could never counter the misenchantment of classical economies. Indeed, many romantics ended their days on the political right, having made their peace, not only with throne and altar, but with rapine, avarice, and expense. Though he fondly recalled his blissful youth as a supporter of the French Revolution— Wordsworth died a genial conservative. Coleridge epitomized the Tory paternalist, pontificating on the reciprocal duties of the classes and on deference to the Anglican clerisy. The answer to the social question was benevolence, not revolution. For many of those romantics whom Raymond Williams inducted 
into the culture and society tradition, social critics who pitted the ideals of culture against the depredations of industrial society, art and literature eventually offered not only a promise, but a refuge. Even Tory radicals such as Carlyle and John Ruskin have been indicted as reactionaries. For all their eloquent invective against industrial capitalism, they nonetheless championed monarchy and feudalism in the age of rising liberal democracies, and they supported paternalist measures to dampen the militancy of the urban proletariat. They opposed chartism, derided popular politics, and regarded servitude and British imperialism as necessary forms of moral instruction. Carlyle's characterization of economics as the dismissal science came in the midst of a defense of Jamaican slavery. As Terry Eagleton has contended, echoing many other left and liberal writers, Carlyle and Ruskin provided Victorian capitalism with an ideological stimulus and moral edification its factories could never manufacture. How then do we explain their indelible impact on an array of writers, many of whose credentials on the democratic left are otherwise impeccable? The roster is long and illustrious. William Morris, Oscar Wilde, Leo Tolstoy, R. H. Tawney, G. D. H. Cole, Lewis Mumford, Raymond Williams, Norman O. Brown, Martin Luther King, Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, E. F. Shoemaker, and Christopher Lash, to name a few. Carlyle was even cited favorably by Marx and Engels. What appears to have elicited respect and even reverence for these reactionaries from partisans of the left was their sense of the moral unity of the world, as Tawney wrote of Ruskin, their conviction that without some common end toward which art, politics, and economics tended, all human activities become meaningless and in time degenerate. This moral unity was endangered by the Victorian crisis of faith that afflicted Carlyle, Ruskin, and their contemporaries. The onslaught of discoveries in biology, geology, history, and biblical scholarship appeared to inflict irreparable damage on Christianity. As many educated Victorians heard, along with Matthew Arnold, the melancholy, long-withdrawing roar of Christian faith, they realized that some other foundation for traditional morality would be necessary, or that traditional morality itself would need to be modified or supplanted. Out of this maelstrom emerged a secular, if not always secularized, intelligentsia alongside the Christian clergy. Public moralists, to use Stefan Collini's term, commentators on cultural and political issues who derived their moral authority not from ecclesial position, but from their own learning, talent, and persuasive force. Many among this new class of public intellectuals, Charles Bradlaugh, Herbert Spencer, Thomas Huxley, abandoned religion in favor of hard-boiled, scientific secularism, while others, Arnold, George Eliot, Samuel Butler, affirmed some tragic form of humanism. Keenly aware that the intellectual stock of Christianity was crashing, other Victorians sought either to revitalize traditional faith or to create a new cultural form for religion. Defectors from evangelicalism such as John Henry Newman and the Oxford movement of the 1830s and 1840s embraced Roman Catholicism. In the 1850s, F. D. Maurice and other Anglicans traveled in a decidedly more liberal Protestant direction. Carlyle and Ruskin embodied another alternative, a public moralism that doubled as religious prophecy, enchantment expressed in a modern idiom. Both men were unconverted, as Ruskin put it, from the precepts of evangelicalism. Yet, both men desired to see divinity triumph against the world of industry and the cash nexus. Like Professor Teufelsdruck, the philosopher-prophet of Carlyle's Sartore Sartus, 1836, they longed to embody the spirit of the gospel in a new mythos, 
in a new vehicle and vesture that our souls may live. The sense of moral unity in romantic social criticism arose from a sacramental imagination. Carlyle considered his work a form of modern prophecy. For us in these days, prophecy, well understood, not poetry, is the thing wanted. He told his brother, How can we sing and paint when we do not yet believe and see? In his heterodox heart, Carlyle conceded the increasing implausibility of traditional Christianity. The mythos of the Christian religion, he wrote in Sartor Re Sartus, the tailor restored, did not inspire conviction in the nineteenth century as it did in the eighth. If the tailor being retailored was Christianity, Carlyle's volumes were modern prophecies of an everlasting gospel. Almost alone among students of Carlyle, Lash placed his curmudgeonly oeuvre in the lineage of Christian prophecy. Yet, even Lash overlooked the sacramental idiom of Carlyle's finest social criticism. Emphasizing Carlyle's affirmation of wonder for its acknowledgment of our dependence on higher powers, Lash missed its sacramental imagination, the perception of everyday material grace. Prophecy for Carlyle was more than a reminder of humanity's reliance on God. It announced the company of divinity in the mundane and the particular, fusing holiness and utility. The earth, for Teufelsdruck, is both a tabernacle and a workplace. The truly blessed human being is one to whom the universe is an oracle and a temple, as well as a kitchen and cattle stall. Thy daily life is girt with wonder, and based on wonder, and thy very blankets and breeches are miracles. Wonder was Carlyle's new Christian mythology, a modern sacramental theology. Carlyle condemned capitalism as a violation of wonder, easily taken for evocative metaphors or mere theological relics. His numerous references to mammon should be taken with full religious seriousness. Testifying against the mammon god in Sartor Re Sartus, Teufelsdruck objected to the quality of tailoring in the deity's commercial culture, vanity's workhouse and rag fair. In the French Revolution, 1837, Carlyle dubbed mammon the basest of known gods, even of known devils. But the most powerful indictment of mammon came in past and present, Carlyle's angriest polemic on the condition of England. Converted to the Gospel of Mammonism, England, Carlyle charged, had exchanged the beneficence of medieval Christianity for a mammon feudalism, a brutish empire of mammon. Both downtrodden workers and their heartless masters were spellbound by horrid enchantment. Enchantment, in Carlyle, is the counterfeit of wonder, and the gospel of mammonism is a fraudulent religion, a decoy for the true mythology. The people of England worshipped the frightfulest enchantment, too truly a work of the evil one. The most numerous and devout of mammon's disciples resided among the Victorian bourgeoisie. Disdainful of the bromides dispensed, as gospel in Victorian Christianity, Carlyle surmised, in Signs of the Times, that middle-class religion was little more than a wise prudential feeling grounded in mere calculation. More staid and mendacious than earlier forms of enchantment, mammonism linked the fury of greed to the algebra of pecuniary reason. Believing that some smaller quantum of earthly enjoyment may be exchanged for a far larger quantum of celestial enjoyment, the good Victorian tended his soul like a commodity future. Religion, too, is profit, a working for wages. The cash nexus Carlyle excoriated now set its standard in the very heart of the wonderful. If enchantment to Carlyle was a perversion of wonder, only a rebirth of genuine wonder could pose a real threat to mammonism. Carlyle's more unsettling and dangerous ideas make sense only in the context of his search for wonder, 
his quest to recover sacramental vision in the midst of a pecuniary age. His oft-maligned insistence on the need for heroes and hero worship was inseparable from wonder. For Carlyle, the true hero is defined less by an achievement than by a kind of receptivity, a fortuitous, blessed, heaven-sent vocation to discern the inner heart of things. Like that of the prophet, or of the saint, to whom the hero bears a striking affinity, the hero's calling is first to see, and only then to act accordingly. A romantic seer on the stage of history, the hero is a prodigy of imagination. Understood as a capacity for sacramental sight, heroism figures throughout Carlyle's work. Aghast at mechanical and commercial society, Teufelsdruck experiences an epiphany that reveals a world pervaded by divinity. The universe is not dead and demoniacal, a charnel house with spectres, but godlike, he realizes. Rejecting the utilitarian reason that compels predation on other men and women, the professor perceives and embraces humanity as his alienated brethren. With other eyes, too, could I now look upon my fellow man with an infinite love, I now first named him Brother. Rooted in his avowal of faith in the presence and unbounded love of God, Teufelsdruck's heroic everlasting yea is a testimony against the mammon God. Later, in Past and Present, Carlyle posed against the gospel of mammonism what amounts to a gospel of heroism, a joyous affirmation of sacramental presence, Despite its claims about the scarcity of nature and the rapaciousness of human beings, Mammon's gospel violates the laws of creation. Endless accumulation cannot persist, for the universe is not made so. Those who enter into battle with Mammon must be heroes, possessed by wonder and love, abounding in the faith in an invisible, unnameable, godlike present everywhere in all that we see and work, and suffer. As a vehicle of that godlike presence, the hero of past and present is Abbot Samson, who rescued the monastery of St. Edmund's from moral and physical decay. Ruling the abbey with a firm but compassionate hand, the abbot exemplifies the vocational paradox of heroism. The true leader must think and act as a servant, subordinating any will to power to the good of the community. He that cannot be servant of many will never be master, true guide, and deliverer of many. That is the meaning of true mastership. Still, heroism accounts for why Carlyle should not be enlisted in a populist tradition of anti-capitalism. While he successfully defends Carlyle against charges of proto-fascism, Lash ignores the authoritarian conclusion that Carlyle himself drew from his theology of wonder. That capacity for wonder confers political supremacy as well as lucid spiritual insight. The great man was always a lightning out of heaven. The rest of men waited for him like fuel, and then they too would flame. Abbot Samson is a stern paternalist, and in Heroes and Hero Worship— Carlyle idealized decisive and autocratic leaders, epitomized by Samson, Cromwell, and Napoleon. After the Chartist movement that he opposed subsided, Carlyle grew increasingly hostile to popular politics, ridiculing democracy in the name of heroism. By the time he published Shooting Niagara, Carlyle had become a surly, elitist windbag, maligning mobocracy and harumphing at the rabble's amenability to beer and balderdash. Carlyle could never fathom the possibility that all the Lord's people could be prophets and heroes. Convinced that the talent for wonder was scarce as well as gratuitous, Carlyle succumbed to the more insidious implications contained in hero worship. His even more unsavory positions are united by the conviction that the masses— incapable of wonder, required harsh and repressive education. 
his infamous defense of slavery in his Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question, 1849, turned on the moral pedagogy of servitude, a notion that bore a grim resemblance to the theodicy of evangelical economists. Now vilified for his ugly and unashamed racism, Carlyle believed that white Englishmen, too, could use instruction in the arts of reverence. Indeed, Carlyle was closer to the evangelical worldview than his champions and detractors have imagined, for the moral economy of his everlasting yea turned out to be the Protestant ethic. Love, not pleasure. Love God. Teufelsdruck admonishes in Sartor Re Sartus. Produce! Produce! Were it but the pitifulest infinitesimal fraction of a product, produce it in God's name! This was homiletic bluster worthy of the Puritans and Evangelicals, and the assertion that the fraction of a product was worth producing suggested that Carlyle objected less to the industrial division of labor than to the reckless pursuit of profit. Yet, the subdivision of labor was inseparable from the employment of industrial technology, the alarm at which Carlyle had been among the first to sound. The same man who coined the term industrialism, who railed against the philosophy of mechanism, and who had dubbed his era the age of machinery, could also preach to the working class that alienated labor was a form of heroism. The social and technological features of industrialism grew out of the very mammonism that Carlyle reviled. The era was an age of machinery because it was an age of capital. Unlike Marx, or later Ruskin, Carlyle failed to link the hegemony of mechanism to the imperatives of capital accumulation. By the same token, it was never clear whether Carlyle saw mechanism or mammonism as the primary demon of the time. In other words, whether the spirit of the age was disenchantment or the frightfulest enchantment of avarice. By retailoring the Protestant ethic as a gospel of work for all classes, Carlyle defaulted on a politics of wonder. Instead, he became an unlikely ideological tailor for the Victorian bourgeoisie, fashioning the ideal of wonder to suit a nobility of industrial management. Though contemptuous of the greedy and philistine millocracy in past and present, Carlyle rejected class politics believing that exhortations to morality and wonder could convert the hearts of industrialists. Though as yet, only half alive, spellbound amid money-bags and ledgers, the enchanted industrial elite could evolve, Carlyle hoped, into an industrial aristocracy, imagining valorous captains of industry moved by a godlike starring Carlyle wagered that wonder could awaken a new kind of chivalry among the bourgeoisie. Carlyle's praise for his imaginary heroes of industry was effusive to the point of hyperbole. The captains of industry were the true fighters, fighters against chaos, necessity, and the devils. They lead on mankind in that great and alone true and universal warfare, all heaven and all earth saying audibly, Well done! Far from demanding the overthrow of the enchanted empire of Mammon, Carlyle aimed at the moral transfiguration of its ruling class, calling for a paternalist capitalism overseen by a directorate of chivalrous heroes. Carlyle sought to humanize, not to abolish the diabolical cash nexus of mammonism. We must have industrial barons of a quite new, suitable sort, he once wrote to a liberal member of Parliament, blue bloods of capital ruling kindly over workers loyally related to their taskmasters, related in God, not related in mammon alone. Beholden to the gospel of work, Carlyle's captains of industry would constitute an executive committee of wonder. Ruskin would seem no more promising a critic, as his record of reaction, like Carlyle's, is indisputable. He extolled the virtues of monarchy, trumpeted the white-skinned splendor and benevolence of British imperialism, 
deplored the efficiency and productive power of industrial technology, and proposed paternalist compassion as an antidote to working-class political struggle. As if all that weren't enough, even Ruskin's revered writing on art has been cited as evidence of his ideological complicity in colonialism. Once a hero to many on the British and American left, Ruskin now appears much less valiant a relic as beautiful and reminiscent of oppression as the Gothic architecture he loved. Ruskin's sins are well known, but there is exculpatory and mitigating evidence that argues for clemency and even redemption. He revered the Middle Ages and Gothic architecture, the nature of Gothic, in The Stones of Venice, 1853, is a model of panegyric, Yet he also maintained that no return to the medieval was either possible or desirable. I am not one who in the least doubts or disputes the progress of this century in many things useful to mankind. He asserted in the two paths, 1859, we don't want either the life or the decorations of the thirteenth century back again. He insisted on the necessity and inevitability of hierarchies, and apologized for the rankest forms of servility. No position is so good for men and women, none so likely to bring out their best human character, he told British workers and laborers in 1873, as that of a dependent or menial. Yet he despised the English nobility and gentry as the scurviest louts that ever fouled God's earth with their carcasses, and lavished the most venomous contempt on the godly affectations of the evangelical bourgeoisie. You sit smiling at your serene hearths, as he portrayed them in The Work of Iron, 1859, listing comfortable prayers, evening and morning, and counting your petty Protestant beads, which are flat and of gold, instead of round and of ebony, as the monks once were. There was also more to Ruskin's relationship to the working class than condescension and paternalism. Long before radical historians called for a history from the bottom up, he asserted that the lives we need to have written for us are of the people whom the world has not thought of, far less heard of, who are yet doing most of the work. He offered courses on art and art history in the London Working Men's College, established by Tories in 1854 to provide a liberal education to shop decorators and upholsterers and masons and brickmasters and glassblowers and pottery people. Although he considered the prospect of socialism to be simply chaos, he could sound like a revolutionary orator summoning the subaltern to the barricades. Whose is the wealth of the world but yours? Where is the virtue? he asked in For Sclavigera, a series of open letters to workers published in the 1870s. Though he referred to himself in his autobiography as a violent Tory of the old school, in For Sclavigera he had called himself a communist of the old school, indeed a dark red communist, reddest of the red. Tories like himself had to champion the cause of the working class, he explained, because the clergy were lackeys of the wealthy. Have they so betrayed their master's charge and mind in their preaching to the rich? He asked in another letter, so smoothed their words and so sold their authority that there is no man in England who will have mercy on the poor. Ruskin's fidelity to the master's charge and mind is the key to his social criticism. The recent revival of interest in Ruskin as a scourge of capitalism tends to neglect or pass over his religious beliefs. Yet, anyone eager to enlist Ruskin in contemporary cultural and political struggles must inevitably come to terms with the religious roots of his moral imagination. Even Tawney's praise for the moral unity of Ruskin's artistic and social criticism missed this essential element. Of all his sympathetic expositors, only Williams, hardly a believer in the supernatural, clearly recognized that the deeper unity of Ruskin's vision was religious, not moral. 
both sides of Ruskin's work are comprised in an allegiance to the same single term. Beauty, and the idea of beauty, rests fundamentally on a belief in a universal, divinely appointed order. After unconverting from evangelicalism, Ruskin retained a romantic religious faith that harbored a sacramental imagination. From his earliest art criticism in the 1840s to his later speculations on climate, he wrote of natural beauty as an enchanted emblem of divinity. At their best, he argued in the first volume of Modern Painters, 1843, artists such as J. M. W. Turner conveyed that faultless, ceaseless, inconceivable, inexhaustible loveliness which God has stamped upon all things. They received the word of God from clouds and leaves and waves. Beauty, he wrote in the second volume, 1846, is that external quality of bodies which, whether occur in a stone, flower, beast, or in man, may be shown to be in some sort typical of the divine attributes. In animals, the appearance of these godlike qualities indicated the felicitous fulfillment of function in living things. In the human animal especially, beauty consisted of the joyful and right exertion of perfect life in man. In the midst of the material nearness of these heavens, Ruskin asserted in the fourth volume, 1856, God desires that we acknowledge His own immediate presence as visiting, judging, and blessing us. To Ruskin, nature was not inanimate, but rather soulful, even ethical, a vessel and barometer of moral and ontological vitality. In the work of iron, he invited his audience to read the curious lesson in any pebble at their feet. You look upon it as if it were earth only. But the pebble possessed a kind of soul, and if it could speak, it would inform us that I am not earth. I am earth and air in one. Part of that blue heaven which you love and long for is already in me. Over the next three decades, as the factories spread and polluted the air and streams with industrial waste, Ruskin deciphered the signs of sacrilege. In The Storm Cloud of the Nineteenth Century, 1884, his strange and ominous forecast of impending moral and ecological doom, Ruskin traced the violation of the visible heaven of clouds, air, rain, and ice, reasoning that our sins infected the natural world, composed as it was of matter and spirit, blanched sun, blighted grass, blinded man. The desecration extended everywhere. Blasphemy, Ruskin pronounced it, that ruined all the good works and purposes of nature. The clouds were full of bitterness and malice, the poisonous smoke bellowing from factories consisted in part of dead men's souls. The climate bore traces of iniquity. The restoration of nature's health depended not on the application of remedial technologies, but on the cultivation of hope, reverence, and love. This sacramental ontology was the foundation of Ruskin's equally sacramental humanism. As he wrote in Volume 2 of Modern Painters, the function of a human being is the full comprehension and contemplation of the beautiful as a gift of God. The use and function of a person is to be the witness of the glory of God and to advance that glory by reasonable obedience and resultant happiness. The direct manifestation of deity to man is in his own image, that is, in man. He avowed in Volume 5, 1860, The soul of man is a mirror of the mind of God, a mirror dark, distorted, and broken. He lamented, but reflective nonetheless of divinity. The broken grandeur of humanity was Ruskin's touchstone of judgment in a remarkable passage from The Nature of Gothic in the second volume of The Stones of Venice, 1853. 
there, his long and impassioned Philippic against the industrial revolution of labor turned on a sacramental portrayal of artisanal excellence. The artisan becomes Ruskin's icon of human divinity, a paradoxical paragon in that imperfection is his outstanding feature. Affirming human mediocrity, Ruskin warned that the ideal of perfection, taken to its fullest, fiendish zenith, in the social and technical machinery of the factory, would disfigure the image and likeness of God. If we insist too severely on perfection, he reasoned, all the brute animals would be preferable to man because more perfect in their functions. Just as sin always bears an ironic testimony to the stature of human divinity, no other creature can possibly defy its creator, so any shortcomings in labor suggest the magnificence of the worker. For the finer the nature, the more flaws it will show through the clearness of it. Let even an inferior mind think and imagine, and out come all his roughness, all his dullness, all his incapability, Shame upon shame, failure upon failure, pause after pause. But out comes the whole majesty of him also, and we know the height of it only when we see the clouds setting upon him. The principal admirableness of the Gothic schools of architecture, Ruskin surmised, is that they welcome the labor of inferior minds, out of such fragments full of imperfection, the Gothic cathedral arose to the skies as a stately and unaccusable whole. Even weakness and deficiency could beckon to God. But the industrial division of labor, dictated by the rage to accumulate, imposed an absolute precision of motion that led inexorably to de-skilling and mechanization, the degradation of the operative into a machine. You must either make a tool of the creature or a man of him. Ruskin insisted. You cannot make both. Men were not intended to work with the accuracy of tools, to be precise and perfect in all their actions. The result was something worse than material deprivation, the loss of joyful, self-directed creation. The most pernicious offense of industrial capitalism against humanity is not that men are ill-fed, but that they have no pleasure in the work by which they make their bread. As anyone could see who cared to look at the uncalculated prodigality of nature, God was not interested in precision and efficiency. Thus, those who adhered to Yuri's philosophy of manufacture were, on Ruskin's account, stripping workers of their likeness to divinity. If precision productivity, and profit, rather than majesty, are the goals of labor, workers must be made into machines. You must unhumanize them. You must, in other words, desecrate them. And there would quite literally be hell to pay for this sacrilege. This nature bad not, this God blesses not, this humanity for no long time is able to endure. None of Ruskin's subsequent declamation against mammon's service can be understood apart from this sacramental humanism. Men and women were only a little lower than the angels, and to cheapen and oppress them was, in Ruskin's eyes, a defilement as well as an injustice. Now, it is a good and desirable thing truly to make many pins in a day, but if we could only see with what crystal sand their points are polished— sand of human soul, much to be magnified before it can be discerned for what it is. And the great cry that rises from all our manufacturing cities, louder than their furnace blast, is all in very deed for this, that we manufacture everything there except men. We blanch cotton, and strengthen steel, and refine sugar, and shape pottery, but to brighten to strengthen, to refine, or to form a single living spirit, never enters into our estimate of advantages. If, for Marx and Weber, capitalism was the dynamo of secular modernity, for Ruskin it embodied a metamorphosis of the sacred, a perverse enchantment of the world. 
Ruskin clearly feared that secularization was really a capitalist form of idolatry, a rechristening of heavenly ecstasy in a cold baptismal font of money, a reenchantment conducted under the gilded, unholy auspices of capital. In the Political Economy of Art, eighteen fifty-seven, Ruskin described the day of a typical business person as a regimen of spiritual discipline. The worship of Mammon. He began, proceeds with a tender reverence and an exact propriety, reminiscent of Johnson's Volpone. The merchant rises to his Mammon matins with the self-denial of an anchorite, and asks forgiveness for the distractions that may keep him from his Mammon vespers. Later, in Munera Pulveris, eighteen seventy-one. Ruskin maintained that, far from a secular denial of the supernatural, capitalism had its own ensemble of gods, sacraments, and spiritual devotions. We have indeed a nominal religion to which we pay tithes of property and sevenths of time. He conceded, but we have also a practical and earnest religion to which we devote nine tenths of our property and six tenths of our time. The deity of this true Victorian faith was the goddess of getting on, in male form, Mammon, the great evil spirit of false and fond desire or covetousness, which is idolatry. Read in this light, unto this last, eighteen sixty-two, Ruskin's best-known statement of his economic views was both a manifesto of sacramental humanism. And a theological critique of the dismal science. Indeed, Ruskin went Carlyle one better and denied that economics is a science at all, comparing it to alchemy, astrology, witchcraft, and other such popular creeds. Economics is worse than dismal. He contended it is simply untrue, because its account of human nature is fallacious. A human being, he admonished his readers, is an engine whose motive power is a soul, not autonomous and calculating self-interest. And the force of this very peculiar agent enters into all the political economists' equations and falsifies every one of their results. Thus, Ruskin dismissed the scientific pretensions of economics with indifference and disdain. I neither impugn nor doubt the conclusions of the science if its assumptions are accepted. He sneered. I am simply uninterested in them, as I should be in those of a science of gymnastics, which assumed that men had no skeletons. To Ruskin, the mendacity of economics lay in its erasure of God's image from its account of human nature. When he declared that he knew. No previous instance in history of a nation's establishing a systematic disobedience to the first principles of its professed religion; those first principles were theological. The mammon service that characterized laissez-faire capitalism exhibited an idolatry abhorred of the deity. The moral evil of avarice arose from perverse religious veneration. The sacramental leavens all of Ruskin's account of what he calls the real science of political economy. Unto this last has been praised even by its detractors for its many elegant and moving passages, but the loveliness of the prose is not aesthetic finesse. The style of the argument is inseparable from the substance. At one point, Ruskin digressed or appeared to digress. Into a lyrical bucolic rhapsody. No air is sweet that is silent. He mused, as the art of life is learned, it will be found at last that all lovely things are also necessary. The wild flower by the wayside, as well as the tended corn, and the wild birds and creatures of the forest, as well as the tended cattle, because man doth not live by bread only, but also by the desert manna. By every wondrous word and unknowable work of God, happy in that he knew them not, nor did his fathers know, and that round about him reaches yet into the infinitude the amazement of his existence. 
The pastoral imagery is so obvious and so liable to dismissal as reactionary that its sacramental import can be overlooked or evaded. Such passages convey Ruskin's fundamental assumptions throughout unto this last, that everything reaches yet into the infinite, that the earth is resplendent with amazement, that we live by and in the measureless, unfathomable wonder of a loving divinity. Unlike the world sketched out by Malthus, and still preserved in the pages of economics texts, the world is not a hard-scrabble land of unlikeliness, parched and stricken by scarcity. It is charged with the grandeur of God. This sacramental principle of amazement entailed the genuine enchantment of the dismal science. Convinced that material life is sacramental and that abundance is the basic ontological feature of creation, Ruskin labored to show how real science could permit a glimpse of what he called the economy of heaven. The economy we would build if we realized that the world reaches yet into the infinite, if the soul named the longing of incarnate beings to reach yet into the infinite, then political economy was first and foremost an education in desire. The desire of the heart is also the light of the eyes. The true science of production instructs us first not how to maximize profits, but how to desire and labor for the things that lead to life and to scorn and destroy the things that lead to destruction. Life meant not merely biological survival, but the exuberant flourishing of all our powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. Ruskin's famous declaration that there is no wealth but life stemmed from something more than a vitalist moralism. It was the motto of a sacramental economics in which life is the efflorescence of divinity. If life is the only true wealth, then to eyes illuminated by heavenly desire, a distinction appeared between wealth and what Ruskin cursed as ilth. Unlike the conventional quantitative measurement of wealth, the total volume of goods and services, irrespective of their impact on body or soul, Ruskin's calculus of wealth was exclusively qualitative. The possession of the valuable by the valiant. Wealth depended on a relationship between the character of a thing and the character of its possessor. A valuable object in the hands of an unworthy person was a sadness, even a desecration, certainly not a good. By the same token, the value of consumption resided in its contribution to the vibrancy of life. The final outcome and consummation of all wealth he wrote, was not enlargement of production, but rather the abundance of full-breathed, bright-eyed, and happy-hearted human creatures. Hence, Ruskin's assertion, sure to grate on the ears of contemporary scolds of consumerism, that consumption is indeed the final object of political economy. Ruskin dimly realized that what we call the culture of consumption is really a covert culture of production, since profit, not pleasure, is its ultimate goal. The unending stimulation of desire and discontent is a means to magnify capital accumulation, not to increase or deepen our fulfillment. What goes by the name of consumerism represents the corruption of consumption by the work ethic. Thus, the real alternative to the competitive hedonism of capitalist societies was not austerity, but rather wisdom in consumption. Those who look to Ruskin's humanism as a philosophy for the simple life will be disappointed, as the economy of heaven is an invitation to delight, not to asceticism, to use everything and to use it nobly. The wealth that is life mandated, good method of consumption, and great quantity of consumption. To Ruskin, self-denial is no part of the good life. Against wealth, Ruskin posed not poverty, but ilth, that which wreaks devastation and trouble in all directions. 
evaluated by this standard, much of modern wealth was a plethora of ilf that inflicted a dim-eyed and narrow-chested state of being. What appeared to economists as growth and dynamism could in fact be a metastasizing cancer. Indeed, if Ruskin implied that conventional economics is a pseudoscience of ilf, then capitalism is the political economy of death. Because the dismal science enjoined envy and competition, Ruskin condemned it, not only as a falsehood, but also as a discipline and practice of oblivion. Ilf was lethal as well as shabby, for capitalist expansion was impossible without the corruption and death of the soul. In the warfare of modern business, Ruskin observed, the seeking of death is a grand expression of the true course of men's toil. If heavenly economics decreed the laws of life, capitalist economics compiled the laws of death. What form would the economy of heaven take on earth? As his answer unfolded over the 1860s and 1870s, Ruskin attempted to reconcile old-school Toryism and old-school Communism in a sacramental imagination. The incarnate economy of heaven would blend with the paternalism of the Tory tradition with the fraternal Republican ethos of Communism. In the preface of Unto This Last, he outlined a program that later became a model for the British welfare state. Training schools for youth, public works projects, state-owned factories and workshops to absorb the unemployed, and provision of housing and medical care for the old and the destitute. In flagrant defiance of the law of supply and demand, Ruskin suggested that all workers in the same trade should be paid at the same rate, arguing that only in this way would workers be chosen on account of their quality rather than their cheapness. But Ruskin appeared less concerned with policy prescriptions than with the character of the English people, who had to be unconverted, so to speak, from the enchantment of mammon service. Calling on his brethren to abandon the battle for status and ilf, he admonished them to be modest, givers of calm, peace creators, who exemplified the biblical injunction that justice and peace should kiss. Not greater wealth, but simple pleasure. Not higher fortune, but deeper felicity, making the first of possessions self-possession, and honouring themselves in the harmless pride and calm pursuits of peace. Ruskin's subsequent avowals of communism make sense only against the background of the Toryism of Unto This Last. In some of his first open letters to the English working class that comprise Fors Clavigera, written just after the establishment of the Paris Commune in March 1871, Ruskin explained that the economy of heaven was a communist republic of small producers. Alarmed by spurious reports that the Paris communards had destroyed many of the city's most beautiful monuments, Ruskin felt compelled to distinguish himself from the radicals across the Channel. What he dubbed the Parisian school of communism taught that all property was common property, but... We communists of the old school, dark red communists, he emphasized, reddest of the red, while they too believed that everybody must work in common and do common or simple work for his dinner, they nonetheless upheld a kind of private property that was communist in principle and practice. They nonetheless upheld a kind of private property that was communist in principle and practice. Our property belongs to everybody and everybody's property belongs to us. Old-school communists dwell in charity, since they exist only in giving, and dread above all things getting miserly of virtue. They considered property to be a mode of graceful self-expenditure, not a vehicle for accumulation. Thus, there would never be any fear of unemployment, but there would be great fear lest we should not do the work set us well. This 
old-school communism differed from that of Marx in several respects, and the differences are traceable to Ruskin's romantic, sacramental imagination. If Ruskin was no simple reactionary, recall his recognition of the progress of this century, then perhaps the fundamental conflict of visions in the nineteenth century was not, as Lash understood it, between progress and its critics, but rather between what we might call Promethean and convivial conceptions of progress. Sponsored under capitalist and Marxist auspices, the Promethean project of industrial modernity assumed, even in its evangelical Protestant form, an irreducibly combative ontology. Ruskin repudiated Promethean notions of progress, innovation, and secularism, all of which appeared, in the light of amazement, as specious and destructive illusions, fables of dominion that blinded their adherence to the friendliness of the universe. Since, to Ruskin, the line between heaven and earth was so thin as to be almost indiscernible, and all finite things reach yet into the infinite, the world did not need improvement so much as loving nurturance of its possibilities. The sacramental ontology at the root of Ruskin's communism sanctioned not a regressive or stationary state, but a project of human and technological progress determined by the principle of life. Ruskin also defined communist property in a way that Marx would have scornfully dismissed, but which also underlined the serious flaws in the Marxist account of historical progress. Indeed, the conflict over the meaning of progress was also a contest over the meaning of communism. Modern communism has always had a twofold character. As a form of property, common ownership, and as a principle of morality, from each according to ability, to each according to need. As his emphasis on giving indicates, Ruskin, like Marx, affirmed the communist principle of morality, but they differed profoundly about the proper form of communist property, and they would have quarreled over the abilities and needs to be cultivated and fulfilled. For Marx, the future form of common ownership was inextricably bound up with the course of capitalist development as corporate consolidation prepared industry for collective expropriation and ownership by the revolutionary proletariat. But this meant that the communist principle of morality, the abilities and needs, would bear the marks of its Promethean ancestor, its technocratic politics, its equation of abundance with industrial production, its defiant insensitivity to natural limits. Because he rejected this Promethean account of progress, Ruskin thereby rejected the Promethean account of communism. For Ruskin, consolidation and mechanized production embodied the defilement of human divinity, while mammon's service ensured, not the conquest of scarcity, but the triumph of productivity over love. Resisting what he considered the fraudulently progressive march of Promethean modernity, Ruskin countered that communism could thrive with private, non-accumulative, convivial property. His political economy of heaven was a society of friends, a beloved community of small proprietors who revived the spirit of the medieval commons, animated and united by a communist principle of giving and consuming in love, from each according to ability, to each according to need. Following Marx, the left has tended to vilify Ruskin's kind of anti-capitalism as petty bourgeois fantasy. There is more than a little truth to this charge. Ruskin was at his best when playing the roles of critic, provocateur, and visionary. He failed, utterly, when he tried to be the architect of a fundamentally new economics, and that blend of genius and ineptitude augured more moderation than radicalism. Even in Unto This Last, Ruskin conceded too much to the realities of mammon's service. His proposal of equal wages, for instance, still assumed both wage labor and a competitive labor market. 
His forays into technical economics, epitomized in the uncharacteristically leaden prose and banal analysis of Munera Polveris, failed to undermine and supplant the terms of conventional economics. But precisely because of its sacramental theology, Ruskin's ideal of small producer communism remains invaluable. After two centuries of Promethean techniques and its irreparable ecological impact, the bitterness and malice he detected in nature seems less like dyspeptic projection and more like the groaning of a world in peril. A more convivial technology, more attuned to the Earth's amazement, must now be adopted as a necessity. By the same token, Unlike the despotism that Engels foresaw as the rule in the realm of necessity, convivial communism offered a way to preserve the creative autonomy of the worker, the image and likeness of God, against the managerial and technocratic encroachments of modern industrial organization. Against Marx's celebration of large-scale, mechanized production as the basis of freedom, Ruskin would undoubtedly lament automation as an exile from the realm of divinity, where an absolute duality of work and play is simply unimaginable. Automation would also elicit Ruskin's invective because its vision of abundance is utterly quantitative. More and more things, for less and less work, irrespective of the quality of the things, and especially the quality of the worker. Wealth, as the possession of the valuable by the valiant, rooted, like Ruskin's concern for the worker, in a sacramental humanism, implied a standard of abundance more profoundly humane than that of a mechanical cornucopia. Alas, Ruskin's convivial communism never attracted much support among intellectuals or workers. He incurred the vituperation of the British intelligentsia, most of whom dismissed him as a crank. Unto this last was reprobated in a violent manner. As Ruskin himself put it dryly, one reviewer wrote that it was full of windy hysterics and intolerable twaddle, delivered in the tones of a mad governess. Ruskin's Guild of St. George, established in 1877 to sponsor experiments in handicraft and cooperative farming, was in financial arrears in less than a decade. Although many trade unionists and Labour Party rank and file venerated under this last, the larger working class, the only body, Ruskin declared in Time and Tide, 1867, to which we can look for resistance to the deadly influence of moneyed power, was indifferent to or ignorant of his work. Moreover, as Craig Calhoun, Gareth Stedman Jones, and other Labour historians have contended, Working-class revolutionary fervor in Britain and elsewhere has tended to wane rather than intensify with the progress of industrialization. Over the course of Ruskin's life, large-scale industry increasingly set the boundary of the proletarian political imagination. The workers to whom Ruskin addressed his communism grew more interested in acquiring an ever larger share of the fruits of mechanized production. Ruskin often expressed his disappointment at the meagerness of workers' demands, a poverty of imagination he thought ultimately traceable to the mechanization of labor. Considering only their immediate interest, unions, he lamented, in the crown of wild olive, never considered the far more terrific power of capital's appointment of the kind and the object of labor. If they insisted only on higher wages, a demand that implicitly ratified both the wage system and the industrial division of labor, workers would become complicit in the system that corrupted their desires and degraded their skills. It matters fearfully what the thing is which workers are compelled to make. Ruskin implied that if they desired an authentic alternative to capitalism, workers would have to provoke a struggle over the ends as well as over the means of production. Unless workers reclaimed the birthright of human divinity stolen by industrial capitalists, Ruskin feared that any victory they won would prove pyrrhic 
insipid, and short-lived. Thus, Ruskin anticipated the concerns of Theodor Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and other Western Marxists, vexed by the decidedly unrevolutionary consciousness of the working class. If the effects of industrial production and culture are so profoundly demoralizing, how can workers generate the political will to protest and transform their condition? Might they even consent to their own mechanization if the rewards are seductive enough? Ruskin foresaw that the denouement of industrialization might be acquiescence, not revolutionary upheaval. A writer, even more lucid and elegant than Ruskin, William Morris was another romantic enchanter whose work deserves our attention. For a long time, scholars saw Morris through the prism constructed by E. P. Thompson, who claimed that Morris traveled from romantic to revolutionary. That is, from the medievalist and reactionary moralism of Ruskin to the scientific socialism of Marx and Engels. To Thompson, the trajectory of Morris's political evolution seemed clear. Enchanted as a student at Oxford, by the desire to produce beautiful things and by a hatred of modern civilization, Morris devoted himself to verse, fable, and handicraft, writing, in Thompson's words, evasive and despairing poetry, such as The Defense of Guinevere, 1858, and The Earthly Paradise, 1868-1870, and designing splendid tapestries for the tasteful bourgeoisie, along with Edward Byrne-Jones, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and other pre-Raphaelite artists and artisans, Morris hoped to overcome the ugliness and brutality of industrial capitalism through the revival of craftsmanship. Trained as an architect after leaving Oxford, Morris transformed himself into an artisanal prodigy, mastering ceramics, carpentry, weaving, printing, dyeing, and embroidery. Founder of a highly lucrative design firm, Morris also set up the Kelmscott Press, using the printing technology and typography of the 15th century. Morris might have been remembered as a versatile craftsperson and progressive capitalist, but in the early 1880s he joined H. M. Hinman, E. Belford Bax, Eleanor Marx, and Edward Aveling in the Social Democratic Federation, SDF. Britain's first major socialist party. Having converted to Marxism, Morris embarked on his most productive phase, what Thompson dubbed the scientific utopia of news from nowhere, 1890, and a handful of magnificent essays that remain classics in the socialist canon. Thus, Morris's poetry and fiction his advocacy for architectural restoration, and his work as a designer and craftsperson all became, in Thompson's narrative, a wayward, albeit illustrious pilgrimage toward political enlightenment. Yet, Thompson's claim that Morris thought through a fusion of the Romantic and Marxist traditions is refuted by many of Morris's own explicit statements— his own account of his political journey in How I Became a Socialist, 1894, was a tale of an intellectual vagabond. Morris sketched his definition of socialism not in the terminology of scientific socialism, but in the venerable lexicon of the commons, a commonwealth in which there should be neither rich nor poor, neither master nor master's man, neither brain-sick brain-workers nor heart-sick hand-workers. This view, he continued, which I hold today and hope to die holding, is what I began with. Began, that is to say, in his days as a crafter of poems, romances, and tapestries. Indeed, Morris asserted that he had no transitional period. The SDF gave Morris a hope of the realization of my ideal, but when asked how much of a hope, he could only reply, I do not know. These are hardly the words of a formidable theoretician, and Morris openly avowed 
with a candor that must have unsettled his comrades and admirers, that he had little interest in the intricacies of socialist theory. Blankly ignorant of economics, before he joined the SDF, he put some conscience into trying to learn the economical side of socialism, and he even tackled Marx, specifically that great work, Capital. Though he plumbed the historical parts, Morris confessed to agonies of confusion of the brain over reading the pure economics. Having recounted his meagre theoretical prowess, Morris returned with relish, and not a little relief, to the source of his radical hope, the medievalist revival associated with Carlyle and Ruskin. Morris seldom mentioned Carlyle, but Ruskin, he wrote plainly, was my master. How deadly dull the world would have been twenty years ago, but for Ruskin. Through Ruskin, not Marx, Morris learned to give form to his discontent, a discontent, he reiterated, that was not by any means vague. Morris made no secret of his debt to Ruskin. After reading Modern Painters while at Oxford, he anointed Ruskin a Luther of the Arts. Despite Ruskin's Toryism, Morris felt no embarrassment or ambivalence in lavishing praise on his hero. In his foreword to the Kelmscott Press's 1892 reprint of The Nature of Gothic, published, like his account of his political journey well into his allegedly Marxist period, Morris praised not Ruskin the historian and critic, but Ruskin, the teacher of morals and politics. Even though Ruskin's hostility to socialism was well known, Morris asserted that he had done serious and solid work toward that new birth of society, without which genuine art, the expression of man's pleasure in his handiwork, must inevitably cease altogether, and with it the hopes of the happiness of mankind. As Morris summarized Ruskin's lessons, art is the expression of man's pleasure in labor. Unless man's work once again becomes a pleasure to him, the token of which change will be that beauty is once again a natural and necessary accompaniment of productive labor, all but the worthless must toil in pain, and therefore live in pain. Writing while still a member of the SDF, Morris saluted Ruskin not for any call for the equitable distribution of industrial production, but for his craft and aesthetic ideal of the hallowing of labor by art. Bearing the Gothic trademark of Ruskin, the hallowing of labor by art was the goal of Morris's romantic socialism. The consecrating craftsperson, not the desecrated proletarian, was Morris's enduring icon. From his earliest lectures, Morris upheld aesthetic and sensual delight as the highest criterion of labor, objecting to the invidious distinction between the lesser and the higher arts in The Lesser Arts, 1877, a talk delivered to an educational guild of artisans, Morris celebrated such allegedly lowly skills as carpentry, pottery, and weaving, for their fusion of beauty and utility. The lesser arts beautify the familiar matters of everyday life, while the higher arts minister to the vanity of the rich. Morris predicted that if they remained separated, both arts would grow impoverished and joyless, the lesser ones would be mechanized and trivial, while the higher would produce ingenious toys, dull adjuncts to unmeaning pomp. Later, in Useful Work vs. Useless Toil, 1885, one of the finest essays on labor ever written, Morris saluted the medieval artisan who stamped all labor with the impress of pleasure. Degraded industrial workers should demand not higher wages or shoddy abundance enjoyed in their hours of leisure, but hope of rest, hope of product hope of pleasure in the work itself. Workers should learn at least three crafts, Morris believed, and blend sedentary with outdoor labor. Rather than simply release humanity from the realm of necessity, 
the Marxist hope for industrialization, Morris's romantic socialism promised to leaven the realm of necessity with the joy of the realm of freedom. This can hardly be squared with Marx's enthusiasm for industrialization. Still, Morris did make some attempt to align the historical dialectics of Marx with the romantic craftsmanship of Ruskin. His account of revolutionary unrest and upheaval in News from Nowhere, How the Workers Fight Their Way from Commercial Slavery to Freedom, is a masterpiece in the fictional portrayal of proletarian struggle, a panoramic and violent eschatology of misery, mobilization, insurrection, and triumph. Yet, neither News from Nowhere nor the socialist essay justify Thompson's contention that Morris achieved a harmonious blend of Ruskin and Marx. Morris's Marxism often seems dutiful. His keener perceptions are frequently at odds with historical materialist optimism. This ambivalence surfaced in the muddled conclusion of How I Became a Socialist. Though claiming to sense a consciousness of revolution stirring amidst our hateful modern society, Morris often seemed more convinced that the working class had renounced or evaded its historical mission. Sounding more like Ruskin than Marx, Morris worried that the average worker scarcely knows how to frame a desire for any life much better than that which he now endures perforce. As Ruskin had feared, and as Morris now lamented, industrial technology and culture had crippled the moral imagination of the working class. In private, Morris was even gloomier about the workers' revolutionary potential. It is obvious, he once wrote to a friend, that the support to be looked for for constructive socialism from the working classes at present is naught. Full of vague discontent, and a spirit of revenge, the typical worker with any gift for leadership finds himself tending to rise out of his class rather than remaining in a spirit of solidarity. Morris's doleful assessment of the working class was not unfounded. The recession of radicalism among workers that was evident to Ruskin had become even more pronounced by the 1890s. As Gareth Stedman Jones writes, Capitalism had become an immovable horizon for the late Victorian proletariat. The energies that formerly might have been devoted to revolutionary agitation were now absorbed by what Jones dubs a culture of consolation that provided workers with a packet of compensations for social and political impotence. Trade unionism, which accepted industrial workplace discipline, and the new urban mass culture of commodified entertainment and distraction. Working-class politics shifted from power to welfare, while socialism increasingly meant not workers' control of production, but state provision of welfare, the redistribution of wealth, and the eradication of poverty. The contraction of socialist ambition often attributed to Sidney and Beatrice Webb and the Fabian Society, as well as to Eduard Bernstein and the German Social Democrats, had already commenced among the urban working class. Gradualism and reformism were reflections, not diversions, of working class political consciousness. The narrowing horizon of working class hope was evident to Morris, and he clearly realized that the dynamics of capitalist production and culture posed serious obstacles to the development of revolutionary consciousness. What if the everyday life of capitalism bred not discontent and revolution, but rather discontent and acquiescence, or even contentedness and affirmation? What if the destruction of pre-industrial ideals celebrated by Marx left us not with freedom to write the poetry of the future, but with a protracted imaginative paralysis? Morris's desire for hallowed labor could have propelled him to challenge one of the central tenets of Marxist theory, that capitalism would create the material and cultural preconditions for revolution. 
Why did workers find it difficult or impossible to frame a desire for any life much better than one defined by competitive mobility and consumer goods? Ruskin would have answered, in part, the corruption of morality and sensibility, an answer that many Marxists and other socialists have dismissed as reactionary and elitist. But as Morris's remark suggested, without the sort of distinction between wealth and ilf that Ruskin had drawn, the volume of material abundance could obscure any vision of a life beyond accumulation. Marx would have insisted that we must conquer the realm of necessity before we can enter the realm of freedom. But Morris realized that it was precisely the chasm imposed between those realms that needed to be eradicated. Necessity and freedom, labor and beauty, should be bound up together, and the craftsperson embodied this union. Gothic architecture proved that a materially less abundant civilization could create beautiful and ennobling objects. Why, then, suppose that beauty and goodness had to wait on the achievements of industrial plenitude, a bounty that was, in any case, so shabby and soul-destroying. As the historical treasury of craftsmanship proved, loveliness and virtue had already hallowed the realm of necessity. So for art, the expression of man's pleasure in labor, to be a form of moral imagination, workers had to learn the poetry of the past if they were to write any poetry of the future. It is the province of art, Morris asserted, to envision and proclaim the true ideal of a full and reasonable life. As Ruskin would probably have sealed the argument, humanity does not live by bread alone. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all else shall be added unto you. Morris, however, deferred to his comrades, bread and then roses. Despite his conviction that roses were as essential as bread to human flourishing, Morris chided those who believed that the question of art and cultivation must go before that of the knife and fork. Such well-intentioned dilettants did not understand what art means, or how its roots must have a soil of a thriving and unanxious life. But as Morris's own life and work had testified so handsomely, this way of posing the issue was false too eager to see the final realization of his romantic artisanal idea, Morris submitted to the apparently scientific certainty of the SDF, a triumph of impatience over wisdom. Why did Morris betray the ideal of romantic craftsmanship? A large part of the answer lies in the allure of Victorian radical chic. To many on the British left, Marxism seemed to offer a more serious political and intellectual alternative to capitalist society than Fabianism, Christian socialism, or anarchism. But we must also consider Morris's abandonment of the sacramental imagination that was central to Ruskin's legacy. Like his master, Morris had been raised in an evangelical family, what he later excoriated as Rich establishmentarianism, Puritanism, was a religion which even as a boy I never took to. Yet, shortly before entering Oxford, Morris felt powerfully attracted to the religious culture of Anglo-Catholicism. He visited the cathedrals of northern France, moved in the high church circles of the Oxford movement, and even considered founding a monastery. Animated by his zeal for medieval history, Morris's Anglican enchantment persisted through most of his student years. But gradually, Morris drifted away, emerging from his Anglo-Catholic phase more or less hostile to institutional religion. He neither proselytized for atheism, like Charles Bradlaugh, nor abided in Christian unorthodoxy like his master Ruskin. With his usual effortless honesty, Morris declared himself, near the end of his life, careless of metaphysics and religion, but with a deep love of the earth and the life on it. 
Still, despite his professed aloofness from religious and theological matters, Morris inflected his socialist writing with a compelling sacramental hope. In his essays, Morris combines the evangelical preacher and the medieval knight-errant, sworn to rescue a holy land from the infidels of capital. He clearly considered socialism a modern form of religion, and as he told Georgie Byrne-Jones, his close friend's wife, shortly after he joined the SDF, the aim of socialists should be the founding of a religion, an intense devotion to moral and aesthetic ideals. Socialism, he wrote in The Hopes of Civilization, 1885, would provide more than an equitable distribution of wealth. It bears with its own ethics and religion and aesthetics. It is the hope and promise of a new and higher life in all ways. As he hinted in News from Nowhere, that new and higher life would be akin to divinity. When Morris asks his hosts from the future what they expect to be paid for their work, they gently chide him for his crass and grubby impertinence. They work for free. That is, they take pleasure in their labor. Our reward, one informs him, is the reward of creation. The wages which God gets, as people might have said time agone. In other words, God does not need or accept payment. His only remuneration is delight. This was more than justice and beauty. It was redemption and exaltation, something larger and deeper than political revolution or romantic craftsmanship. In a remarkable passage in News from Nowhere, Hammond, the wise old teacher who guides Morris through the new society, reflects on the world after the revolution with an erotic, almost sacramental joy. The spirit of the new days, of our days, he muses, is delight in the life of the world, intense and overweening love of the very skin and surface of the earth on which man dwells, such as a lover has in the fair flesh of the woman he loves. Such a doting sensuality was difficult and fleeting in the world of commercialism, restricted as it was to the boundaries imposed by adherence to pecuniary reason. More akin to our way of life, Hammond explains, is the spirit of the Middle Ages. To the people of that era, heaven and the life of the next world was such a reality that it became to them a part of the life upon the earth, which accordingly they loved and adorned. In spite of the ascetic doctrines of their formal creed, which bade them contemn it. To be sure, the enlightened citizens of the new society could no longer share the medieval era's assured belief in heaven and hell. But, Hammond assures Morris, nature assumes a luminous grandeur with the disappearance of the supernatural. The world and its inhabitants were now a beloved community of earthly beatitude. The religion of humanity was now easy to believe, Hammond told his visitor from the past. The men and women who go to make up humanity are free, happy, and energetic at least, and most commonly beautiful of body also, and surrounded by beautiful things of their own fashioning, and a nature bettered and not worsened by contact with mankind. This was Blake's New Jerusalem the return of the green and pleasant land, remade once the mills of Satan had been raised and their rubble carted away. It was also Carlyle's world of wonder and the everlasting yea, without the infernal gospel of work and the barons of industrial heroism. It was Ruskin's economy of heaven in the absence of Ruskin's God. But it was also the hope of St. George's Hill dug up by Winstanley and his comrades. It was the heritage of the commons, the lineage of the guilds, the victory of carnival, the abolition of Lent. Morris was well aware that medieval craft had been charged with religious hope, and that socialism represented a modern attempt to construct an alternative faith.
A revival of religion was one of the moving causes of energy in the early Middle Ages, he observed in his essay on Gothic architecture, and one of the salutary features of this faith had been its enthusiasm for visible tokens of the objects of worship. The beautiful people and things of nowhere would be emblems of human divinity. Like his beloved medieval craftspeople, Morris desired that life on earth be leavened with the presence of heaven. What he sought in the people's republic of beauty was a re-enchantment of the world. Morris's career marks the secular denouement of the romantic, sacramental imagination, secular in its longing for an utterly mortal and finite beatitude. But by that very token, it also marks the futility of secular attempts to re-enchant the world. Like other prodigal children in flight from Victorian evangelicalism, Morris believed he could dispense with Christian theology and still hold on to Christian wonder and ethics. As Nietzsche had noted of George Eliot and other adherents of the religion of humanity, they are rid of the Christian God, and now believe all the more firmly that they must cling to Christian morality. But, as Nietzsche realized with his pitiless clarity, the morality was embedded in the divinity. Christian ethics depended on a world understood as the creation of God. Eliot and those like her had postponed confronting the full implications of their apostasy. For the English, Nietzsche wrote with mordant understatement, Morality is not yet a problem. The same could be said of Morris's religion of socialism and beauty, his gorgeous substitute for sacrament. How could heaven inspire our love and adornment once we know it doesn't exist? Could paradise survive the inexorable course of material senescence and death? No beatitude has ever been so frail and melancholy. John Ball knew better that justice and beauty needed firmer ontological foundations. Written two years before News from Nowhere, A Dream of John Ball, 1888, is a similar tale of time travel, but to the past rather than the future. Recalling the ill-fated Peasants' Revolt of 1381, Morris became a socialist Mallory transforming the farmers and artisans of Kent into knights-errant of communism. In his speech to the insurgents at the foot of the village cross, Ball summoned their revolutionary spirit by invoking the marriage of heaven and earth. Forsooth, brothers, fellowship is heaven, and lack of fellowship is hell. I bid you not dwell in hell but in heaven, or while ye must, upon earth, which is a part of heaven, and forsooth, no foul part. If their rebellion against the kingdom of hell was victorious, the saints in heaven shall be glad, because men no more fear each other. Ball tells his men that even defeat will bear a sacramental witness. If they perish and decompose, they will be part and parcel of the living wisdom of all things, very stones of the pillars that uphold the joyful earth. Yet, the rebels fall victim not only to the nobles, but also to the condescension of Marxist posterity. During Ball's oration at the foot of the village cross, Morris reflected on the detours that history would throw in the path of socialism. Men fight and lose the battle, and the thing that they fought for comes about in spite of their defeat, and when it comes, turns out not to be what they meant and other men have to fight for what they meant under another name. To Morris, socialism was the modern name of Ball's medieval dream, but Ball might well have protested that it wasn't exactly what he meant. While both Ball and Morris belonged to the lineage of the commons, Ball's comments, envisioned at the foot of a cross, was a part of heaven on earth, in fellowship with the saints, an antechamber to the kingdom of God. For Ball and the peasants, divinity pervaded and sanctioned the commons. The injustice and tyranny of priests and nobles desecrated God's holy manner. 
aiming to expropriate the clergy and the aristocracy, Ball's peasant crusaders had much larger hopes than the modern working class. Resigned to the permanence of capitalist society, the working classes, in England and elsewhere, made a tenuous peace with the barons of finance and industry. However resilient and even heroic in their efforts to effect reform, the culture of consolation was a pale reflection of the fellowship of heaven. Morris's longing for a heavenly fellowship was shared by many in the arts and crafts movement. From Ireland to Finland, but especially in England, arts and crafts attracted numerous artists, architects, designers, and other disgruntled urban professionals. Often educated at Oxbridge, many English artisanal ideologues, Morris, Walter Crane, T. J. Cobden Richardson, C. R. Ashby, and Edward Carpenter, were self-taught craftspersons inspired by Ruskin and Morris. Appalled by the shoddiness of mass-produced goods and the blandness of industrial architecture, they traced the deformation of craft and architectural design to the capitalist imperative for low costs and maximum profit. Craftspersons were endangered, Crane contended, by a misapplication of machinery driven by keen competition of trade. But English artisanal ideologues aspired to more than aesthetically pleasing products. They aimed to efface the modern industrial distinction between art and life. Communities such as the Art Workers Guild, the Guild of Handicraft and the Bromsgrove Guild combined craftwork and agriculture in the hope that art and manual labor would gradually permeate society, supplanting the mercenary and mechanical civilization with a loving and organic community. Attempting to overcome power with beauty, artisanal advocates produced a cornucopia of books, essays, and catalogues, promoted exhibits and sales rooms, and set up numerous craft schools, workshops, and guilds. These small experiments in craft and husbandry could be dismissed as enclaves of apolitical withdrawal, romantic pining in industrializing England for what was left of Blake's green and pleasant land. But we should recall how the participants saw them, as outposts of what many writers dubbed the new age, the new life, or the simple life, living now with the exuberance and fullness one desired, not postponing paradise into the future. Artisanal advocates sought to revitalize, or even better, to create a moral imagination for modernity. As many craft ideologues admitted, the figure of the artisan was a human ideal before it was a criterion for craftsmanship. The real thing is the life, as Ashby emphasized at his Guild of Handicraft in the Cotswolds. If workers or professionals found freedom and personality in the exercise of skill and autonomy, it doesn't matter so very much if their metalwork is second-rate. Arts and crafts aspired to make beautiful souls as well as handsomely usable objects. But... Without social roots in the working class and metaphysical roots in theology, those beautiful souls stood defenseless against co-optation. Uncoupled from their hatred of industrial capitalism, their praise of the Gothic was easily enlisted in the service of the bourgeoisie. Though swearing fidelity to the spirit of Morris and Ruskin, the arts and crafts movement in both Britain and the United States became a form of aesthetic therapy for disgruntled bourgeois. Composed mainly of aesthetically earnest bourgeois, the British arts and crafts movement downplayed Morris's socialist politics and highlighted his designs for tapestry and furniture. Though deriding their various elegant little schemes for the revival of handicraft, Morris became an unlikely contributor to the aesthetic revitalization of the British ruling class. Once an eloquent line of socialism, Morris was housebroken by tasteful consumers of domestic decoration. Through the alchemy of forgetting, 
romantic opposition to capitalist squalor was transmuted into bourgeois bohemianism. Morris's desire to mark labor with the impress of pleasure was shared by the anarchist movement. Morris himself adamantly rejected anarchism. Anarchists themselves, he once told a friend, had convinced him, quite against their intention, that anarchism was impossible. Eager to maintain his credibility with Marxists, Morris adopted their patronizing attitude, chiding anarchists in Socialism and Anarchism, 1889, for being authoritative about authority, and not a little vague also. But Morris was an occasional contributor to Liberty, a short-lived English anarchist journal, and he shared their distaste for electoral politics and their opposition to state socialism. Moreover, Morris's celebration of artisanal autonomy both endeared him to craft ideologues and converged with the anarchist hatred of the hierarchy that Marxists considered indispensable to modern industry. Both anarchists and arts and crafts writers expressed an antipathy to the managerial and technocratic elitism against which Morris and Ruskin had warned. Anarchists, as well as artisanal idealists, have been routinely dismissed as romantic and backward-looking, unable or unwilling to board the train of historical and technological progress. For instance, historians interpreted anarchism as a dying, atavistic bray of the pre-industrial order, an ideological requiem of the petty bourgeoisie. Artisans, peasants, shopkeepers— small proprietors marked for extinction by agricultural and industrial modernization. Forged by members of declining classes, autodidact artisans like Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, renegade aristocrats like Mikhail Bakunin, Leo Tolstoy, and Peter Kropotkin, anarchist theory was the cry of freedom from men being cast into the dustbin of history. But recent scholarship portrays anarchism before World War I as a much more broadly based movement of beleaguered small producers, insurgent industrial workers, and avant-garde artists and writers. Like Marxists, anarchists identified the industrial working class as the chief agent of revolutionary change. Yet, they appealed to all the displaced and disaffected, inviting all the wretched and alienated of the earth from patrician to lumpen proletariat. The discovery that anarchism was more than a form of petty bourgeois radicalism should not, however, obscure the salience of the artisanal ideal in its moral imagination. Despite the obliteration of artisanal skills by the advance of mechanization, craftsmanship remained the moral and political unconscious of anarchism. Anarchists assured workers that they would not have to wait to obtain direct control of the means of production, a promise that Marxists could not make, and that Engels emphatically rejected. Marxists insisted that the proletariat would have to undergo an indefinite period of industrial tutelage from technical and managerial experts. Set against what Engels himself termed this despotism, Anarchist and syndicalist notions of direct action and the general strike make sense not as infantile ideological disorders, but as signs of faith in the capacity of workers to arrange and control their own affairs without permission or guidance from any vanguard. This confidence stemmed from the memory of artisanal and peasant customs of mutual aid. Anarchists were not simply or merely backward-looking. Rather, they regarded the new industrial civilization through the lens of an artisanal sensibility. The often internecine struggle between Marxists and anarchists was a fight over the meaning and content of progress, not a duel between progress and its opponents. If anarchism was forward-looking as well as artisanal, it was therefore a left-libertarian form of romantic anti-capitalism. 
Like other left romantics, anarchists sought to reconcile pre-industrial values with enlightenment principles of scientific reason, technological improvement, and individual freedom. The first two generations of anarchist thinkers lauded the ingenuity and resilience of craft and peasant communities. Peter Kropotkin, for instance, looked back to the guilds and cities of the Middle Ages as models for a libertarian communist modernity. Surveying the evolutionary history of cooperation in Mutual Aid, 1902, Kropotkin echoed Ruskin and Morris. Many aspirations of our modern radicals were already realized in the Middle Ages. He mused, and much of what is described as utopian was accepted then as a matter of fact. Pleasurable work, reasonable hours, frequent holidays, festivals, and pageants. Peasant communes and urban guilds served Kropotkin as they had Morris as forerunners of fraternal, post-capitalist creativity. Unlike modern industrialists, guilds valued the inventive skills of the worker more than rapidity of fabrication. Unlike the modern corporation, the guild, itself a corporate body, was a brotherhood of men who knew each other and knew the techniques of the craft. Anarchist forms of mysticism and spirituality also owed a great deal to Romanticism. Although anarchists denounced institutional religion as the incense surrounding the state, Bakunin declared that if God did exist, it would be necessary to abolish him. Anti-clericalism did not preclude a disposition to natural supernaturalism. In his 19 volume, The Earth and Its Inhabitants, 1886 to 1894, Élisée Reclus, like Kropotkin, a geographer, leavened his meticulous observation of nature with a poetic, ecologically enlightened sensibility imbued with traces of enchantment. Expressed in sensuous, lyrical prose, Reclus's love of the earth bordered on pantheism. I have become part of the surrounding milieu. I feel as if I am one with the floating aquatic plants, one with the sand swept along the bottom, one with the current that sways my body. For Reclus, anarchism represented the fullest fruition of the oldest religious traditions, which had been, he believed, forms of natural enchantment before ossifying into priestcraft and moralism. Our religion of modernity, he asserted, which included everything good that was contained in the ancient religions, is, far from new, and has always been practiced by the best people. The romantic character of anarchism also explains its attraction for many fin du siècle artists and writers. The shock troops of European Bohemia, the site of cultural modernity's earliest experiments in consciousness, manners, and mores. Like embattled craftspeople and peasants, the avant-garde had direct experience of unalienated production. The synthesis of conception and performance in writing, composing, painting, or sculpture remained indispensable to one's identity as an artist. But as freelance creators no longer tethered to the aristocratic and ecclesiastical systems of patronage, painters, sculptors, musicians, poets, novelists, and journalists jostled in a cultural bazaar dominated by bourgeois taste and moralism. The world of banal, sanctimonious avarice from which so many of them had sought escape. Along with their artisanal neighbors, the avant-garde bitterly resented bourgeois encroachment on their creative autonomy. Because of this craft-like conception of art, Anarchism appealed to many avant-garde artists and writers who considered socialists too obsessed with centralization and uniformity, indifferent, if not hostile, to their desire for aesthetic independence and innovation. Galvanized by the prospect of liberation from the clutches of Philistines, plutocrats and administrators, the aesthetic vanguard, from Alfred Jarry and Guillaume Apollinaire, to Pablo Picasso and Vasily Kandinsky, 
rallied beneath the black flag of anarchism. This desire for aesthetic freedom could also double as a modernist search for enchantment. The anarcho-modernist quest for enchantment is best illustrated by Kandinsky, who considered his theories about art and spirituality inseparable from anarchist political convictions. Moving among a Munich avant-garde that took an avid interest in anarchism, medieval mysticism, occultism, theosophy, and pacifism, Kandinsky saw no dissonance between his interest in unorthodox spirituality and the anarchist repudiation of religion. In his two most significant writings on art, on the question of form, his essay in the Blauer Reiter Almanac, 1911, that launched German Expressionism, and Concerning the Spiritual in Art, 1912, a text widely read and debated among artists and intellectuals, Kandinsky fused a mystical, sacramental modernism with rebellion against capital and the state, condemning bourgeois society for its recognizing only what can be weighed and measured. Kandinsky countered that the world is animated by the incalculable. The world sounds. It is a cosmos of spiritually affective beings. Dead matter is living spirit. Spirit is concealed in matter and seeks its materialization. As a material vessel of spirit, contemporary art is anarchistic. It embodies as a materializing force that spiritual element now ready to reveal itself. For Kandinsky, art was the outward and visible sign of an inner spiritual good, and anarchy was the free, spontaneous life of the same internal grace. His colleague and comrade, Franz Marc, predicted that modern art would belong on the altars of the coming spiritual religion. Often thought to be a festive and insolent extravaganza of sensual excess, Bohemia could host aesthetic experiments in the re-enchantment of the world. Kandinsky's anarcho-enchantment had a political complement in the work of the German libertarian socialist, Gustav Landauer, a hero to many German-Jewish radicals, including the young philosopher and theologian Martin Buber. Landauer broke with the Marxist orthodoxy of the Social Democratic Party, as propounded by Karl Kautsky and August Bebel in For Socialism, 1911, his lyrically acerbic critique of Second International Marxism, The Curse of the Socialist Movement, in his words, Landauer excoriated what he viewed as its scientific pretensions and its imaginative capitulation to bourgeois modernity. Against the Marxist claim to have overcome utopian speculation and founded a science of revolution, Landauer contended that there is no science of the future. Human life is too various and volatile to be reduced to immutable laws. At the same time, Marxists' celebration of capitalist industrial development marked them not only as worshippers of success, but as inadvertent acolytes of the very pecuniary enchantment they claimed to dispel. Money, this God, is nothing else but spirit that has exited from man and become a living thing, an un-thing. The meaning of life changed to madness. Speaking for others on the non-Marxist left, Landauer proclaimed that we are poets, not pedants armed with a fraudulent science, and that socialism is a struggle for beauty, greatness, and abundance. In England, the artisanal romanticism of anarchism and arts and crafts found an eloquent oracle in Edward Carpenter, whose courageous defiance of Victorian morality grew out of a post-Christian spirituality. A friend and comrade of Morris and one of England's most popular writers and speakers from the 1880s until World War I, Carpenter embodied the unorthodox sanctity that permeated the late Victorian counterculture. Carpenter's open practice and advocacy of same-sex love and his support for sexual freedom reflected his scorn for civilization. 
his term for the repressive property and erotic relations of industrial capitalism. Driven by insecurity and loneliness, Christian civilization, in Carpenter's view, was harried, malicious, and violent. Its hunger for property was insatiable, and its fear of the body's desires was boundless. Heaven bent on riches and domination, its denizens renounced the only true joy, the resplendence of bodily health, which, for Carpenter, constituted the incarnation of the divine imago within them. As the cure for civilization, Carpenter prescribed the old nature religion of physical vitality and spiritual exaltation. With divine literati Emerson and Whitman as spiritual and poetic preceptors, Carpenter espoused an amorphous and expansive gospel of natural enchantment, a sacredness of life and nature in which the distinction between spiritual and material disappears. In the ever-ancient and ever-new religion of nature, the redeemed and delivered man was the one who experienced divine life and love through all the channels of body and mind. In Carpenter's naturalist divinity, the artisan and the artist were saints of exuberance, icons of earthly enchantment. Although he considered himself a socialist, Carpenter's idealization of craftsmanship and rural life put him closer to arts and crafts and anarchism. Adherents of both movements invoked his writings. Never comfortable with Fabian statism, Carpenter evolved into an anarcho-communist by the end of World War I, defining industrial freedom as workers' control of the means of production. Carpenter contended that smaller, decentralized communities would reskill and reinvigorate their inhabitants. The things they made would radiate the spirit of material divinity. Inspired by a new gospel of wealth, liberated craftspeople would abolish the monotonous servitude of the division of labor. More important, they would reclaim their rightful status as artists, the only natural and healthy people, practitioners of the arts of life. The ordinary chores and routines that sustain and beautify everyday life, uncorrupted by the mercenary obligations for profit and productivity. Touched by the genius of the artist, ordinary objects were vessels of beauty, sacramental mementos that conveyed, through matter, the sense of divinity in nature and life. For Carpenter, as for many radicals touched by the genius of Ruskin and Morris, beauty became the aesthetic and moral substitute for traditional Christian enchantment. Even where they relinquished the medieval spirit while seeking to recast medieval moral economy, anarchism and arts and crafts tried to thwart what Hopkins had called the wreckage of the past, a project of historical demolition that had proceeded much more rapidly across the Atlantic in the United States. In News from Nowhere, Morris alluded to the ugliness of the American industrial landscape, Speaking after the Revolution, Hammond tells Morris that the United States had been so disfigured by industrial capitalism that for a century now, the people of the northern parts of America have been engaged in gradually making a dwelling place out of a stinking dust heap. There is still a great deal to do, he adds, especially as the country is so big. The most advanced capitalist society in the world the United States had been engaged for almost three centuries in the business of improvement and progress. Pervaded by a more pristine economy and culture of capitalist enchantment, America already had, and would continue to compile, a long record of mammon service. Chapter 4 Errand into the Marketplace the Puritan Covenant Theology of Capitalism Before the Puritans set out on their errand, other English explorers believed they had encountered an enchanted replica of Eden. 
Arthur Barlow, captain of a ship dispatched to America by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1584, reported that he had hugged the shore of paradise. Virginian soil was most plentiful, sweet, fruitful, and wholesome, and the natives were most gentle, loving, and faithful, and such as live after the manner of the golden age. The enchantments of America provided abundant fare for poets and playwrights. In To the Virginian Voyage, 1606, a celebration of English colonial destiny, Michael Drayton dubbed Virginia Earth's only paradise. Five years later, William Shakespeare modeled Prospero's Island in The Tempest on voyagers' accounts of Virginia. As Leo Marx explains, Prospero represents a nascent commitment to incessant technological innovation. With his magical incantations, Marx observes, Prospero is a prophet of the emergent faith and progress. Free of the misery and oppression that plague the fearful old world of Europe, Prospero's enchanted isle, America, embellished with utopian longing, is a brave new world of beatific abundance. How beauteous mankind is! Yet, while marveling at the Second Eden, the English also brought God and Mammon to closer proximity. Richard Hacklett, a director of the Virginia Company and one of the premier promoters of colonization in America, trusted that spreading the gospel would bring extraordinary riches in its train. In his Diverse Voyages Touching the Discovery of America, 1582, a quarto promoting Sir Humphrey Gilbert's voyage to plant a colony in America, Hacklett regaled potential investors and colonists that God rewarded the industrious with material as well as spiritual wealth. Although we forget that godliness is great riches, Hacklett mused happily that if we first seek the kingdom of God, all other things will be given unto us. There were ample earthly returns on investment in the extension of God's dominion. Lasting riches do wait upon them that are zealous for the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. Recounting his own maritime career, Hacklett held up his success as a parable of special providence. Struggling near the coast of Scotland, God gave Hacklett and his crew, through his grace and accustomed goodness, a meetly favorable wind. Elsewhere, God deigned to send us very fair weather. Hacklett's God also regulated the commodity markets, enabling the discovery of a northwest passage to China for the bringing of the spiceries from India into Europe. Less pious promoters such as George Alsop and Thomas Morton appealed to desires for enchantment before the fall. After spending four years as an indentured servant in Maryland, Alsop lavished gorgeous praise on the colony in a character of the province of Maryland, 1666. Alsop wrote with some literary flair of the superabounding plenty of Maryland, fusing commercial appeal with Edenic longing. The colony was a perfect situation for the soul of profitable ingenuity, he wrote, traffic being the very soul of a kingdom. But it was also a landscape of creation, sacraments of original bliss, the trees, plants, fruits, flowers, and roots, were emblems or hieroglyphics of our Adamitical or primitive situation. Speaking in their dumb vegetable oratory, the natural wonders of Maryland beckoned English colonists back to Eden, effigies of innocency according to their original grafts. Speaking in their dumb vegetable oratory, the natural wonders of Maryland beckoned English colonists back to Eden, effigies of innocency according to their original grafts. Alsop's Maryland was Bunyan's Beulah, an antechamber to the kingdom of heaven. A thorn in the side of the Puritan elite, Thomas Morton linked the animate cosmology of early modern England with the emerging universe of improvement and commodities. Morton nursed a virulent and lifelong contempt for Puritanism, having spent his short-lived legal career defending rural farmers, dispossessed by improving landlords many of them Puritans. 
Tired of fighting the good but hopeless fight, Morton ended up as a fur trader in New Plymouth. Exchanging liquor and muskets for furs from the Narragansett, Morton incurred the antipathy of the Puritan leadership. After falling out with his partner, Morton turned their trading post into an agrarian colony, Mary Mount, complete with maypole, songs, and drunken dancing. Openly scornful of Puritan probity, the Mary Mounters swiftly attracted the opprobrium of elders such as William Bradford, who vilified Morton in his doughty history of Plymouth Plantation, 1651. Horrified by the mad Bacchanalians and their shameless debauchery, Bradford took up the Puritan crusade against pre-capitalist enchantment and moral economy. Rebuking Morton and his band for their base covetousness, Bradford denounced the idle maypole and other pagan sacramentals. Other leaders called it a calf of Horeb and dubbed Morton himself a lord of misrule. Imprisoned by Puritan magistrates and packed off to England, Morton recounted his adventures in New English Canaan, 1637, one of the earliest and most portentous documents of Anglo-American enchantment. Combining promotion, amateur anthropology, and colonialist exoticism, Morton sold New England to his compatriots as nature's masterpiece. Addressing himself to all such as are desirous of being made partakers of the blessings of God in that fertile soil, Morton warned that New England lay fast bound in dark obscurity, a mystery revealed and channeled through the petty conjuring tricks employed by the Indians. Morton was clearly of two minds about these tricks, though he considered the sachems but weak witches, he reported that one Englishman's injured hand had been cured through their congress with the devil. Morton was just as divided about the natives' indifference to hard work and accumulation. They pass away the time merrily, he noted enviously, living the more happy and freer life, being void of care. In stark contrast, he continued to the solemnity and possessiveness which torments the minds of so many Christians. Taking no delight in baubles but in useful things, the natives shrugged at all the superfluous commodities that the English tried to sell them, and what useful things they had, they shared without inhibition or complaint. All things are used in common amongst them. A biscuit cake is given to one that one breaks it equally into so many parts as there be persons in his company, and distributes it. Morton's favorable portrayal of the Indians obscured his commercial and aggressive intentions. Though he waxed Edenic on the nakedness of the Indians, clothes are a badge of sin, he also saw a market for textiles, even as he conceded that more variety of fashions entailed greater abuse of the creatures. After doting on the region's forests, Morton soon recovered his pecuniary reason, giving the trees a prime place in the catalogue of commodities. Immediately after reporting on the natives' carefree open-handedness, Morton remembered that they were ruled by the devil, the same spirit who vexed the acquisitive and restless Christians, and reverted to hackneyed but fateful caricatures of indigenous degeneracy. Morton's apparently tolerant attitude toward the Indians is belied by the very title of his book. The old Indian homeland was the new English Canaan, a plain parallel to Canaan of Israel, whose heathen inhabitants had been violently cleansed to make way for the chosen people. Like the Puritan elect he despised, Morton attributed the destruction of the natives to the providence of the Almighty. Thanks to the wondrous wisdom and love of God, the English would sweep away by heaps the savages, burying the natives underneath the foundations of their godly city on a hill. The Puritans had arrived in America bearing belief in a world of wonders, as David D. Hall notes matter-of-factly, the people of seventeenth-century New England inhabited an enchanted universe. 
If the American wilderness was a dangerous place to which the Puritans came with an errand of salvation, it was also a landscape of supernatural marvels. Like their brethren in England, the colony of saints produced numerous books, almanacs, broadsides, and pamphlets abounding with reports of wonders. Theologians, physicians, printers, and teachers published works on alchemy, astrology, witchcraft, and other strange events and practices. John Winthrop filled pages of his journal with accounts of marvels, prodigies, and other signs of divinity. These, especial providences of God, he believed, show the presence and power of God in his ordinances, and his blessing upon his people. Winthrop's son John, who later became the governor of Connecticut, as well as the first colonial fellow of the Royal Society, was an alchemical magus steeped in the writings of Paracelsus, Rosicrucian masters, and Gabriel Platts was one of the leading industrial utopians. Convinced that alchemy was at once religious quest, scientific project, and business enterprise, Winthrop the Younger pointed to his salt-making ventures as an example of how God, through the example of stone and fire, enjoins constancy upon his worshippers. Increase Mather was awed by the marvellous sympathies and antipathies in the natures of things, and worried that fortune-telling had let loose evil angels upon New England, before the 1692 Salem witchcraft trials. Later, his son Cotton studied his history of the errand, Magnalia Christi Americana, 1702, with numerous episodes of illustrious, wonderful providences. Like the younger Winthrop's alchemical geology, the younger Mather's account of New England's history displayed a sacramental view of nature in which the world's outward material objects signified invisible spiritual realities. One of the key assumptions of the Christian philosopher, 1721, Mather wrote, was that the footsteps of a deity could be traced in all the works of nature. The moral imagination of American capitalism was born in this Puritan cosmos of enchantment, for the God who dictated his covenant theology was the author of the world of wonders. The saints accepted a charge to build a godly commonwealth, a city on a hill, in Winthrop's words, and if they remained faithful to the covenant, the Lord would prosper their doings. But if they strayed from the path of righteousness, especially by succumbing to the blandishments of mammon, the Almighty would punish His chosen and force them back onto the straight and narrow road to heaven. Puritan clergy often reiterated this covenant in the Jeremiad, a statement of the radiant ideal, a summons to recognize unrighteousness or declension, remembrance of the meaning and destiny of the city, and rededication to the founding vision. The covenant was apparent in the colony's founding charter, approved by Charles I in 1629. The Massachusetts Bay Company, a profit-making venture established to generate handsome returns for investors and the crown, declared that the chief end of this plantation was the knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind and the Christian faith. In the world of divine signs and wonders, the greatest marvel would be the Puritan community. What Chris Lehman has called the Puritan social gospel was embedded in the covenant theology. The Puritan social gospel sanctioned a communalist capitalism, a hierarchical but benevolent order that abounded in the works of charity and justice, not the baubles earned by greed and parsimony. Among members of the same body, Winthrop declared in A Model of Christian Charity, 1630, a quintessential statement of early Puritan moralism, love and affection are reciprocal in a most equal and sweet kind of commerce. Since God instituted social inequality to promote mutual love and service, Winthrop exhorted wealthy Puritans to practice liberality toward their inferiors and insisted that the care of the public must oversway all private respects. To preserve the bonds of love and affection, Puritan clergy, 
theologians and magistrates enforced strict sumptuary laws, price controls, and prohibitions of usury on merchants, artisans, and farmers. They invade mightily against avarice, formulating what Andrew Del Banco has described as a powerful critique from within the early capitalist mind of the anomy and callousness that beckoned with the erosion of medieval restrictions on market activity. John Cotton, one of the most revered of the first generation of New England clerics, observed in the 1620s that while a Christian might live a most busy life in this world, he must be careful that he lives not a worldly life. Cotton warned that avarice was a form of idolatry. The love of money entailed a desire for communion with the creature, a perversion of love owed only to the Creator. With that errant desire in mind, other Puritan clergy exhorted their congregations to abhor the chattering and chonging merchant who cheated his customers, and thereby violated the bonds of reciprocal love and affection with his counterfeit balances and untrue weights. One infamous transgressor of the moral economy was the merchant, Robert Cain, often cited by historians as both a renegade and a harbinger of the future. Brought to court in 1639, Cain was sharply chastised by Cotton, Winthrop, and others for his false principles of commerce the most odious of which was that a man might sell as dear as he can and buy as cheap as he can. Braced by their aversion to modern market morality, Puritan leaders managed, for at least a generation or two, to hinder extensive participation in the transatlantic and increasingly global economic networks of English Puritan merchants and financiers. As Del Banco remarks, the Puritans who disciplined Cain and bridled the commercial energy of their congregants were trying to keep the modern world at bay. Yet, the New England Puritans were also at work assiduously bringing that world into being. The powerful critique to which Del Banco justly calls attention came, as he notes, from within a capitalist moral imagination. If as the English Puritan moralist Richard Baxter would remind the saints in the 1670s, God commanded entrepreneurs to seek the most profitable avenues of investment. The line between greed and righteous enterprise would be harder and harder to discern. To the extent that unease with the embarrassment of riches was a part of the Puritan ordeal, the saints of New England had only themselves to blame for their spiritual distress. With his corrupt and covetous heart, Cain was not only a portent of New England's commercial success, he was an avatar of the Puritans' conflicted present, their dream of a Christian commonwealth whose prosperity depended on pecuniary reason. Fifteen years after his humiliating censure by the Puritan power elite, Cain rebutted his accusers in a posthumously published Apologia. Recounting his many civic accomplishments, honorable selectman, surveyor of highways, all-around public benefactor, Cain insisted that his life had borne good fruits and evidences of justification, pointing not only to testimonies in my spirit, but also to my very outward estate. He had not lived an idle, lazy, or dronish life, nor had he lounged to refresh myself with recreations. Despite the almost comic fury of his self-righteousness, Cain was merely echoing the gospel of improvement preached by English Puritans. God had rewarded his virtue with wealth. The gradual demise of the Puritan social gospel was witness to the fundamental dilemma of the elect their quest for a beloved community built on the foundations of capitalist enterprise. They resolved this dilemma with a covenant theology of capitalism, a creed whose doctrinal elements included the affirmation of wealth as a divine anointment, territorial conquest to enlarge the parameters of God's rich and faithful metropolis, a conception of the natural world as a providential storehouse of vendable wonders, 
and a Jeremiah tradition to chastise moral failing and obscure the intractable persistence of the dilemma. Under the aegis of their halfway covenant with capitalism, the Puritan errand into the wilderness became an errand into the marketplace, and American life became an experiment in Christian friendship with unrighteous mammon. In the Puritan gospel of capitalist enchantment, wealth was God's benediction on the righteous, a reward from the Almighty to the archangels of improvement. Among the many ways God enabled His saints to plainly see His providence, cotton pointed to the profit acquired from business pursued for merchandise and gainsake. How shall I know that I have that life, in having of which I may know I have Christ? Cotton asked in The Way of Life, 1641, the quintessential statement of Puritan moral economy. Art thou diligent in thy calling? It is well. New England was never inhospitable to the entrepreneurial spirit. Both rural and urban family producers engaged in surplus production for the market from the earliest days of colonization. As John Smith Riley observed in 1631 of the enterprising migrants to New England, I am not so simple, I think, that ever any other motive than wealth will ever erect there a common wheel. Smith may have been cynical, but the Puritan clerisy saw no fundamental conflict between diligence and grace, savvy investment and reliance on faith, possessive individualism and predestined redemption. The city on a hill was a place of wealth and an abode for the elect a place where Christian proprietors could procure what John Higginson pronounced the blessings of time and eternity. The gospel hath brought in its right hand eternal salvation, another pastor observed, and in his left hand riches and protection from enemies. When Pastor Edward Winslow delivered the good news from New England, 1624, that religion and prophet jump together, his fellow clerics agreed they skipped happily along in the town and villages of the saints. For all their horror of Catholic works and magic, the Puritan ethic became a form of divination to acquire the grace of the Almighty. Let your business engross the most of your time. Mather counseled a Christian at his calling, 1701, but do not expect that our business will succeed without God's blessing. Pray. Honor the Sabbath, shun dishonesty, and give to the poor, and certainly, Mather assured his readers, you will obtain the blessing of God upon your business. As Sack van Berkovich has noted archly of this economic revelation, the wheel of fortune and the wheel of grace revolved in harmony. But first, the promised land of grace and riches had to be cleared of its sinful occupants. When they encountered the Native Americans, cast in the role of Canaanites in a grisly reenactment of Bible drama, the Puritans recoiled from the idolaters whose degenerate customs deserved the wrath of God. The Indians' failure to improve the land offended the saints as unnatural, wasteful, and abhorrent. Confronted with such prodigal iniquity, God's chosen had a right, and in fact a duty, to evict the slothful inhabitants and put the land to profitable use. Frock-coated commissars of improvement, the Puritans embarked on a privatization drive to dispossess the native inhabitants. Well before Locke's justification of improving imperialism, Winthrop had sketched a theology of ethnic cleansing. Writing to his father after his first trip to America in 1628, Winthrop scoffed at the natives of New England, who enclose no land, nor have they any settled habitation, nor any tame cattle to improve the land by. The saints, he resolved, must not suffer a whole continent as fruitful and convenient for the use of man to lie waste without any improvement. Winthrop's God superintended their ventures with a volley of special providences, sweeping away great multitudes of the natives with a series of epidemics. God hath hereby cleared our title to this place, wrote the modeler of Christian charity. 
After the Puritan victory over the Pequots in the 1630s, one devout commander, who had just presided over the immolation of four hundred men, women, and children, exulted that the Almighty had been so gracious as to give us their land for an inheritance. The Puritans considered their inheritance a paradise lost, reclaimed and cleansed, an Eden whose lucrative marvels awaited the labor of godly men. Many New England farmers adhered to an enchanted and increasingly mercantile cosmology. Authors of almanacs and volumes on agriculture and husbandry regularly invoked astrology and the animo mundi. As late as 1713, Nathaniel Whitmore was telling readers of his almanac that the best time to cut timber was in the winter months, especially when the moon is in Pisces. As they became ever more enmeshed in the Atlantic commercial nexus, the colony's yeomen blended agricultural enchantment with an ever more scientific and entrepreneurial ethos. Under capitalist imperatives of improvement, the anima mundi was subjected to the standards of pecuniary calculation. Among the political and clerical elite, men such as Edward Johnson and John Winthrop, Jr., exemplified the spirit of enchanted entrepreneurship. In his Wonder-Working Providence of Sion's Savior in New England, 1654, Johnson, a deputy to the Massachusetts General Court, waxed ecstatic at the prospect of a mercantile millennium. Once the natives were converted or exterminated, the Lord will create a new heaven, Johnson believed, a new earth, new churches, and a new commonwealth together. Thanks to the Lord of hosts, the land was a cornucopia of exchange value. Everything in the country proved a staple commodity. This wilderness should turn a mart for merchants, Johnson concluded smugly, and a bonanza for alchemists, as Winthrop, the Puritan Magus, hoped. Well connected to an international network of Christian alchemists, Winthrop assumed the governorship of Connecticut in 1635, with plans to employ his science of enchantment for the economic development of the colony. Winthrop hoped to set up a new London, an alchemical research and improvement plantation modeled after Bacon Solomon's house, whose members would pursue work in metallurgy, mining, agriculture, medicine, and other industries. Devoted to the commercial expansion and technological progress of New England, Winthrop and his supporters saw no tension between the religious and metaphysical aspirations of alchemy and its potential as a profitable investment. Like his fellow Christian magi, Winthrop believed that the natural world was both a storehouse of raw materials and a book of divine allegories. Salt-making, for instance, was, in William Woodward's words, simultaneously a commercial venture, a metaphysical exploration, and a source of scriptural exegesis. Thus, in what Woodward terms Winthrop's alchemical moral economy, the practice of alchemy fostered God's work in the world, which, in no way, ruled out making money. Winthrop's ambitious scheme never came to pass. The antinomian controversy that engulfed Anne Hutchinson and her sympathizers stemming from the accusation that they believed that Christians were not subject to the moral law, cast a pall over everything that smacked of heresy, and so potential investors either withdrew or insisted that Winthrop scale back the project. Winthrop's vision of a Christian utopia succumbed to the imperatives of Puritan orthodoxy. Still, his kind of alchemical and hermetic philosophy retained a hold on the Puritan imagination. As late as 1721, the Connecticut minister John Wise was arguing that by employing the lapis aurificus, or philosopher's stone in our heads, we could turn matter into silver and gold by the power of thought as soon as any other people. The alchemical dreams of the Puritans foreshadowed later American hopes for a business millennium made possible by advanced technology. By the early 18th century, as New England seaports became vital nodes of the British commercial empire, merchants had acquired an indefatigable faith in their appointment to saintly plutocracy. 
vindicating the ways of Robert Kane to humankind, urban elites demanded the renegotiation of the covenant theology of capitalism. As Mark Valeri and others have demonstrated, post-Puritan religious culture cleared away the last remaining obstacles to a recognizably modern capitalism. In the decades following the glorious revolution of 1688, New England divines, magistrates, and business leaders embraced a new transatlantic culture of politeness, civility, and reasonable Christianity. Christian sentimentalism, that intensification of emotional enchantment that prefigured the first consumer ethos. More at ease in the zion of commercial refinement, the clergy embraced a dynamic, laissez-faire capitalism in which the heavenly merchandise of the gospel was the highest good of a larger commodity civilization. Equating providence, science, and pecuniary reason, New England's post-Puritan intelligentsia read in the new economics, in Valeri's words, a dialect of divine truth. From Samuel Sewell and Benjamin Coleman to Jonathan Mayhew, New England's elite sanctioned practices previously vilified or closely regulated, usury, trade in securities, and pricing in accordance with market forces. On credit extended by the clergy, Mammon had purchased a seat in the congregation from the heirs to the Puritan social gospel. Under the aegis of the covenant, the Puritans had marched from Egypt to Canaan, lingered briefly in Jerusalem, and settled in Babylon. In Jonathan Edwards, the errand into the marketplace acquired the dimensions of a global vocation. Pastor of Northampton, Massachusetts, and the premier theologian of the First Great Awakening, Edwards possessed a lyrically sacramental sensibility. Writing of his conversion in his personal narrative, Edwards related how, while he walked in his father's pasture after his acceptance of Christ, the appearance of everything was altered. There seemed to be, as it were, a calm, sweet cast or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. His wisdom, his purity, and love seemed to appear in every thing, in the sun, moon, and stars, in the clouds and blue sky, in the grass, flowers, trees, in the water, and all nature. Later, Edwards transformed this sacramental vision into theological speculation. The beauty of the world displayed, he believed, the images or shadows of divine things. Spiritual beauties are infinitely the greatest. Edwards explained, and bodies being but the shadows of being, they must be so much the more charming as they shadow forth spiritual beauties. The works of nature are intended and contrived of God to signify spiritual things. Northampton in the 1730s and 1740s was an agrarian town with a vigorous and expanding commercial sector, and for a while Edwards feared that the new market forces were desecrating those spiritual things. Yet, despite his economic traditionalism in the pulpit, he denounced sloth, luxury, and trickishness in trade, and reminded the prosperous of their duties to the brethren. In his notebooks and essays, Edwards became a visionary of capitalist enchantment. If the works of nature bore the imprint of divinity, so too did what Edwards called the art of man. Along with the marvels of nature, commerce, and technology were signs and vehicles of God's redemptive purposes. Reflecting on the meaning of the revivals that swept through Northampton and the rest of New England in the early 1740s, Edwards envisioned a world redeemed through trade and technological progress. Christ's second coming would take place, Edwards believed, after a thousand years of Christian triumph and prosperity. His post-millennialism doubled as a capitalist eschatology. Tis probable, he believed, that the world shall be more like heaven, very soon, before the impending return of Christ, as business, enterprise, and technological advances would smooth a path for the Lord. There will be so many contrivances and inventions, Edwards marveled, 
humanity will have better contrivances for assisting one another through the whole earth by more expedite, easy, and safe communication between distant regions than now. To that end, he mused, the mariner's compass is a thing discovered by God. Unified by commerce and innovation, the whole earth, he wrote with beatific flourish, may be as one community, one body in Christ. The prelude to the millennium would unfold in the new world. Indeed, the scriptures seemed plainly to point out America as the first fruits of that glorious day. The growth of material wealth in the colonies prefigured what is approaching in spiritual things when the world shall be supplied with spiritual treasures from America. From its trove of hallowed riches, America would effect, Edwards prophesied, the most glorious renovation of the world. Comparing America to Joseph in his luxurious apparel, Edwards foresaw that his compatriots, blessed with all manner of blessings and precious things of heaven and earth, would, by the horns of a unicorn, push the people together to the ends of the world, that is, conquer the world. With his imperialist vision of a business millennium, Edwards commenced the long prophetic lineage of American capitalist globalism. Missionaries for manifest destiny, heralds of the American century, seers of the global village, evangelists for globalization. If the Puritan errand evolved into consecration of capitalist expansion, one could argue that the Jeremiah registered their arduous declension from the ideals of the covenant. As Del Banco put it so powerfully, the Puritans, at their Augustinian best, dwelled in a conviction that a transcendent realm of plenitude exists by which human beings can, if they are open to its influence, transcend their moral limitations, or even their mortality. Yet, the inexorable tragedy of the Puritan ordeal resulted from fidelity to the covenant, and that is why its mercenary character needs to be once again and vigorously emphasized. Puritan capitalism was a form of enchantment, for God so loved the world that He designed the market to enrich the elect. Among His magnificent providences, financial success was manna from heaven. Riches were promissory notes of grace. Prophets were bills of credit from the transcendent realm of plenitude. From Cotton to Mather to Edwards, the benediction of wealth as a sign of God's favor resounds through Puritan theology and preaching. By widening the eye of the needle, the Puritans enabled the camel to pass and eased the passage of the rich into paradise. The Puritan friendship with Mammon portended the course of American history. The tenacity of the Jeremiah derived not only from the magnitude of the failure it admonished, but also from the scale of the contradiction it concealed. The Jeremiah explained declension as a fall from piety, usually occasioned by prosperity. The love and authority of God, in this view, had been usurped by the unrighteous mammon. If the people turned from greed and the love of luxury— they will regain the righteous city. Thus, the Jeremiah demanded a renewal of devotion to the terms of the Puritan covenant. But if we recognize that the saints had already signed a tenuous contract with mammon, if the belief that religion and profit jumped together was the marrow of Puritan capitalist enchantment, then declension and Jeremiah take on a different and much more unsettling significance. With whatever degree of ambivalence or hypocrisy, the Puritans attempted to build a beloved community on capitalist property. Thus, the errand was doomed to fail from the very beginning of the Great Migration. If friendship with the unrighteous mammon was really an unwitting fealty all along, then the holiness of the errand would be thrown into doubt. Better to chastise themselves as unworthy than to cancel the errand and reconsider the covenant. The futility of the errand was an augury of all subsequent American dreams of a righteous commonwealth imbued with the spirit of mercenary enchantment. Alexis de Tocqueville was more prescient than he knew when he mused that 
the entire destiny of America was embodied in the first Puritan to land on its shores. Although they wrought the most profitable fusion of pecuniary rationality and pre-modern superstition, the Puritans alone were not responsible for the American Pentecost of capitalist enchantment. As Lehman reminds us, popular religion in the colonial era, from New England to the Mid-Atlantic and the South, was steeped in magic and folk belief, with many regional variations on what Catherine Albanese has called a rural metaphysical culture bound up with money and the quest for riches. Although Pennsylvania Germans, for instance, believed it an unfavorable bad omen to find money, they also thought that children could be cured of sickness by handling coins. Money would arrive and stay if one dreamed of clean water, or found a spider on one's clothes, or shook one's purse upon hearing the first springtime song of a cuckoo or a whippoorwill. Virginia gentry such as William Byrd II, point men in the creation of southern slavery, consulted cunning folk about weather, planting, and trade, as well as romance, travel, and health. They also credited dice, horses, and cards with magical abilities to determine fortunes. Moreover, alchemy, hermeticism, and folk healing survived in many parts of New England and Pennsylvania well into the 18th century, and their many practitioners attributed supernatural powers to money and precious metals. By the early 19th century, both Christian and occult forms of capitalist enchantment were rife in the New Republic. Chapter 5 The Righteous Friends of Mammon Evangelicals, Mormons, Slaveholders, and Proprietary Dispensation Composed of a waning Puritanism and a prodigiously exotic metaphysical lore, this popular culture of pecuniary ontology percolated under the skeptical eyes of the nation's liberal Republican elite. In the early years of the New Republic, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and other founding Mandarins idealized a yeoman republic of virtue, a paradise of small, patriarchal producers devoted to family labor and subsistence agriculture. Averse to the flesh pots of luxury, the independent proprietor of the liberal Republican imagination was a Protestant Cincinnatus, devoted not to the pursuit of riches, but to a comfortable competence for himself and his family. But if the Revolution had freed Americans from British imperial rule, they remained inextricably ensnared in the volatile entanglements of the transatlantic market. Indeed, by the end of the 18th century, with a rising overseas demand for American foodstuffs and a growing domestic market for household manufactures, the Republican ideal was fading quickly as more and more farmers produced for the market. By the 1820s, the national expansion of markets and the introduction of industrial technology in agriculture and manufacturing led to a boom in business incorporation as firms needed larger and more dependable forms of capitalization than could be provided by families or partnerships. Thus, in the two generations after the ratification of the Constitution, the United States became, as Gordon S. Wood put it, a scrambling business society dominated by the pecuniary interests of ordinary working people. In a nation without a nobility, or an established church, the capitalist marketplace was becoming the new religio, the bond of what passed for fraternity among competitive Protestant Americans. This business society was also a bedlam of enchantments, an antebellum spiritual hothouse, in John Butler's words, teeming with magic, animism, astrology, and divination, as well as evangelical Protestantism. The culture of the occult that combined magical belief and Christian theology persisted in the early Republican Northeast well into the 19th century. Farmers and artisans continued to employ witchcraft, consult astrological charts for propitious planting and harvesting, 
and protect their homes and crops with the judicious application of witch hazel to their doors. The Mid-Atlantic region was the epicenter of the occult in 18th and early 19th century America, swarming with diviners, money diggers, and cunning folk in search of gold, silver, jewels, and other buried riches. Diviners coaxed hidden treasures to bloom to the surface with incantations. One upstate New York money digger advised that the best time to find troves of gold was in the summer, when the heat of the sun caused the chests of money to rise to the top of the ground. The occult also survived along the New England coastline where numerous villages lay outside the surveillance of the weakening regime of orthodoxy. Hundreds joined money-digging companies in search of treasures supposedly buried by pirates or Spanish adventurers. Hermetic mysticism and alchemy blended with shards of Christian doctrine to produce a bizarre bricolage of enchantment. The New Israelites, for instance, who resided in Vermont in the 1790s, were treasure diviners who mixed magic and biblical literalism as they searched for gold to pave the streets of the New Jerusalem. With farmer's almanacs and dream books, seer stones and divining rods, Americans conducted what Alan Taylor has called a supernatural economy, an extensive and vigorous trade in the paraphernalia of enchantment. By the 1820s and 1830s, the supernatural economy had converged with what Jackson Lears has dubbed the carnivalesque spirit of a burgeoning market culture. Fueled by evangelical emotionalism, the commercial culture of early national America featured new forms of enchantment and sacramentality, from worries about the influence of peddlers to widespread belief in the healing or transformative powers of elixirs, patent medicines, and jewelry. Plenty of middle-class landowners employed any fool or con man with a divining rod to locate water, metals, or treasure. Other rodsmen assured farmers that their instruments could protect their houses and fields from natural calamities. The villain of Herman Melville's 1854 short story, The Lightning Rod Man, gulls his credulous customers with claims to magical power. Say but the word, and of this cottage I can make a Gibraltar by a few waves of this wand. Gamblers and speculators, then as now not easily distinguishable, consulted dream books for guidance on bets and investments. The dream of metamorphosis through purchase sustained the thriving markets in vendable enchantment. Still, the Protestant sacred canopy persisted as evangelical Protestantism remade the nation's spiritual landscape between 1790 and 1860. As Protestants who rejected classical predestination, American evangelicals enlarged the sense of freedom and agency of the individual believer. Like their British counterparts, American evangelicals combined intense and often flamboyant emotionalism, an individualist and democratic ethos, and an instrumentalist conception of reason. With their zealous pursuit of souls through missionary activity, revivalism, and cross-denominational societies, evangelicals widened the scope of Protestant authority. Evangelicals achieved a cultural hegemony that could be every bit as coercive and exclusionary as the Puritan city on a hill, a moral establishment that Tocqueville registered when he observed that Christianity possessed more actual power over souls in America than anywhere else. Tocqueville traveled through America in the midst of what historians have dubbed the Market Revolution of the 1820s and 1830s, the seismic upheaval in pre-Civil War society that laid many of the foundations of modern American capitalism, the breakdown of the household economy, the rapid spread of commercial farming, the emergence of the factory system, the development of a continental market for agricultural and manufactured goods, and the proliferation of canals, roads, and railways. The market revolution was the second great awakening of American capitalism, 
and evangelicals rewrote the terms of the Puritan economic covenant. Tocqueville and other foreign observers captured the nascent reformation of the covenant theology. The passions that move Americans most deeply are commercial rather than political, he observed, adding that those commercial passions were encouraged, not bridled, by evangelical clergy and moralists. Both bemused and appalled by the unseemly practicality of many Protestant ministers, Tocqueville marveled at how American preachers refer to this world constantly and, indeed, can avert their eyes from it only with the greatest difficulty. Listening to them, he could not determine whether the chief object of religion is to procure eternal happiness in the other world or well-being in this one. Tocqueville was echoed by Thomas Hamilton, a Scottish academic who was also traveling through America in the early 1830s. Though charmed by popular candor, Hamilton recoiled from what he considered the ubiquitous obsession with money, something that religion did nothing to curb and everything to intensify. Americans were so wholly devoted to money-making that they referred to their pecuniary resources in even the most trivial conversations. Although he never set foot in the United States, Karl Marx captured the covetous, competitive nature of evangelical religious culture. In the Bourgeois Society of North America, he wrote in 1843, Brotherly love was now defined as fellowship in market antagonism. Religion has become the spirit of civil society, the sphere of egoism, the bellum omnium contra omnis. Marx's sardonic comments shed light on the evangelical brio of American capitalism. Under the cope of the evangelical heaven, pecuniary reason and amazing grace were wedded in holy matrimony, spawning the entrepreneurial spirit of an evangelical proprietary dispensation. American evangelicals attempted to reconcile Christianity both with the Enlightenment ideal of secular reason and with the liberal ideal of autonomy. Thus, many scholars have implied that evangelicalism in America reflected and even hastened the disenchantment of the world. Certainly by the 1850s, middle-class American Protestants had largely abandoned the world of wonders that enthralled the Mathers and Jonathan Edwards. Thanks to theologians, clergy, scientists, and other acolytes of evangelical rationality, belief in miracles, special providences, and other marvels had abated by the time Darwinian biology reached America. Yet, even when stripped of portents and other marvels, evangelical cosmology retained enormous spiritual import. Even if special providence gave way to general providence— the invariant will of God manifested in natural law, that providence was intimate and personal, a divinity amenable to human entreaty and effort. More at ease with calculation and hustling than their piously venal Puritan precursors, evangelical entrepreneurs still believed that the world was charged with the grandeur of God. American evangelicalism was the perfect Christian vehicle of enchantment for a newly unfettered, capitalist economy. Baptizing the ambitions of masterless strivers in the maelstrom of laissez-faire, merchants, small factory owners, enterprising planters, aspiring mechanics, prairie farmers eager for cash and credit, evangelicalism was the perfect Protestant enchantment for people on the make. With its volatile mixture of passion and rationality, evangelicalism embraced and composed the tensions between the carnivalesque and the rational, between the romantic and the empirical, between the molten self displayed in revival meetings and conversion experiences and the steely self-mastery increasingly demanded for middle-class sexual probity and economic success. Its spiritual individualism and emotional fervor dovetailed nicely with the fluid, unpredictable conditions of a turbulent national market. Its Baconian conception of reason and science as the accumulation of facts blended well with the quantitative, 
pecuniary rationality central to the capitalist ethos. Business is the very soul of an American. The immigrant journalist Francis Grund reflected in 1837, and the ardor for profit was as great as any crusader ever evinced for the conquest of the Holy Land or the followers of Muhammad for the spreading of the Quran. Far from inhabiting a disenchanted world, antebellum evangelists banked on a righteously lucrative agreement with God and mammon. The preachers whose worldly homilies puzzled Tocqueville were expounding a new covenant theology of economics. They believed as strongly as Mather and Edwards that capitalism had been inscribed into the world by God, and they turned the moral maxims of the Puritans into a science of market society. The nation's clerical economists, as Stuart Davenport has dubbed them, placed Adam Smith's economics on a par with Newton's physics and William Paley's natural theology. Representing the entrepreneurial class of the Northeast and the expanding West, these prophets of prosperity aspired to transform economics into a cheerful science. In the new evangelical economic cosmology, natural law and invisible forces lay down together in harmony. Pecuniary reason discerned and enforced the economy decreed by God. Fusing the science of economics and the science of divinity, America's first economists comprised a clerisy of evangelical enchantment. To the clerical economists, political economy is an offspring of the Christian religion, as one Methodist journal declared in 1863. Horace Bushnell and others explained the metaphysics of Christian capitalism. As the Congregationalist pastor to the merchants and bankers of Hartford, Connecticut, Bushnell offered Christian nurture to the creditworthy souls of the Protestant patricianate, informing his congregants that their wealth was a reward and honor which God delights to bestow upon an upright people. If the outer world is the vast dictionary and grammar of thought we speak of, he continued, then it is also itself an organ throughout of intelligence, the intelligence of the universal author. Francis Wayland asserted in The Elements of Political Economy, 1837, that his discipline described the systematic arrangement of the laws which God has established, surveying the machinery of commerce and finance. Henry A. Boardman, a Presbyterian pastor in Philadelphia and author of The Bible in the Counting House, 1856, an oft-cited collection of sermons, reminded readers that the power that moves it is out of sight. Likewise, Orville Dewey, Unitarian pastor in Gloucester and New Bedford, and a popular lecturer, preached that commerce was the germ, the original spring that has put all other springs in action. As the possessor and dispenser of all the riches of the universe, God was present in every counting room and warehouse of yonder mart. Indeed, his presence made them holy ground. Dewey prevailed on bankers and other lawful conjurers of early finance capital to refurbish the Temple of Mammon into the Temple of God. Yet, Dewey and other homilists could never clearly distinguish between the fearsome magic of the devil and the wholesome sacraments of the marketplace. The greatest circuit rider for Christian capitalism was Charles Grandison Finney, the star revivalist of the Second Great Awakening. Once an up-and-coming attorney, Finney turned to the Presbyterian ministry after a powerful conversion experience. Savvy, charismatic, and blessed with the vernacular charm of the hustling preacher, he soon became pastor of New York's Broadway Tabernacle, a church founded, attended, and bankrolled by Louis Tappan, scion of one of Gotham's leading mercantile families. The capitalist market was, in Finney's view, the earthly bourse of God's cosmic estate. As the proprietor of the universe, God entrusted his property to the faithful business person who, as God's steward, 
was obliged to take advantage of the market, to improve every opportunity to promote God's interest. You have God's money in your hands, he reminded his well-remunerated Christian stewards. On Judgment Day, an accounting would be required of every penny in the Almighty's portfolio. Finney warned that the enlargement of material wealth would be a high but not exclusive priority in that posthumous audit. Besides a report on their accumulative prowess, God's chosen moneymen would be judged by their support of churches, schools, ministries, and philanthropies. Yet, Finney was also ambivalent about the fusion of faith and pecuniary reason that he fostered. While he warned that Christians are by no means to conform to the business maxims of the world— he increasingly feared that those very maxims were now the marrow of Christian stewardship. After he left the tabernacle and moved to northern Ohio, where he soon became president of Oberlin College, another Tappan venture, Finney lamented his own complicity in erasing the line between stewardship and avarice. Schooled in what he called the arithmetic of faith, too many revivalists, he asserted, were denaturing genuine preaching into mere practical skill in the art of bringing about an excitement. Relying on so much policy and machinery, so much dependence upon means and measures, so much of man and so little of God, the saving of souls was looking more and more like the accumulation of capital. Still, fretful that he had erred in manner and spirit, Finney could offer nothing beyond pious boilerplate to clarify the difference between faith and self-delusion, between God's money and Satan's coin, or between stewardship and exploitation. Exhorting their listeners to be friends of the unrighteous mammon, evangelical preachers, Finney rude, had inadvertently indentured them to two masters. As masters of all they surveyed, Southern planters understood their own servility to mammon as the practice of order and regulated freedom, in the words of John Henley Thornwell, one of the more erudite theological champions of chattel slavery and the expansive Empire of Cotton. Until fairly recently, racial slavery in the antebellum South had been seen as in but not of North Atlantic capitalism. Pre-capitalist inefficient and unprofitable, and paternalist or seigneurialist in its ethos. Historians now consider Southern slavery a crucial feature of mid-nineteenth century capitalism. Its planters were not atavistic feudal barons, but profit-maximizing entrepreneurs. Trailblazers in finance, accounting, and management, their money headed north for investment by assiduous evangelical bankers and industrialists, Enlisting in capitalist modernity as eagerly as their northern evangelical brethren, southern divines and regular clergy defended slavery as proceeding from the Lord. They justified the repression and violence of King Cotton as interwoven with the progress of Christianity, as one minister in Virginia asserted in 1861, and some even contended that slavery itself was a school of instruction in free labor, since freedom meant the development of the bourgeois virtues of self-restraint and methodical enterprise. However the evangelical case for black servitude was made, the stronghold of slavery is in the pulpit, Frederick Douglass told a New York audience in 1847. Southern evangelicals, clerical and lay, pronounced the most ardent benedictions on the bustling traffic in African-American flesh. Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. He wrote in his autobiography, The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit, and the pulpit, in turn, covers his infernal business with the garb of Christianity. Like the northern machinery of commerce and finance, Supervised by Finney's Proprietor of the Universe, the evangelical apparatus of white supremacy in the South envisioned God as the cosmic overseer, the master whose dominion extended from natural phenomena to the vicissitudes of history. Just as, 
A sparrow cannot fall to the ground without a special providence. As one pastor mused in 1861, so history, one of his earlier brethren had declared, had permitted the black man to be brought here and subjected to the disciplines of slavery. However dark, mysterious, and unpleasant these dispensations may appear to you, a Mississippi Baptist convention told slaves, rest assured that we have no doubt they are founded in wisdom and goodness, provided through preaching and whipping the master's tutelage in the gospel aligned lissomely with the lucrative tyranny endemic to southern slavery. Despite the fact that you possess immortal souls, one Kentucky captor told his human commodities, the great God above has made you for the benefit of the white man. Once enslaved, or rather liberated from the bondage of paganism for the profit of evangelical entrepreneurs, the master's oversight was inescapable. Let servants serve their masters as faithfully behind their backs as before their faces, the Georgia clergyman and planter Charles C. Jones catechized in 1837. God is present to see, if their masters are not. When the masters were present to see, the more religious among them were remembered by slaves to be especially greedy and punitive. One ex-slave recalled that his master, a religious man, couldn't see anything but cotton bales. While a freed woman recalled in 1863 that the Christians oppress you more. Religious slaveholders are the worst, meanest and basest, Douglas reflected, recounting the tale of one master, a devout evangelical and a robust practitioner of the pushing system, who preemptively brutalized slaves for sins or crimes before they committed them. Aiming at evangelicalism in general, Douglas denied that this pious and self-serving brutality was peculiar to slaveholder Christianity. Enjoining patient submission to injustice was strictly true of the overwhelming mass of professed Christians in America. As essential to the evangelical proprietary dispensation as Indian dispossession and genocide, antebellum slavery was a form of white Christian bondage to the enchantments of mammon. Trading in yet another parody of freedom, self-improvement writers joined evangelical business people and planters in befriending the unrighteous mammon. Apostles of the Self-Made Man these tutors in upward mobility were folk theologians and moral philosophers. The maxims and business advice contained in self-improvement literature are drearily familiar. Methodical at work, unremitting in frugality, leery of liquor and dangerous women, observant of the Sabbath and literate in the Bible, these traits defined the quintessence of evangelical capitalist humanism. Yet, some writers realized that a profound contradiction lay at the heart of the gospel of self-creation. How could people make themselves and still remain utterly dependent on the will of the Creator? The more ingenious purveyors of self-improvement resolved the problem by turning self-creation into a partnership with divine power. Though self-improvement tracts and manuals focused on the cultivation of good and remunerative habits, an ontology of divine participation lurked in the interstices of bourgeois moralism. As John Frost, author of several popular volumes on self-improvement, informed The Young Merchant, 1841, God as the supreme disposer of all things giveth thee power to get wealth. The most metaphysically adept of the self-improvement apostolate was Timothy Shea Arthur, a regular contributor to Gaudy's Lady's Book, and the author of Ten Nights in a Barroom and What I Saw There, 1851, a classic of temperance fiction. Arthur opened his Advice for Young Men on Their Duties and Conduct in Life, 1847, with what might seem to be an odd disquisition on the subtleties of theology and philosophy. The natural body is the material form with which the spiritual body clothes itself. 
However amateurish Arthur's metaphysical speculations may appear, they point to the persistence of enchantment in the culture of self-creation. In The Ways of Providence, 1852, a popular collection of short stories and vignettes on success, Arthur frequently invoked divine agency rather than individual effort as the crucial factor in business. One story, Don't Be Discouraged, features Henry Grant, a pious and hard-working young man who has nevertheless failed in all his business ventures. In despair, Henry seeks counsel from an older entrepreneur, Mr. Linton. The fates, I believe, are against me, he broods. Rather than offer moral advice to the young failure, Linton corrects Henry's theological errors. What do you mean by the fates? You can only mean, of course, that divine being who is the author of our existence and the controller of our destinies. Henry walks away unconvinced, but after yet more failure, debt, and despondency, he experiences an epiphany, realizing that happiness must flow from an internal state, fellowship with the controller of our destinies. Epiphany also plays a role in The Merchant's Dream, in which Algeron, a wealthy clothier, feels that his life is worthless. One night a beautiful woman visits Algeron in a dream. A Beatrice of moral economy, she leads the merchant past a cottage, a shop, and a farm, reminding him that his calling clothes and employs their inhabitants. I have been taught, he reflects the next morning, not by a mere phantom of the imagination, but by truth herself, beautiful truth. At the top of the self-improvement clerisy sat Freeman Hunt, whose career suggests that American business journalism arose, in part, as a religious enterprise. An editor and publisher with magazines in Boston and New York, Hunt was first and foremost a proselytizer for American business, who worried that not a single magazine of high or low pretensions existed to represent or to advocate the claims of commerce. Eager to promote the gospel, he founded in 1839 Hunt's Merchants Magazine, the first monthly business periodical in America, providing statistical reports and analyses of every sector of the national economy, from agriculture, trade and manufacturing, to banking, navigation and business law, Hunt's was the nation's leading business publication before the Civil War. But Hunt's also blended business reportage with moral instruction and religious pedagogy, providing an unsystematic theology for the nation's entrepreneurial vanguard. In addition to the encyclopedic business data, Hunt's offered featured profiles of successful merchants, bankers and manufacturers, all of whom exemplified the classic traits of the self-driven Protestant workhorse. Near the end of his life, Hunt edited two volumes dedicated to the lives of American merchants. 1858. The Plutarch of Merchant Capital, Hunt resolved to place business people on the level of monarchs, philosophers, artists, and saints. Paragons of moral and intestinal fortitude, Hunt's merchants were men of enterprise, men of intellect, men of religion. Hunt's portrayal of the American capitalist reflected a pecuniary form of enchantment. As his hefty volume of lessons on worth and wealth, 1856, attests, Hunt was a theologian of business culture, portraying commercial life as a liturgical practice, a mercenary way of being in the world. Far from being a secret outpost of mammon, the Christian merchant's counting-house or shop was instead a sanctuary, a tabernacle of the Lord. Indeed, Hunt depicted the little chapel of accumulation as the gilded antechamber to paradise. For the upright proprietor, his profession of religion is all practice, a good man is just as near heaven in his shop as in his church, at work as at prayer. 
Intimate with divinity in his daily affairs, the business person was a chaplain of capital, celebrating the Eucharistic consecration of the market. He makes all work sacramental. He communes with God and man in buying and selling, communion in both kinds. At his best, the capitalist entered the communion of saints, Peter, Paul, Benedict, Francis, Catherine of Siena, no saint stands higher than this saint of trade, Hunt declared. The saint of the nineteenth century is the good merchant. Beatified on account of his pecuniary prowess, the holy man of business should command our reverence in every venue of religious practice. Build him a shrine in bank and church, in the market and the exchange. Hunt might have added the inventor and the pioneer to his list of modern saints, as the evangelical partnership with Mammon inspired two brands of American eschatology, what Perry Miller and David Nye have dubbed the technological sublime, the mesmerizing veneration of technology and its creators, and the conviction that the nation had a manifest destiny both to possess the continent and to superintend the redemption of the world. Among evangelicals, the Protestant errand into the marketplace authorized both a Promethean mission of technological mastery and a ruthless adventure in imperial expansion. Preceded by John Winthrop Jr.'s alchemical passions and Jonathan Edwards' enthusiasm for contrivances, the evangelical technological sublime dovetailed with the popular culture of early American science— which often blended the fading world of marvels with the emerging universe of scientific modernity. Like the line that separated the genuine from the fraudulent in the bustling market economy, the distinction between inventor and mountebank was often difficult to draw. Students of electricity, for instance, recalled the alchemical magi in their enthusiasm. If more pious Protestants suspected scientists of playing with God's fire, many others greeted developments in electrical science with amazement and anticipation. Often itinerant salespeople, many of the earliest electrical scientists skirted the boundaries between science, technology, and entertainment. While the proliferation of lightning rods testified to the more practical hopes for electricity— Electrical scientists also provided spectacles of convulsion in parlors, churches, barns, and theaters. Yet, electrical science also ministered to more ineffable spiritual desires. In the 1780s and 1790s, advocate of what James Del Borgo has called electrical humanitarianism, marketed electrotherapies that enlisted what one physician— T. Gale of upstate New York, dubbed the soul of the universe in the cure of mental and physical diseases. For Gale, his fellow electrotherapists and their numerous patients, electricity was a material current of divine love. Matter and spirit, nature and grace, were different aspects of a single reality. God, for Gale, was the spiritual son whose love was spiritual nutrition. Electricity was that spiritual substance in material form, participation of the same element as the natural sun diffused through all the natural world. There was, in Gale's view, no animation in the natural world except by the heat of the ethereal fire. Echoing Edwards, Gale believed that the discovery of electricity and its divine healing properties augured a worldwide Christian millennium. As the vanguard of the millennium, evangelicals claimed technology for Christ in the years preceding the Civil War, recasting the Enlightenment commitment to invention as a project in Christian dominion. Although, as late as 1856, one evangelical writer was warning that technological euphoria proved that mammon has the heart of the age, most of his brethren greeted technology with millennial expectation. The expanding infrastructure of canals, 
railroads, and turnpikes was a moral machine, one writer argued in 1836, an enormous device to perfect the civilization and elevate the moral character of the people. Celebrating the opening of the Cleveland and Columbus Railroad in 1851, one minister greeted the Great Thoroughfare as a sign of the evolution of divine purposes, infinite, eternal, evidence of the progress of Christianity and the coming reign of Christ. The editors of Scientific American agreed, welcoming improvements in haymaking technology in 1860 with eschatological fanfare. Are not our inventors absolutely ushering in the very dawn of the millennium? Amid the innovations in transport, communication, and production technology, the latter exemplified in the American system of manufacture and interchangeable parts, Edwards's prophecy of contrivances appeared to have been vindicated. The post-millennial eschatology of technological progress received support from writers such as Jacob Bigelow, appointed Harvard's first Rumford Professor of the Physical and Mathematical Sciences as Applied to the Useful Arts, in 1819, Bigelow later served as President of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, expressly targeting his popular survey of The Elements of Technology, 1831, for the use of seminarians and students. Bigelow provided state-of-the-art reports, accessible to laypeople, on developments in everything from printing and lithography to machinery and metallurgy. We accomplish what the ancients only dreamt of in their fables, he wrote buoyantly, and Bigelow left no doubt that Americans would witness an even greater magnitude of progress. As a chronicle of efforts to convert natural agents into ministers of our pleasure and power, Bigelow's history of technology blended seamlessly with post-millennial faith in the impending arrival of God's kingdom on earth. Yet, despite Bigelow's popularity with seminarians and the general reading public, his avoidance of Christian vocabulary points to alternative forms of the technological sublime. Among the New England intelligentsia, Unitarians took the lead in uncoupling commitment to technological development from evangelical Christianity. The abolitionist Unitarian minister and transcendentalist Theodore Parker mused in 1841 that Adam's curse would soon be annulled by the use of labor-saving devices. Labor will be a pleasant practice, he predicted. The fable of Orpheus is a true story in our time. Defending technical advances against the skepticism of Carlyle, Timothy Walker, a rising star in American jurisprudence, issued a defense of mechanical philosophy in the North American Review in 1831. Walker's brief for technological progress assumed a sacramental understanding of nature and humanity. The stupendous machinery of the universe conveyed an idea of the infinite attributes of the Supreme Being. Exerting the power of mind over nature, technology enabled humanity to attain its godlike status. Like the omnipotent mind of which it is the image, the human mind becomes the powerful lord of matter. With the multiplication of inventions, the image and likeness of God would live a life of repose, devoted to contemplation and self-perfection. Machines are to perform all the drudgery of man, while he is to look on in self-complacent ease. Walker beckoned toward a future of mechanical rapture. Atlantis, Utopia, and the Isles of the Blessed are nearer than those who first described them. Walker's confidence in technology paled before that of the American technological utopians who emerged in the decades before the Civil War. Heirs to Bacon, Platts, and Winthrop, Jr., antebellum techno-utopians augured a post-Christian brand of technological enchantment, setting the stage for later mavens of technology such as Edward Bellamy, Harold Loeb, and Ray Kurzweil. In his boisterous tract, The World is a Workshop, 
1855, Thomas Eubank, an engineer and inventor who served as Commissioner of Patents under President Zachary Taylor, tied his call for unlimited technological advance to a sacramental view of matter. There is a divinity in every particle of matter, he mused. The material everywhere refers to the immaterial. Because matter is the agent on which God has printed his thoughts, science and technology were no less than the study and application of divine principles impressed upon matter. As the enlightened elaborator of matter, humanity's closest imitation of God was the endless invention of new technologies, a stern necessity imposed by the Almighty. Redolent of Carlyle's Gospel of Work, Eubank's techno-utopia was implacably Promethean. In The Divine Economy of the World, Eubank wrote, Man is to have nothing, absolutely nothing, done for him that he could possibly do for himself. God employs no idlers, creates none. John Adolphus Etzler was the most prescient of all the antebellum enchanters of technology. Born in Prussia, Etzler emigrated to America twice, once in the early 1820s and then again in 1831, this time along with John A. Roebling, later the architect of the Brooklyn Bridge. Settling in Pittsburgh, Etzler worked on his first and greatest utopian tome, The Paradise within the reach of all men, 1833, copies of which he sent to President Andrew Jackson and members of the Senate. For the next ten years, he produced other utopian tracts, as well as ideas for inventions and engineering projects. After failing to gather sufficient financial backing in America for his utopian schemes and technical designs, Etzler wandered to Haiti, England, and finally to Venezuela, where he disappears from history. As Stephen Stoll has shown, Etzler's faith in technology exemplifies the great delusion of capitalist modernity, the belief that economic growth can go on forever, regardless of ecological limits. Etzler urged inventors, companies, and the federal government to embark on a gargantuan project of research and development. Returning to Eden with the assistance of machinery, men and women would be free of all labors, full of endless delights and pleasures. With sophisticated technology harnessed to the goal of exponentially increasing consumption, the common materials of the earth, he predicted in paradise, could provide so enchanting and unheard-of abodes, sceneries, Ornaments, dress, comforts, luxuries, delights. But Etzler's beatific vision of automated, mass-produced bounty was also a metamorphosis of enchantment. Like other prophets of abundance, Etzler hinted at the sacramental desire that enlivened the fetishism of production. Despite his hostility to organized religion, Etzler believed that material plenty would offer a foretaste of heaven, and make us so much the better prepared for another paradise hereafter. At the same time, Etzler also revealed the aspirations to divinity at the heart of technological utopianism. In the techno-paradise of the future, man is powerful like a god, lord of the gigantic powers of nature. On this point, Etzler joined hands with post-millennial Protestants, seeking to re-establish Adam's dominion over nature. Yet, by auguring the technological fabrication of enchantment, he also portended the cybernetic millennium of fully automated production. Etzler hoped to attract his American hosts by appealing to imperial vanity. Americans, he declared, it is now in your power to become within ten years a nation to rule the world. He was invoking the American belief in a special mission and destiny, residue of the older Puritan errand recycled through liberal republicanism and postmillennial eschatology.
Over the 18th and 19th centuries, the city on a hill became the homestead on a plain, while the company of saints morphed into a master order of white proprietors. In his Federalist paper, number 10, James Madison insisted that Americans needed to extend the sphere of their republic, seizing the land that was necessary to avert class conflict, provide the material basis for white patriarchal democracy, and enlarge the scope of commercial activity. Jefferson agreed, contending that westward settlement would magnify the empire of liberty, an imperium of yeoman farmers and artisans. Hoping to acquire not only the land west of the Mississippi, but also Cuba, Mexico, and Canada, Jefferson envisioned a republican empire that has never been surveyed since the creation. As a member of the first committee to choose a great seal for the new republic, Jefferson favored a depiction of the Hebrews following the light of Yahweh. The founders' hopes for proprietary dominion were echoed by Protestant leaders. Perhaps the most extravagant imperial manifesto came from Ezra Stiles, president of Yale College and the country's leading Congregationalist minister. In his oft-reprinted 1783 homily to the new General Assembly of Connecticut, the United States elevated to glory and honor, Stiles channeled the spirit of Edwards and heralded a millennial trove of riches. The Puritan theology of racial cleansing remained. The erasure of Indians and their replacement by whites followed happily from God's good providence. With the red menace swept aside, the political welfare of God's American Israel was assured, and its victory was elusively prophetic of the future prosperity and splendor of the United States. By expelling the Indians and throwing off the yoke of English monarchy, Americans had overcome the last remaining obstacles that obstruct the progress of society towards perfection. Portraying the young republic as a heavenly landscape of proprietors, Stiles waxed rapturous on the passions of acquisition and the pleasures of mastery. The rewards of liberty with property have filled the English settlers in America with a most amazing spirit. Never before has the experiment been so effectually tried of every man's reaping the fruits of his labor and feeling his share in the aggregate system of power. If their westward expansion were left unimpeded, American institutions of property and government promised the inevitable perfectibility of man. Summoning Americans to begin the construction of a proprietary paradise, Stiles's oration was a premonitory epistle of evangelical capitalist eschatology. By the middle of the 1840s, the predestination of the elect had evolved into the manifest destiny of all. The Puritan errand and the liberal empire became the quest for evangelical dominion. Alongside clerical economists, such as Francis Wayland and Henry Carey, ministers such as Lyman Beecher preached an evangelical gospel of empire. In his Plea for the West, 1835, Beecher implored Americans to mobilize their pecuniary and moral power to evangelize the world. Referring explicitly to Edwards, Beecher held that all providential developments since, and all the exiting signs of the times, lend corroboration to Edwards's eschatological vision. Admonishing his Eastern readers that the West prefigured the fulfillment of America's mission, her destiny is our destiny, Beecher also portended the redemption of the globe, the joy of the whole earth. Beecher exulted. A decade later, the Democratic journalist John O'Sullivan echoed Beecher's augury, coining a memorable and contagious phrase in the vernacular of empire. Writing in the Democratic Review at the crest of the national debate over the annexation of Texas, O'Sullivan argued that the absorption of the Republic of Texas would fulfill a divine commission to subdue and replenish North America. It was, he proposed, 
the manifest destiny of the United States to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. Yet, Lebensraum for the White Republic was not the only concern of Providence. As O'Sullivan had contended in an earlier essay for the Democratic Review, this manifest destiny embraced not only the continent, but the rest of the world as well. In The Great Nation of Futurity, O'Sullivan echoed Edwards and Stiles in staking out the terms of an American millennium. With its democratic institutions and material prosperity, the United States demonstrated the excellence of divine principles. And as other nations hurried to emulate our example, the boundless future will be the era of American greatness. O'Sullivan's eschatology was echoed and amplified by William Gilpin, explorer, soldier, editor, and first governor of the Colorado Territory. In the midst of a tireless career of imperial service in the western provinces, Gilpin found time to discern the deep designs of Providence in the High Sierras. His widely read account of the Central Gold Region, 1860, doubled as travelogue and religious tract evoking the fantastic, sublime, and bizarre topography of the mountains and mesas, Gilpin also saw portents of American domination. The pioneer people, clear open the track of empire, he proclaimed, pushed onward by the hand of God, advancing with all the solemnity of a providential ordinance, settlers were God's emissaries, indeed, the remaining indigenous peoples, he thought, still receive the white man as a new divinity. Bearing the Ark of the Republican Covenant, the archangels of white democracy aimed at the industrial conquest of the world. After the Civil War, Gilpin wrote of the Anglo-Saxon vocation with even more outlandish religiosity. Reissuing his book in 1873 as Mission of the North American People, Gilpin explicitly deified the economic and technological advance of industrial capitalism. Beholding the white imperium, Gilpin wrote, the American realizes that progress is God. Gilpin's eschatology of progress was shared by many evangelicals who read harbingers of Christian dominion in the sublunary pages of nature and history. To the Baptist audience of the Christian Review, for instance, the stones themselves proclaimed the American capitalist coming of the Lord. One remarkable article published in the magazine's January 1856 issue, The History and Destiny of Coal, implied that minerals were sacramental signs of America's beatific future. The continent's abundance of coal, iron, and other natural resources had been felicitously thrown by the Creator into the hands of the Anglo-Saxon race. God bestowed His geological gifts for the hallowed and vigorous extraction of profit, and He had cleft the rock of ages to stoke the engines of American economic and political supremacy. What prophecies of the future God Himself has written on the solid rocks, the review rejoiced, Mute prophecies, graven thereon in ages long past. What Baptists saw in rocks, the Reformed theologian and historian Philip Schaft discerned in science and technology. In a rhapsodic sketch of America, Schaff envisioned a day not far off when the world would be united in beloved community by the scientific and industrial triumphs of capitalism. The extreme ends of the civilized world will be brought together by the power of steam and electricity, the wonderful achievements of modern science, the leveling influences of the press and public opinion. All enlivened, Schaff believed, by the more silent but deeper and stronger workings of the everlasting gospel. Anointed and driven by the Spirit, the distinctive mission of the American nation, he declared, is to lead humanity into the millennium of righteousness. However violent, avaricious, and wayward, the evangelical empire of capitalist enchantment could count on the Almighty's favor. God delivered us from greater dangers, Schaff concluded.
and will not forsake us. The evangelical proprietary dispensation extended to the most unlikely quarters, for instance, to the Mormons, among whom the aura of the dispensation shone with a special intensity. Despite the obloquy of evangelicals, the pioneers and settlers of the Great Basin Kingdom were legitimate heirs of John Winthrop and the Puritans. From its birth in western New York in the 1830s to the death of Brigham Young in Utah in 1877, Mormonism insisted on the blessed symbiosis of material and spiritual riches, relocating the city on a hill to a kingdom of Latter-day Saints in a valley Mormonism was a bizarre but authentic revision of the covenant theology of business, conveying with mythological bravado the pecuniary essence of capitalist enchantment. While New York's burned-over district was set ablaze by waves of fiery revivalists, it had also been inflamed by the passions of diviners, magicians, and other mavens of the occult, who lived and thrived among the region's beleaguered, independent farmers and artisans. By the late 1820s, these self-sufficient patriarchal households were besieged by small factories owned by urban merchants and manufacturers from eastern New York and New England. The losers soon became human debris in the market revolution. Some became shakers. Some took up spiritualism. Some joined utopian communes organized on Christian or Fourierist principles. Methodist and Baptist churches gathered in many more of the dispossessed, providing consolation and guidance in the arts of market competition. To many embattled skilled workers and landowners, the vagaries of the market looked very much like the inscrutable ways of the Almighty. Success went to those who surrendered themselves, and others, to His remunerative providence. In manufacturing towns such as Utica and Rochester, evangelical economics enjoined master craftspeople to compete with godly savvy and relinquish responsibility for their journeymen. Hammering out souls in a new diviner's fire of competitive family enterprise, evangelical Protestantism afforded enchantment for fledgling entrepreneurs. At the same time, the supernatural economy thrived as economic desperation fueled a burgeoning of magic, divination, and treasure hunting. Occult tracts, almanacs, pamphlets, and booklets inundated western New York, detailing the power of stars, rods, stones, and talismans. While the vanguard of improvement in eastern New York scoffed at rural superstitions, the impoverished, hedged on the power of Christ by consulting astrological tables. Willard Chase, for instance, a busy treasure seeker in Ontario County, was also a Methodist minister. Another evangelical, Josiah Stowell, was a Presbyterian in Palmyra, who enlisted the services of one Joseph Smith Sr. to divine the location of some buried Spanish bullion. Smith had moved to Palmyra from Vermont in 1816 after his export business had failed. Hard-pressed to pay the mortgage on their farm, Smith and his wife, Lucy, supplemented their meager income with divining and money-digging. They never, she later insisted, stopped their labor and went at trying to win the faculty of Abrock, drawing magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. The Mormon gospel of wealth emerged from this cauldron of mercenary preternaturalism. As a young boy, Joseph Smith, Jr., learned the arts of divination from his father. But as numerous tongues of evangelical fire engulfed the region in the early 1820s, he endured a spiritual crisis, reading and praying for a sign to tell him which denomination preached the true gospel. His search for truth took a fateful turn in the fall of 1823 when an angel, Moroni, revealed the existence of golden plates that recounted America's early history. 143. 
For four years, Moroni denied Smith access to the plates, but he relented in 1827, charging Smith to translate the narrative and preach the gospel contained therein. Smith's divinatory skills came in handy. To decipher the plates, he used the Urim and Thummim, sacred stones used by ancient Hebrew high priests, to communicate with the divine. Smith's spiritual metamorphosis did not prevent him from engaging in divination. Two years after his first encounter with Moroni, Smith, bearing his trusty seer stones, accompanied treasure-hunting expeditions in New York and Pennsylvania. In 1830, Smith completed his translation of the plates, which Moroni promptly retrieved, published the Book of Mormon, and set up the Church of Latter-day Saints in Palmyra and several other towns. Local residents recalled his ne'er-do-well days as a shady money-digger, so Smith, his young wife, and their followers embarked on a pilgrimage to Missouri. Though vilified by evangelicals as the sacrilegious scheme of a confidence man, Mormonism wedded evangelical and magical prescriptions for earthly prosperity. To the growing bevy of followers who joined Smith through the 1830s and 1840s, from New York to Missouri to Ohio to Illinois, his alloy of Protestantism and the occult was good news in the maelstrom of the market. Endowed with a febrile imagination and an extraordinary talent for religious syncretism, Smith transformed his obsession with gold into a quintessentially American religion, a grand narrative that aligned God and mammon even more perfectly than evangelicalism did. In a brilliant, outlandish melange of Protestantism and divination, Christ and Moroni promised the advent of a cosmic, patriarchal millennium. And as Mormon patriarchs proved at least as avid and shrewd as any born-again business person, Mormon theology sanctioned America's first unadulterated prosperity gospel. However many ways it directly contravened the tenets of Orthodox Christianity, Mormonism was, to its adherents, the apotheosis of proprietary enchantment. Like its Puritan predecessor and its evangelical antagonist, the Mormon Catechism of Wealth was a triune covenant theology of capital, an ontology of divine imminence, a moral economy of stewardship in which riches are manna from heaven, and a tale of declension, renewal, and destiny that defined a chosen people's exceptional character. To the horror of Orthodox Christians, Mormon ontology was bluntly and exuberantly materialist. We differ from the Christian world in our religious faith and belief. Young reminded worshippers in the tabernacle in Salt Lake City in 1871, and we do so very materially. Unbelievers feared that such a high estimation of matter would subvert conventional morality but Mormon materialism was religious, even sacramental, before it was economic. Mormon metaphysicians barely distinguished between matter and divinity. Denying the creation of matter by God, Mormons insisted on its eternity and indestructibility. The elements are eternal, Smith asserted in 1837. In place of creation out of nothing, Mormons substituted creation out of matter, even the creation of God. As Smith once explained, God himself was once a man like one of us, who once dwelled on earth. God never made something out of nothing, Young asserted to his tabernacle audience. The Holy Spirit, one Mormon writer asserted in 1855, was a spiritual fluid that pervaded and united all material substance in the cosmos. Spirit and element, inseparably connected, receive a fullness of joy. Smith had declared, The elements are the tabernacle of God. Where God in Christianity is immaterial and perfect, the Mormon God, like a hard-working merchant or self-improving mechanic, achieved his limitless glory and dominion, becoming the prototype of the self-made man. 
The centrality of matter in Mormon theology lent enormous significance to accumulation. Since divinity was imminent to matter, the earth contained inner drives to improvement, and as God was, quite literally, an enterprising man, his servants must be enterprising saints as well. Thus, property, money, commodities, and trade took up much of Mormon religious culture. As Leonard J. Arrington points out, of Smith's 112 revelations, 87 concerned economic affairs. Non-Mormons were put off by what they considered the Mormons' ignoble and shameless rapacity. After visiting a Mormon community in Ohio in the late 1830s, a Unitarian editor complained that his hosts displayed too great a desire for the perishable riches of this world, holding out the idea that the kingdom of Christ is to be composed of real estate, herds, flocks, silver, gold, etc., as well as of human beings. Yet, Mormons themselves proudly maintained as one writer avowed in the Deseret News in 1878, that their faith was preoccupied with dollars and cents, with trade and barter, with the body and the ordinary things of life. Born amidst the decay of the pre-industrial world, Mormon economics displayed all the ambivalence of the evangelical moral imagination, where visions of patriarchal mutuality jostled with entrepreneurial hustle. Much of the appeal and the dread of early Mormonism stemmed from its theocratic collectivism. Emulating the early Christians, Mormons officially held their property in common. Families were required to consecrate their possessions to the church, whose elders redistributed them according to need. The Book of Mormon traces the origins and laments the evils of inequality. The Fall of the Nephites the ancient Hebrews who journeyed to America and comprised the continent's aboriginal residents commenced when they began to be divided into classes. Later critics of Mormonism, as well as later Mormons, often downplay or overlook this communalist ideal of the Latter-day Saints. Though hardly egalitarian and certainly short-lived, Mormon communalism reflected a desire to eradicate the capitalist market, forsaking the lucrative agony of competition for love and mutual aid. Yet, the luster of lucre tinged even the most generous expressions of Mormon fraternity. Be familiar with all and free with your substance, the Book of Mormon enjoined, that they may be rich like unto you. In these and other passages, as well as in the prophetic canon of Smith, Young, and other Mormon elders, virtue looks like an investment strategy for patriarchs thinking about the morrow. The early Mormons equated material wealth with the favor of the Almighty, himself a former man who had risen in the world to achieve his exaltation and divinity. In Mormon cosmology and history, the earth is a quarry of metallic luxuriance awaiting the sedulous pioneer. Although believers were warned about the subtle corruptions of avarice and prosperity, their scriptures and prophecies were leavened with a gold-tinged vision of terrestrial plenitude, an earth and a cosmos rendered beatific by the labor of accumulation. Throughout the Book of Mormon, for instance, America appears as a treasure trove awaiting the exploitation of the pious. America, Moroni told Smith, doth abound most plentifully in gold, silver, and all manner of precious ores, a clear exhortation to fashion its abundance into a gilded, patriarchal Zion. In the pursuit of this worldly fortune, Mormons readily adopted the personal and political economy of evangelical capitalism. Evangelicals were so scandalized by Mormon theology and polygamy that they never recognized their affinity with the heretics. Affirmation of the gospel of work and proprietorship, the gospel of the evangelical dispensation. The character armor forged in the evangelical fire, thrift, sobriety, and perseverance was worn to embolden and protect an army of abstemious, 
well-scrubbed accumulators, men of truth and soberness, neat and comely, crusaders for material sainthood. Though it appeared to outsiders like a collective theocracy, the Mormons' tight-knit ecclesia was a vanguard of proprietors on another errand into the marketplace. Wherever they settled, Smith and his followers fused mundane business with seraphic aspiration. When Smith and other elders founded the Kirtland Safety Society Bank Company in Kirtland, Ohio, in 1837, they wrote the bank's charter in such a way that it blended finance and eschatology, stipulating that its funds would be used for the promotion of our temporal interests and for the better management of our different occupations, which consist in agriculture, mechanical arts, and merchandising. They also made no secret for their desire for a global, pecuniary imperium. Like Aaron's rod, Smith declared, Kirtland would swallow up all other banks, and grow, and flourish, and spread from the rivers to the ends of the earth. Later, in Utah, in 1868, Young established Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution, which both patrolled the boundaries of the Mormon economy, even to the point of employing spies to report on wayward church members, and sponsored numerous small retail, manufacturing, and agricultural businesses. Members of the institution posted signs above their storefronts that displayed an all-seeing eye, accompanied by the phrase, Holiness to the Lord. Even consecration was always less than it appeared to be. Consecration was never a very popular doctrine, although it remained a nominal requirement of church membership. It languished as the saints grew in numbers and wealth, and Young's attempt to revive the practice in the mid-1870s was a crashing and definitive failure. Young himself refused to consecrate his own substantial property, which by then included a textile factory and more than 10,000 acres of farmland. Thereafter, tithing replaced consecration as the economic tender of communal solidarity. At ten percent charity for the church, brotherly love was now safely vouchsafed at a lower and always dependable rate. Besides, the Mormons' polygamous patriarchy introduced a tension between the common good and family interests. The elders reconciled the tension through stewardship. Though all possessions and estates were consecrated, elders displayed considerable latitude in setting the parameters of need. The lesser patriarchal stewards were, in turn, allowed considerable freedom of enterprise with their money and property. As a surrogate for collectivism, or mutual aid, stewardship and tithing comprised a consecration of the property interests of the saints. After the 1870s, the Mormon patriarchal millennium was more unambiguously identified with capitalist accumulation. Yet, Mormon patriarchs longed for something grander than a heavenly city of the propertied. In the doctrine of eternal progression, they imagined their own exaltation, their transfiguration into gods. Of course, the eventual divinization of humanity, theosis, had long been a teaching of orthodox Christianity. But where theosis is granted to humanity on account of God's gracious, unmerited love, Mormon progression and exaltation are robustly human labors and achievements. You have got to learn how to make yourselves gods, Smith admonished his followers early on. As one of his chief disciples, Lorenzo Snow, put it pithily, As man now is, God once was. As God is now, man may be. A man makes himself a god, Smith taught, by going from a small capacity to a great capacity, from a small degree to another, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation. Eternal progression was upward mobility transformed into a cosmic process. Hustling ascended from the market into the heights of ontological sublimity. In the heavens, as it is on earth, 
class distinctions, now levels of glory, would remain among the patriarchy. The celestials raptured in the highest estate, while terrestrials and telestials basked in lower, less respectable echelons of beatitude. But for those at all levels of exaltation, the reward for their moral enterprise on earth was sovereignty over the elements. In a sermon delivered in 1853, Young foretold the omnipotence that awaited celestials in the sanctum of their upper-class heaven. The celestial kingdom would arrive, he declared, when we can call gold and silver together from the eternity of matter in the immensity of space and all the other precious metals and command them to remain or move at our pleasure. When we can say to this native element, Be thou combined, and produce those commodities necessary for the use and sustenance of man. The celestial's arrival in their kingdom would mark the culmination of a history in which America played a starring and exceptional role. The Book of Mormon is a story about America, retold in Hebraic typography and recast as a Mormon Jeremiah an unfinished story of commitment, declension, and summons to a renewed fidelity. Out of an unschooled but combustible ingenuity forced to grapple with change, Smith produced the grandest statement of American exceptionalism since Cotton Mather's Magnalia Christi Americana. In the 6th century B.C., a band of Israelites flees Jerusalem just before the Babylonian captivity. After wandering through Arabia and Africa, they make their way to America, a land of promise that is choice above all other lands. They swiftly divide into two warring peoples, the white and upright Nephites and the licentious Lamanites, whose infidelity God punishes by darkening their skin. Like white Christians whose conquest of the continent would soon be anointed, manifest destiny, the Nephites are described as pious proprietors who are industrious and labor with their hands. Like the indigenous peoples whose subjugation and slaughter must clear the way for evangelical imperium, the Lamanites are portrayed as lazy and idolatrous, wild, ferocious, and bloodthirsty, incapable of the diligence and self-restraint required to maintain a civilization. For six centuries, these people live in a state of homicidal animosity, but when Jesus Christ visits America after his ascension, the Nephites and some of the Lamanites acknowledge his lordship, and harmony is restored. The Lamanites retain their dark skin, however. But the peace is tense and short-lived. The Lamanites fall away again, and the Nephites, enervated physically and morally by their wealth, are overcome and destroyed by their enemies. When Smith accepted and translated the golden plates from Moroni, he, and his followers, accepted a charge to take up the Nephites' mission. The Mormons considered themselves heirs to a covenant saintly envoys of an errand into the market, prophets recalling a delinquent people to an arduous but lucrative commission. Burning with entrepreneurial zealotry, Mormons and evangelicals had continued and extended the Puritan errand into the marketplace, and like their predecessors, they confronted a fundamental contradiction the simultaneous allegiance to God and mammon, the effort to forge a mercenary fraternity. Under the auspices of both Whigs and Jacksonian Democrats, the evangelical friendship with unrighteous mammon blessed the democracy of cupidity, the fellowship in venality that Richard Hofstadter considered the marrow of the American political tradition. To borrow Ralph Waldo Emerson's pithy phrase, the evangelical proprietary dispensation was the soul's economy of antebellum America. Under the signs of producerism or labor republicanism, historians have made much of farmers, craftspeople, and journeymen 
who dissented from the evangelical dispensation as large-scale manufacturing expanded throughout the Northeast from the 1810s to the 1830s. But most workers who railed against the nascent dominion of Satan and Antichrist, as one New York artisan put it, advanced alternatives that bore a telling resemblance to a small-scale capitalism. Let no one accuse us of enmity to capitalists. As a writer for the Voice of Industry, the leading antebellum labor weekly cautioned in 1847. To Stephen Simpson, author of The Working Man's Manual, 1831, equality of wealth or a community of property was nothing less than a perversion. Producerism both reflected and was eventually destroyed by the very order it called into question. In the tenacious proprietary fantasy of producerism, competitive market relations had no long-term casualties. The dependency that characterized wage labor was temporary and always escapable. As the benevolent master of the market, God could not consign any hard-working steward to a lifetime of industrial servility. Can it be, the economist Henry Carey asked rhetorically, that a beneficent providence has so adapted the laws under which we live that laborers must be at the mercy of those who hoard food and clothing with which to purchase labor? The answer turned out to be yes. The rage to accumulate unleashed by evangelical fervor, undermined the evangelical economy. As more and more artisans succumbed to the pressures of competition from factory production, proprietorship became more unreal as a possibility and more urgent as a compensatory ideal. Enlisted by Christopher Lash in The Populist Campaign Against Improvement, Orestes Brownson offers a colorful case study in the ironies of the evangelical proprietary dispensation. One of the most prolific and controversial journalists in antebellum America, and now known primarily as one of American Catholicism's most formidable apologists, Brownson undertook a protracted and quixotic pilgrimage before joining the Church of Rome. Born a Congregationalist, he sampled the Presbyterian, Unitarian, and Transcendentalist faiths. In the 1820s, after ordination as a Unitarian minister, Brownson took a lively interest in labor politics, championing the Working Men's Party. Moving to Boston to minister to the city's poor, he befriended George Ripley and other Transcendentalists and founded the Boston Quarterly Review a forum for his fellow spiritual adventurers. He achieved literary and political notoriety in 1840 with The Laboring Classes, a blazing philippic against the new market society, a mercurial blend of the curmudgeon, the pedant, and the prophet he embraced in the span of a decade, Jacksonian democracy, John C. Calhoun and the plantation grandees, Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party, and finally, a pugnacious Catholicism. Brownson's changes of opinion were so rapid and dizzying that James Russell Lowell dubbed him a weathercock. He shifts quite about, then proceeds to expound that tis merely the earth, not himself, that turns round. Turn round he did. In just a few years, from an ardent voice for the new working class, to a cranky spokesperson for the industrial elite. From the start of his literary career, in New Views of Christianity, Society, and the Church, 1836, as well as in the pages of the Boston Quarterly Review, Brownson wrote of political economy as a matter of religious, sacramental importance. If you will serve the devil, he warned in the laboring classes, you must look to the devil for your wages. Affirming Carlyle's evidence of horrid enchantment, he railed that mammonism has become the religion of Saxondom. Since the universe is the revelation of the deity, 
he mused in 1840, then, whoso wrongs a man defaces the image of God, desecrates a temple of the living God. Yet, however gifted his polemics, Brownson never expounded a Christian radicalism, as Lash once summarized his views. Indeed, the roots of his later conservatism, often attributed to his Catholic conversion, are clearly visible in his earlier work. A prototype of the fire-breathing moderate, Brownson was a proprietary believer in merit. After writing the incendiary essays of his Jacksonian period, he grew quickly despondent about democracy, recoiling from the hard cider and log cabin antics of the 1840 presidential campaign. As the decade progressed, Brownson made his peace with the devil. Writing in the Boston Quarterly Review in 1841, not even a year after the laboring classes, Brownson launched into a sturdy defense of wage labor. Let each man be an independent proprietor. He gushed with Republican brio. Unless he fails, in which case he must accept the judgment of the market, which was governed by a stern and unyielding necessity. Moreover, since... Brownson reasoned, proprietors endure all the vexation and labor of superintending. They deserve the greater share of benefits. Let the working men limit their desires to what is their due. The wages, now no longer paid by Satan. Part of what was due to the propertyless was the rule of a wise and benevolent hierarchy. There must be in all branches of human activity, mental, social, industrial, chiefs, and leaders. Reform, he wrote in the Democratic Review in 1843, should be left to the natural chiefs of industry, bank presidents, directors of insurance offices, of railroads and other corporations, heavy manufacturers and leading merchants. Brownson's remarks demonstrate clearly that what Lash hailed as the political economy of republicanism was not the antidote but rather the prelude to industrial plutocracy. As so often happens with populist firebrands, the erstwhile tribune of the laboring classes became a champion of the professional and managerial elite. The sworn enemy of mammonism morphed into a celebrant of the upper echelons of capitalist enchantment. Brownson was the American Carlyle, a herald of wonder at the captains of industry. Part 3. The Mystical Body of Business The Corporate Reconstruction of Capitalist Enchantment 1870-1920 Looking back on the disastrous year of 1893, Henry Adams recalled that something new and curious was about to happen to the world. Triggered by the collapse of railroad companies made vulnerable by overspeculation, the ensuing financial panic eventually led to a four-year depression, the second major slump since the Civil War and the worst in the nation's history. Thousands of businesses failed. Thousands of farms were foreclosed. Hundreds of thousands of workers lost their jobs, and many lost their homes. Faithful to the evangelical dispensation, ministers, editors, and public officials counseled endurance and prayer. But, as savings ran out, breadlines lengthened, and mites of charity dwindled, ever fewer Americans saw the hand of God in squalor and starvation. Populist agitation had already been rising. Anarchism and socialism gained strength in the cities. The bloody homestead strike of 1892 now seemed a dress rehearsal for Armageddon. By the spring of 1894, Coxey's army— of unemployed, desperate men, was marching on Washington, demanding jobs and public works. Soon after, the Pullman strike paralyzed railways in the West and the industrial North. The senescence of the old dispensation was apparent, even to many business leaders. Adams had excellent personal reasons for thinking the old order decrepit. His distinguished family, almost lost its fortunes in the panic and was saved from ruin only by the monetary wizardry of the bankers he loathed. 
After the storm had passed, Adams traveled to the World's Fair in Chicago, featuring an array of bazaars, temples, amusements, and machines. The World's Columbian Exposition was a vanity fair of white modernity, the latest Victorian display of industrial power and imperial hegemony. In the enormous machinery hall, Adams lingered among the dynamos, for they were new, and they gave to history a new phase. In the presence of the Westinghouse generators, he admitted to himself that his cranky dislike for bankers and capitalistic society now felt antiquated. He had known for years that he must accept the regime. Desperate to preserve what was left of their fortunes, the old guard had coalesced behind the corporate order, capitalistic, centralizing, and mechanical, and had joined the banks to force submission. If Adams was wrong to fear for his fellow patricians, their concordat with finance and industrial capitalists ensured the persistence of the old regime— he had no doubt that corporate business was the indomitable vanguard of modern America. The whole mechanical consolidation of force, he concluded, had spawned firms capable of controlling the new energies that America adored. Americans adored corporate capitalism because, as Adams realized, the new economy was a new regime of enchantment. Seven years after the Chicago World's Fair, Adams experienced another epiphany at the Exposition Universelle in Paris, another tableau vivant of progress. Wandering again among the dynamos, he mused with a blend of marvel and horror that man had translated himself into a new universe which had no common scale of measurement with the old. Adams now saw the dynamo not only as a vehicle of corporate power, but as a symbol of infinity. Power seemed to have outgrown its servitude. The sorcery had overwhelmed the sorcerer. Now an occult mechanism, industrial technology was the modern liturgical system of corporate society, and like worshippers of divinity, one began to pray to it. Inherited instinct taught the natural expression of man before silent and infinite force. Though it represented power rather than love, abundance rather than sacrifice, the dynamo exerted a moral force much as the early Christians felt the cross. Adams came to think that the new X-rays were even more beguiling and portentous. Bearing a revolution of mysterious energy, they manifested what medieval theologians would have called immediate modes of the divine substance. Adams stood at the dawn of the idols. The trusts and corporations had vanquished Christianity and established their own devotions. Beckoning to a beatific vision of plenty, corporate science and technology had supplanted theology and philosophy with prosperity never before imagined, power never yet wielded by man, speed never reached by anything but a meteor. Adams likened the demise of the old enchantment to the twilight of classical antiquity. Adept in the increasingly irrelevant disciplines of orthodox Christianity, the educated man of 1900 stood, as bewildered and helpless as in the fourth century, a priest of Isis before the cross of Christ. Christ would follow the pagan gods into the warehouse of divinities, and the dynamo would take his place. If Adams was right, then the dynamo really was an occult mechanism, a graven image of capitalist modernity. And, as the sponsors of industrial fetishism, the corporations and trusts were the new ecclesia, successors to the Protestant regime. Yet others were buoyant at the prospect of a new dispensation of capitalist enchantment. In crowds, a moving picture of democracy, 1913, Gerald Stanley Lee, a popular journalist and lecturer who was also an ordained Congregationalist minister, provided a spiritual census of modern civilization. Surveying the customers in Marshall Fields, Wanamakers, and Woolworths, Lee proclaimed the great department stores the new steeples of the business world. Measuring out their souls before God in dress goods, shoes, 
hats, boas, silk, and bread and butter, the customers were worshippers in the religion of business. Recalling his visit to the United States, the British historian G. Lowe's Dickinson also remarked on the religion of business. But the Reverend refrained from delivering a homily about greed and materialism. The religion of business, he immediately added, was that of the real and daily things. Lee lavished praise on the temples of production as well as the chapels of commerce. There is no reason why a factory, if enough soul is poured in with the money at the top, should not be as spiritual as a church, he wrote in Inspired Millionaires, 1908. Earlier, listening to The Voice of the Machines, 1906, Lee, like Adams, had determined that machinery is an expression of the soul. Technology embodied a spiritual essence, the God in the body of the man. Every new invention is a spiritual masterpiece. Corporations, Lee insisted, had souls, and the soul must be as supreme in business as it is in everything else. The state of the corporate soul depended on its management, the episcopal elite of the new capitalism. The controlling factor, the strategic position in industry, belongs to the superintendent, the man who has the ideas, the great faith of the business, who is the soul of the business. Erasing the distinction between market valuation and spiritual discernment, Lee heralded the day when an executive's compensation should approximate the actual market value a soul has in this modern business world. Others expressed the same pecuniary enchantment in the post-Christian tones of Emerson. Take, for example, Orison Sweat Marden, one of the most prominent exponents of New Thought, descendant of Transcendentalism and precursor of New Age spirituality. A self-made hotel magnate, Martin was almost ruined by the Depression of 1893. Managing to hold on to a hotel in Chicago, he devoted the rest of his life to writing advice for success in business. In more than a dozen books, and in his magazine, Success, Martin expounded a blend of metaphysical sublimity, personal gratification, and old-fashioned bourgeois moralism. While new thought has been identified as a form of positive thinking— the popularity of Martin and other writers also suggests the persistence of enchantment in the megalithic structures of corporate capitalism. When Martin urged his readers to visualize the stream of plenty, of unlimited opulence, he evoked a beatific vision in the enchanting cadence of consumer extravagance. To Martin, the acquisition of goods and money is clearly a form of sacramental desire. Every cell is in the closest touch with the divine force. Once we know our proximity to this force, we achieve conscious union with the divine, a oneness with the great creative, sustaining principle of the universe. The drive for success was a divine injunction to be perfect, even as he is perfect. Success was the fruition of our God-self, this was the gospel according to Emerson, and Marden, who claimed the sage of Concord as a personal hero, updated transcendentalist metaphysics and ethics in the new rhetoric of corporate business. The God-Self was also a happiness machine, a dynamo of divinity every bit as powerful as Adams's Westinghouse generator. Still, despite the plenitude provided by the divine— Nature remained a capitalist, a great one-price storekeeper who hands out what we ask for if we pay the price. Struggle and proficiency in scientific methods, the practical common-sense methods, business-like efficiency methods. The only possible evidence of oneness with divinity was success in the market, measured in terms of monetary metaphysics and scientific management. Adams, Lee, and Marden wrote while Max Weber was declaring the disenchantment of the world. But the blue blood, the minister, and the herald of new divinity 
were arguably more discerning, for all three realized that the new corporate order was an unprecedented form of enchantment. A compelling totem of industrial might, the dynamo appeared in the midst of the corporate reconstruction of American capitalism. Hallowed by the evangelical dispensation and demolished by the market it sanctioned, the ensemble of proprietary dogmas collapsed before the onslaught of corporate industry. Like the deities vanished by Catholic conquistadors, Calvinist saints and evangelical pioneers, the god of the Protestant proprietors no longer seemed capable of protecting his people. The corporate metamorphosis of American business provoked a crisis of capitalist enchantment. If, as Jackson Lears has contended, Americans living in the shadow of the Civil War were searching for regeneration, a rebirth that was variously spiritual, moral, and physical— Many were longing to amend or annul the covenant theology of capitalism. Divinity did not disappear among the skyscrapers, dynamos, and stopwatches. Rather, its ways were reinterpreted by a corporate intelligentsia of economists, journalists, architects, management writers, and advertisers, the point men in the corporate reconstruction of capitalist enchantment. Though demonized by its opponents as a godless monstrosity, the soulful corporation replaced the proprietor as the center of the soul's economy. The philosophy of corporate enchantment appeared most clearly in management theory, usually considered the colorless quintessence of bureaucratic rationality. Epitomized by Frederick W. Taylor and the acolytes of scientific management, early management theory was a mechanization of of communion, a professional reconstruction of charisma. Meanwhile, architects, advertisers, and other professional artists recast the visual enchantments of capitalism. Fighting to establish themselves as fine artists, they attempted not only to embellish the commodity, but also to kindle and impress what Maxfield Parrish called the spirit of the thing on the popular imagination. At the same time, corporate liberalism replaced the free market superstitions of evangelical enchantment with a new conception of political economy. Modern communion, in Walter Lippmann's words, a religious surrogate for secular progressives. Chapter 6 Glows and Glories and Final Illustriousness Transcendentalism, the Religion of the Slaves, and the Romantic Imagination in Antebellum America. Brownson sang his Hosanna to the industrial elite just a year before he converted to Catholicism, repudiating the transcendentalist cause that was then at the crest of its vigor. During its heyday in the 1840s, transcendentalism was the most vibrant intellectual movement in the country claiming the adherence or sympathy of many of the nation's leading thinkers. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Theodore Parker, Bronson Alcott, George Ripley, and others, in what William Henry Channing anointed the Brotherhood of the Like-Minded. Transcendentalists embraced some of the radical causes of the day. Women's suffrage, the abolition of slavery, prison and education reform, workers' rights, utopian communities. The transcendentalist movement gradually ended in the 1850s as the argument over slavery embittered American cultural and political life. Still, several of its luminaries became American icons, Emerson and Thoreau in particular, while its intellectual influence extended into the pragmatism of William James and the new thought of spiritual seekers in the 1890s. Because the like-minded rejected the very idea of a common creed or philosophy, defining transcendentalism has been difficult, if not impossible. Scholars have traced its roots to Unitarianism and to the German idealism of Hegel, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Friedrich Schelling, and Friedrich Schleiermacher, 
who wedded idealist philosophy to liberal Protestant theology. To liberal Unitarians and idealists, the human spirit flourished when unencumbered by the dogmatic and liturgical trappings of religion. As Charles Mayo Ellis, a Boston lawyer and a popularizer of the movement's ideas, explained in 1842, transcendentalists affirmed God's imminent presence in the world and the substantive, independent existence of the soul of man. This soul, or religious sense, this love for beauty and holiness, was unfettered by dogmas and inexpressible through rituals. The soul's transactions with God were not dependent on education, custom, command, or anything beyond man himself. In his characteristically buoyant fashion, Emerson conveyed the movement's sense of joy and possibility. The transcendentalist, Emerson wrote in 1842, exuded a Saturnalia, or excess of faith. He believes in miracle, in the perpetual openness of the human mind to the new influx of light and power. As F. O. Matheson recognized, Emerson expounded a romanticism of the future that contrasted with the medievalist nostalgia common among many romantics in Europe. If transcendentalism was an American branch of Romanticism, then it was also a search for a natural supernaturalism, a sacramental imagination for a post-Protestant America. Transcendentalist Romantics exhibited an enchanted sensibility emancipated from the strictures of Orthodox Christianity. Yet, if they did not long for the past, the past abided in them. Transcendentalism, Matheson wrote, was Romanticism in a Puritan setting. The aroused intellect, Emerson asserted, studies, facts, dull, strange, despised things, but it soon discovers gold and gems in one of those scorned facts. Indeed, it beholds that a fact is the epiphany of God. The wise man wonders at the usual, he reflected elsewhere, and finds the miraculous in the common. Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards would have agreed, as would evangelical preachers and theologians, with whose cultivation of inner experience transcendentalists bore an unlikely affinity. Puritan divines might even have appreciated Thoreau's epiphany in a snow-covered forest in the winter of 1855. Thrilled and enchanted, Thoreau recorded in his journal that he had seen into paradisiac regions with their air and sky, and I was no longer wholly or merely a denizen of this vulgar earth. Once nature appears to the enchanted eye in this Edenic beauty and significance, he concluded, the age of miracles is each moment thus returned. Like European Romanticism, the sacramental imagination of American transcendentalists could have had radical implications. As the first generation of American intellectuals to rely on a national marketplace for the dissemination of their views, most transcendentalists were, like Fuller, disgusted with the vulgarity of commercial aristocracy, who reduced everything to vulgar earth and pecuniary calculation. Transcendentalists founded or joined many of the numerous utopian communities that cropped up between 1800 and the Civil War, most appearing during the prolonged depression of the 1840s. The names of these communities form a melancholy roster of utopian hope and disappointment. Among them, Alcott's Fruitlands, Aidan Ballou's Hopedale, John Humphrey Noyes's Oneida, Robert Owen's New Harmony, modeled after his new Lanark community in Britain. The Northampton Association, dubbed Eden Jr. by a starry-eyed visitor, and Ripley's Brook Farm, the most renowned. Bringing together some of the oddest of the odd, as one Brook Farm inhabitant put it, antebellum utopian communities aimed to dispel the ideal of perpetual striving— abolish the industrial division of labor, and end the primacy of pecuniary reason. Cajoling Emerson to support the venture, Ripley, a minister who left his Boston pulpit, claimed that Brook Farm would 
ensure a more natural union between intellectual and manual labor, and blend harmoniously the agricultural and mechanic arts. One brook farmer later recalled that he and his fellow communards had attempted to build a panorama of industrial beauty and universal happiness. Founded as enclaves from the market revolution, communal societies were also outposts of anti-capitalist enchantment. If the great truth, as Elizabeth Peabody asserted, is that all labor is sacred when done for a common interest, then utopia would re-sacralize human life as well as abolish capitalism. The romantic desire to restore a sacramental way of life inspired Sylvester Judd, one of the few transcendentalist novelists. Highly praised by Emerson and Fuller, his heavily didactic novels Margaret, 1845, 1851, and Richard Edney and the Governor's Family, 1850, doubled as transcendentalist social criticism. The eponymous heroine of the popular Margaret is a transparent, articulate revelation of God, who, when admiring the natural world, sees an unknown realm of purity and peace, the faintly revealed inferior heavens. Likewise, Richard Edney, a poor farm boy from Maine who leaves home to seek his fortune, affirms the love and gladness at the core of all things, and trusts that nature harbors at its metaphysical center a luminousness of good intent. Both characters discover that avarice has corrupted the luminous gladness. Richard travels to Woodyland, a rising manufacturing town modeled after Lowell, and at first reacts joyously to the sight of the industrial scenery. The factories appeared like an abode of enchantment, hundreds of bright windows illuminated every night in honor of toil. The factories and factory life, how it glowed at that moment to his eye. Alas, Richard discovers that the factories are dens of misery and exploitation. Facing a similar disenchantment, Margaret and her husband set up Mons Christi, a liberal Christian utopia of lush natural beauty, effortless tolerance, and unaffected agape. As Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote of Brook Farm in The Blythedale Romance, 1852, the modern Arcadians embarked on an exploded scheme for beginning the life of paradise anew. Based loosely on Hawthorne's eight-month residence at Brook Farm in 1841, The Blythedale Romance is the first modern novel of utopian disappointment, foreshadowing the darker dystopian lineage of Zamyatin. Huxley, and Orwell. Blythedale's modern Arcadians recoil from the disturbance of market upheaval. Everything in nature and human existence was fluid or fast becoming so, laments the narrator, Miles Coverdale. It was a day of crisis, and we ourselves were in the critical vortex. Repulsed by the greed and callousness dictated by competitive market relations, the pilgrims to Blythedale aspire to create a beloved community of labor. With their sweat as a kind of baptism, work, they hope, will be a liturgical performance, creating a sacramental connection to the world. In the first days of their idyllic experiment, they enjoy, Coverdale reports, delectable visions of the spiritualization of labor. It was to be our form of prayer and ceremonial worship. Patient field labor will uncover some aromatic root of wisdom, while rest will afford glimpses into the far-off soul of truth. The stench of manure, they hope, will become the felicitous fragrance of Eden. Blythedale promises a new soul's economy in the reunion of labor and love. But paradise remains elusive. Pioneers of agrarian chic, visitors to Blythedale praise the Arcadians for imbuing the ordinary rustic occupations with a kind of religious poetry. Verse, they would never labor to compose. Yet, as the arduous days wears on, the poetry curdles into the uninspired prose of drudgery, futility, and resentment. For all their hoeing, milking, and shoveling, 
the pastoral bohemians fail to usher in the re-enchantment of the world. Despite the professed desire to wear out our old clothes, the wardrobe of habit proves difficult to shed. Jealousy, avarice, laziness, and other vices bedevil the Arcadians. They also quickly discover that the liturgy of labor is a sweaty and grueling ritual. The clods of earth, which we so constantly belabored and turned over and over, were never etherealized into thought. Our thoughts, on the contrary, were fast becoming cloddish. Yet, if mental and manual labor cannot be reconciled, the erasure of class divisions is impossible. Intellectual activity is incompatible with any large amount of bodily exercise, Coverdale concludes. The yeoman and the scholar are two distinct individuals and can never be melted or welded into one substance. Once again, paradise must be postponed. Blythedale, like Brook Farm, is a failed romance, a fruitless search for a modern sacramental way of being in the world. Hawthorne's disenchantment reflected that of many other Brook Farmers. Alluding to Hawthorne, Ripley, Margaret Fuller, and other utopians, John Thomas Codman recalled that their ideas of labor extended only to planting flowers or washing with care a few muslins to adorn their beautiful selves. The modern Arcadians were unprepared to lead the world into a reconstructed garden. Thoreau had visited Brook Farm in the winter of 1841. He was underwhelmed. I think I had rather keep a bachelor's room in hell than go to board in heaven. A few years after declining his invitation to Utopia, Thoreau set out on his own to elude the new religion of the market. Disgusted by the greed of his neighbors in Concord, Massachusetts, he escaped to a small cottage in the woods near Walden Pond, just south of town, in the summer of 1854. As he wrote in Walden, for two years Thoreau sought refuge from the whole curse of trade, an activity that curses everything it handles. Now, an authority as impersonal as the fates, the market was not, to Thoreau, a forum of freedom, but a glittering servitude. We worship not the graces, but fashion. Aghast at the mercenary civility of traders and enterprising farmers in Concord, Thoreau condemned their mean and sneaking lives. Especially appalled by one prosperous farmer who had named a pond after himself, Thoreau exploded in a volley of dudgeon. Though ostensibly devout, the megalomaniacal rube would carry his god to market if he could get anything for him. Indeed, the farmer goes to the market for his god as it is. Thus, though amoral and rapacious, the mercenary farmer, Thoreau perceived, was not quite disenchanted, like the rest of Concord's yeomen, he sacrificed to the infernal Plutus. In addition to its moral depravity, Christian capitalism wrought metaphysical havoc, a desolation that Thoreau's protest, however sacramental, could do little to reverse or repair. The farmer who roused Thoreau's bile, for instance, transmuted nature with every sale, since fruits are not ripe for him till they are turned into dollars. Indeed, the ambrosial and essential part of his wares rubbed off in the cart on their way to Boston's markets. Recoiling from a Christian hypocrisy that commodified everything, Thoreau beckoned to a pre-modern animate cosmology and adapted it to his transcendentalist romanticism. In Walden, for instance, his curse upon trade follows a description of an Indian feast of first fruits. Applauding their festivals of dancing and singing to welcome and bless the harvest, Thoreau remarked that he had scarcely heard of a truer sacrament, that is, as the dictionary defines it, outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Yet, if Thoreau echoed the Puritans and Evangelicals when he dubbed nature the art of God, his God was not the patriarch of proprietary Christians who had fashioned the earth into a marketplace. 
The earth I tread on, he mused in his journals, is a body, has a spirit, is organic and fluid to the influence of its spirit. The planet was not a fossil earth, but a living earth, compared with whose great central life all animal and vegetable life is merely parasitic. A mortal feels in himself nature. His mother stirs within, in him, and he becomes immortal with her immortality. He must be conscious of a friendliness in her. Yet Thoreau's personal descent was memorable, but unavailing, as individual nonconformity could achieve little when disconnected from any broader collective purpose. Indeed, in Thoreau's case, austerity provided a rich stock of capital for spiritual exhibitionism. As Alcott remarked sardonically, the sage of Walden Pond wore poverty as an ornament about himself. The friendliness that Thoreau found in nature was discovered by Walt Whitman in The World of Commodities. Whitman has, for good reason, been celebrated as the poet laureate of American democratic promise, but he should also be read, to use his own terms, as a divine literatus of proprietary capitalism. Democracy rests on an aggregate of middling property owners, he asserted in Democratic Vistas, 1871, who possessed houses and acres and cash in the bank. Whitman marveled at the acquisitive spirit of the Republic, affirming the practical, stirring, worldly, money-making, even materialistic character of its people. Our farms, stores, offices, dry goods, coal and groceries, enginery, cash accounts, trades, earnings, markets, etc., the extreme business energy, and this almost maniacal appetite for wealth are parts of amelioration and progress. Whitman saw no ultimate tension between democracy and capitalism. His democratic vistas included riches and the getting of riches, and the amplest products, power, activity, inventions, movements, etc., in the labor of engines and trades and the labor of fields, I find the developments, he observed in A Song for Occupations, and find the eternal meanings. A new worship I sing, he chanted in A Passage to India. You captains, voyagers, explorers, yours! You engineers, you architects, explorers, yours, you, not for trade or transportation only, but in God's name and for thy sake, O soul. Whitman's acclamation of capitalist dynamism is more than a hymnody of boosterism. Like Hopkins, Whitman intuited a dearest freshness that inhered deep down in things. Near the end of his life, he professed a belief in the ultimate vivification of worldly things, the glows and glories and final illustriousness, without which they were incomplete. Invisible spiritual results, just as real and definite as the visible, eventuate all concrete life and materialism. Yet, Whitman identified the grandeur of God with the blear of trade and toil. His cosmology of capitalist enchantment is most vivid in his Song of Occupations, where he describes a world of enlivened objects as an affable and generous place, an animate world, a beloved, democratic community of people and things. When the psalm sings instead of the singer, when the script preaches instead of the preacher, when the pulpit descends and goes instead of the carver that carved the supporting desk, when the sacred vessels or the bits of the Eucharist or the lath and plast procreate as effectually as the young silversmiths or bakers or the masons in their overalls, when the minted gold in the vault smiles like the night watchman's daughter, when warranty deeds loaf and chairs opposite and are my friendly companions, I intend to reach them my hand and make as much of them as I do of men and women. Whitman feels thoroughly at home, for he remains fully conscious that his spirited world is made by the carver, the baker, and the mason. 
You and your soul enclose all things, regardless of estimation. Though Whitman knows that his animated objects draw life from human beings, he is not disenchanted, for he sees divinity in the human power and presence that reside in objects. All products of thought and labor bear sacramental witness to their human makers. Will we rate our cash and business high? I have no objection. We consider Bibles and religions divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you, and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life. It is you who give the life. Although it is you who give the life, Whitman's natural supernaturalism was not a human usurpation of divinity. One of the divine literati of capitalist enchantment, Whitman considered all those houses and cash in the bank as tokens of a profoundly auspicious power. As he argued in Democratic Vistas, at the core of democracy, finally, is the religious element, he asserted, a deep, integral, human, and divine principle. The venality that galvanized the Republic partook of a benevolent cosmic enchantment within the purposes of the cosmos. Pervading the marketplace as well as the rocks, the animal world and the heavens, there is a moral purpose, Whitman asserted, a visible or invisible intention certainly underlying all. This moral purpose required intuition, faith, idiosyncrasy, to its realization, and the supernal vitality that coursed through the market would lift Americans into the pure ether of veneration. The American scramble for money and possessions was a vanity fair of beatitude. If Whitman's Romanticism was buoyantly populist about the possibilities residing in the market, Emerson's contained more ominously sanguine portents about the capitalist future. The most renowned and beloved American intellectual of the 19th century, Emerson continues to elicit the reverence of even the most critical intellectuals. Even though he considers Emerson a petty bourgeois libertarian and a mandarin for the enlightened business elites of his time, Cornell West still hails him as a transcendentalist precursor of the pragmatist tradition. Emphasizing Emerson's Puritan inheritance, Lash portrays him as the exponent of a theology of producerism, contending that he carried the political economy of populism into the higher register of moral and ontological speculation. Far from being a philosopher booster for commerce and industrial expansion, Lash's Emerson is a homilist of proprietary rectitude, inveighing against decadence and rapacity. Yet, is this the Emerson who mused that money is, in its effects and laws, as beautiful as roses, or who thought that the nostrums repeated by Carey and Hunt were laws of the universe? If, as Lash realized, theology is indeed the appropriate idiom, Harold Bloom was closer to the mark when he dubbed Emerson the inventor of the American religion, of self-divinity and personal power. A heretic from the covenant theology, Emerson heralded the eventual supersession of the Protestant economic dispensation, becoming an American romantic seer of post-Christian capitalist enchantment. After studying divinity at Harvard and pastoring the Unitarian Second Church in Boston, Emerson began to doubt his faith after the death of his first wife, Ellen. The profession is antiquated he confided to his journal in June 1832. In an altered age, we worship in the dead forms of our fathers. Emerson soon resigned from his pulpit, but he never lost the desire to preach. Settling in Concord, Emerson quickly detected the potential in the growing Lyceum movement that enabled thousands of middle- and working-class people to attend lectures and debates on contemporary issues. Opening up intellectual life to more Americans than ever before, the Lyceums and the new cultural market hastened the emergence of a new American clerisy, a secular but not yet secularized intelligentsia alongside the Protestant clergy. 
As a popular lecturer and essayist, Emerson became a celebrity fixture in the antebellum culture industry. He soon acquired the stature of high priest among American intellectuals, dispensing inspiration and counsel for a people increasingly unfettered from old Protestant and Republican constraints. Anointing himself an enlightened heir to the Protestant cultural estate, Emerson naturally assumed the roles of prophet and theologian. Emerson's first post-Christian homily was Nature, which made him a supernova in the firmament of New England intellectual life. Speaking to the Transcendental Club in Boston in the summer of 1836, near the end of the Young Republic's most extended period of economic growth, Emerson had good news for his friends, dwelling on the message he'd divined in nature. All things with which we deal, preach to us, the former Unitarian minister declared. What is every farm but a mute gospel? he asked. A sacred emblem, from planting in spring to the snowy somnolence of winter. The farmer was not alone in receiving good news from the silent pulpit of nature. The sailor, the shepherd, the miner, the merchant, have each an experience precisely parallel. What did things reveal when they preached? A universal moral law that lies in the pith and marrow of every substance, every relation, every process, and radiates to the circumference. Things possessed this homiletic property because they were more than mere evanescent matter. In all their boundless changes, Emerson mused, things make an unceasing reference to spiritual nature. Yet, if Mather, Edwards, or other Puritan divines might have agreed about the sacramental character of nature, none of Emerson's predecessors would have dared to assert, I am part or parcel of God. While nature bore witness to the persistence of enchantment, Evoking a faith that the earth could still harbor the presence of the holy, the erasure of the line between humanity and divinity would underlie his consecration of capitalism. Over the next two decades, while building a career as an itinerant speculist in prophetic oratory, Emerson deciphered the economics contained in the silent gospel of nature. With the onset of the Panic of 1837 and the ensuing hard times of the 1840s, Emerson denounced the dominion of money that accompanied the expansion of the marketplace. Emerson's essays and journal entries of the time abound with foreboding at the spread of capitalist enterprise. The trail of the serpent reaches into all the lucrative professions and practices of man. He complained to an audience of mechanics apprentices in 1841. It introduced a system of selfishness, of distrust, of concealment, of superior keenness, not of giving, but of taking advantage. We eat and drink and wear perjury and fraud in a hundred commodities. He warned in Man the Reformer, because they have not faith and hope, he lamented. Americans rely on the power of a dollar. When Emerson looked beyond America, he saw a similar autocracy of mammon. Recounting his second trip to England in 1847, in English Traits, 1856, Emerson marveled at the progress of science and technology, but rued the tyranny of trade and the inability of the people to resist and rule the dragon money. To slay the dragons of commerce and money, Emerson turned to the spiritual powers inherent to a true and loving economics— Calling on readers to learn the meaning of economy, he expounded an enchanted metaphysics of labor, goods, and property. He opened his lesson by asserting that every man should be open to ecstasy. If ecstasy might seem a rather exalted concern for reformers, Emerson countered that the whole purpose of improving conditions and institutions was to make humanity fit for intercourse with the spiritual world. Economy is a high, humane office, a sacrament, when its aim is grand. When practiced for the sake of accumulating riches, thrift, Emerson scowled, was nothing but a baseness. 
but when practiced for the sake of ecstasy, it was frugality for gods and heroes. The man of ecstasy looked not to the enlargement of his estate, but rather to the prosecution of his love, to the helping of his friend, to the worship of his God. Such a man was a sacramental emissary, a mediator between the spiritual and the actual world. Emerson's sacramental economy was also an economy of love. Besides revivifying this great, overgrown, dead Christendom of ours, love would put a new face on this weary old world in which we dwell as pagans and enemies. Emerson gestured toward an economics of love in Gifts, 1844, a testament to the splendor of gratuity that offered a glimpse of a world innocent both of avarice and of property, an economy of charity like those being built in the utopian communities of the day. Leavened by the majesty of love which is the genius of God and gifts, the universe conducted the most intimate encounters through a commerce averse to profit. Matter could handle the traffic in love, Emerson thought, as gifts were tokens of a transubstantiation more real than that imagined in theology. A man's biography is conveyed in his gift, and its acceptance was a flowing of the giver unto me correspondent to my flowing into him. The only gift is a portion of thyself. Emerson insisted, Thou must bleed for me. Into what did a giver's blood congeal? The poet brings his poem, the shepherd, his lamb, the farmer, corn, the miner, a gem, the sailor, coral and shells, the painter, his picture, the girl, a handkerchief of her own sewing. Heedless of the property lines drawn on the earth or around the fearful self, the spirit of gift was at once erotic, artisanal, and transcendent. The economy of gift was a civilization of love, a beatific communism. All his are mine, all mine are his. Unlike gifts, commodities were anonymous substitutes for genuine communion, and their transaction could never be anything but a cold, lifeless business. Written around the time that he was considering joining the communards at Brook Farm, Gifts was Emerson's votive offering to the utopian imagination, an epistle for those who believed it possible to live the life of paradise anew. Yet, over the next two decades, Emerson warmed to the cold, lifeless business of commodity production and sale. The thaw is perceptible in Compensation, 1841, an essay pivotal to Lash's explication of Emerson's producerist theology. Still another expression, in his words, of the folk wisdom that condemns every attempt to get something for nothing, aside from the implicit dismissal from such folk wisdom of any hope of grace or mercy both of which involve getting something for nothing, Emerson's conception of compensation is embedded in a thoroughly capitalist cosmology. In compensation, all the world is a market, and everything and every one merely buyers and sellers in it. In nature, nothing can be given. All things are sold. The doctrine that everything has its price was, to Emerson, not less sublime in the columns of a ledger than in all the action and reaction of nature. Praising all the maxims about frugality, diligence, and equivalence that are hourly preached in all markets and worships, tit for tat, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, blood for blood, measure for measure, love for love. Emerson expounded an exemplary morality of exchange value. Over and throughout the universal market reigns a supreme accountant, a third silent party, who superintends all our bargains and makes square the eternal account. Gone is the God who makes his son to rise on both the evil and the good.
We could speculate that Emerson's growing fame and income wrought a kinder disposition toward the market, but the reasons for his change of heart toward cold, lifeless business are less important than the post-Protestant enchantment toward which he beckoned. Emerson's imprimatur on industrial capitalism stemmed from the cosmology he developed in the decade after leaving the Protestant ministry. He had already declared that the practice of economy was a high humane office, a sacrament, when its aim is grand. To Emerson, the invisible force that the world revealed was unbounded, divinized power. Beginning in the 1840s, Emerson ascribed sacramental force to this ruthless power of commerce, a supernatural current conveying America toward its destiny as the country of the future. Emerson's religion of power arose from the ashes of Protestant Christianity. Since, God builds his temple in the heart on the ruins of churches and religions, he explained in Worship, 1860, then the decline of Protestantism need give us no uneasiness. After leaving his pulpit and forsaking Christianity, Emerson embarked on a long spiritual quest reading voraciously in Neoplatonism, the Hindu scriptures, especially the Bhagavad Gita, English and German philosophical idealism, as interpreted by his friend Carlyle, and the tradition of Christian mysticism from Jakob Burma and Emanuel Swedenborg, eclectic to the point, rather often, of incoherence, Emerson's transcendentalism is a masterpiece of syncretism, a melange of astral pieties, squarely in the American pedigree of spiritual bricolage. New thought, mind cure, and new age. The universe is a part of the eternal one, as he called it in the Oversoul, an emanation of God, as he asserted in the method of nature. Everything is an emanation, and from every emanation is a new emanation, and that from which it emanates is an emanation also. This endless procession of emanations shows that change and becoming are the essential principles of being. There are no fixities in nature, he proclaims in circles. The universe is fluid and volatile. In nature, every moment is new. While Emerson's appeal, then and now, owes much to these wistful platitudes, they obscure the centrality of power and conflict to his view of human life. Life is a search for power, he stated flatly in Power, 1860. A joyless, Hobbesian maxim, it would seem, until we see the metaphysical background. For Emerson, humanity and divinity were aspects of a single reality he dubbed the One. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. As emanation and transparency suggest, Emerson's humanism rested on a fundamental denial of our creaturely nature. Everything divine shares the self-existence of deity, as he wrote in The Transcendentalist. The height, the deity of man is, to be self-sustained, to need no gift, no foreign force. This is certainly self-reliance, but it is no theology of producerism, no acceptance of human finitude, no posture of humility. To be self-sustained is to be self-created. In other words, to be divine. Thus, the proprietary self-reliance that Emerson championed was rooted in self-divinization, the anointment of the self by the self as its own metaphysical and moral foundation. Yet, as Emerson himself asserted, if one's own self is divine, so are all the others. Each is his own world. So, when Emerson enjoined his audiences to live after the infinite law that is in you, he sanctioned the endless combat of wills that defines the capitalist order. Unlike many of his current progressive admirers, Emerson never hesitated to draw the economic conclusions from his humanization of divinized power. 
As he pointed out in The Transcendentalist, the distribution of property illustrated the laws of being with wonderful fidelity of details. If the laws of being were those of self-creation, this was, to say the least, a more extravagant claim about capitalist property than any made by the Puritan or evangelical clerisy. More so than Protestant economics, Emerson's theology of power captured the nihilistic energy of capitalism. This enchantment with power leavened Emerson's exuberant affirmation of the marketplace. With his religion of divinized power in mind, we can see that for Emerson, the tempest of the market reflected deeper, intractable, and beneficent realities. As the economy recovered in the mid-1840s, he hailed the vigorous renewal of trade and manufacturing. In Wealth, his most popular and oft-reprinted lecture, first delivered in the early 1850s, he applauded the mercenary spirit of capitalist production and commerce. Now, far from being a cold, lifeless business that drowned love in the icy waters of egotistical calculation, commodity exchange was a vital feature of the world's metaphysical architecture. The laws of nature play through trade as a toy battery exhibits the effects of electricity. The philosopher of gifts now looked to money as a touchstone of the human condition. The coin, Emerson noted, is a delicate barometer of civil, social, and moral changes, with an especially pronounced susceptibility to metaphysical changes. It was the finest barometer of social storms and announces revolutions. Hallowing pecuniary reason, Emerson revered the patristic texts of capitalist economics, echoing the evangelical economists who believed that the dismal science was a canon of revelation. Political economy, he declared in Wealth, is as good a book wherein to read the life of man as any Bible which has come down to us. Rather than inveigh against the wreckage wrought in the maelstrom of the marketplace, Emerson thought laissez-faire was inscribed in the ontological composition of the cosmos. Recycling his views in compensation, Emerson assured his readers that the counting-house maxims, liberally expounded, are laws of the universe. The merchant's economy is a coarse symbol of the soul's economy. In Emerson's new Soul's Economy, both the good book and political economy denied any spiritual grandeur to poverty. Men of sense esteem wealth, Emerson preached, for power is what they want. Though the pulpit and the press have many commonplaces denouncing the thirst for wealth, if we took these moralists seriously and lived lives of penurious holiness, they would soon rush to rekindle at all hazards this love of power in people, lest civilization be undone. Besides, it was an irrevocable law of the soul's economy that each man feed himself, inflicting pain and insult on himself and others, until he has fought his way to his own loaf. Condemning the low political economy of tariffs and embargoes in worship, 1860, he rehearsed the competitive humanism of classical economics. The way to conquer a foreign artisan is not to kill him, but to beat his work. Once fallen competitors were beaten, their care and sustenance were none of our concern. Are they my poor? Emerson asked with a tart annoyance in self-reliance. The sage of Concord also echoed the sado-moralism of British evangelical economists. Debt, grinding debt, whose iron face, the widow, the orphan, and the sons of genius fear and hate, is a preceptor whose lessons cannot be forgone, and is needed most by those who suffer from it most. Dickens's Gradgrind could not have said it so deftly. Like evangelicals, Emerson believed that the logic of business could be tempered but not altered by love. Do you complain of the laws of property? He asked the casualties of the market. Let into it the new and renewing principles of love and property will be universality. This infusion of capitalist property by love 
made socialism as unnecessary as it was pernicious. Reflecting on the revolutions in France in 1848, Emerson harumphed, like a stodgy bourgeois, that the cessation of profit, rent, and interest would make all men idle and immoral. Most of the poor, he added for good measure, have made themselves so, and under socialism would only prove a burden on the state. Unlocked by adherence to the competitive laws of property, magical possibilities for power resided in commercial and manufacturing energies embodied, for Emerson, in the prolific, productive capacities of industrial technology. Machinery and transcendentalism agree well, he had mused in his journal in 1843. Stagecoach and railroad are bursting the old legislation like green wives. Notarizing this agreement in The Young American, 1844, Emerson admonished his compatriots to conspire with the new works of new days. This venal and destructive conspiracy with the new looked forward to an age of filial abundance and love. Admiring the rage for road-building, Emerson fastened on railroad iron as an enchanting magician's rod, conjuring communities at the junctions of trade more quickly than farmers grew crops. The sage of Concord sensed that even greater progress would depend on corporate enterprise. Noting the incipient efforts to plant corn and to bake bread by companies, Emerson hailed the movement which made the joint stock companies for manufacture, mining, insurance, and banking. Founded in labor and love, the nascent corporations emerged from the same desire for communion that animated Brook Farm and other utopian ventures. For Emerson... As for the evangelical economists, and for the rising clerisy of capital, commercial expansion and industrial might were constructing a beloved country. With its plentiful resources and Promethean will, America was the vanguard of humanity. Here, here in America, is the home of man. Enchanted and directed by a sublime and friendly destiny, Americans marched under divine leading, going forth to receive and inhabit their patrimony. Like Henry Luce, a little less than a century later, Emerson chastised leaders who slept or straggled in the service of destiny. Lamenting the absence of a high national feeling among ministers, journalists, and politicians, Emerson looked to a new intelligentsia for a culture of manifest destiny. Who should lead the leaders but the young American? Emerson called upon a rising clerisy, prototypes of Whitman's divine literati, to affirm the promise of the market. Trade planted America, he stipulated, and the cultivation of mercantile and industrial progress would usher in a new and more excellent social state than history has ever recorded. Speaking at the Smithsonian in January 1862, before President Abraham Lincoln and other Washington notables, Emerson bestowed the mandate of heaven on American civilization. Echoing the Puritans and their evangelical heirs, Emerson declared to the Union elite that our whole history appears to be a last effort of divine providence in behalf of the human race. If the Young American is a brash epistle of capitalist millennialism. It also exhibits the ontology of violence and competitive humanism. An essential text in the canon of American imperial ambition, Emerson's Tale of America is also a grim Malthusian comedy. Only what is inevitable interests us, he pontificated, and it turns out that love and God are inevitable, and in the course of things. Yet the course of love and goodness is strewn with mangled souls and bodies. Struggle, failure, and death are the sacred emblems of nature now infused with the genius or destiny of American enterprise. Stealing his audience against the cries of the weak or unfortunate, Emerson observed that this genius or destiny is of the sternest administration. 
with a grinding economy, it crushed and straightened, we poor particulars, subjecting all to the harsh and unforgiving millage of remorseless, divinized power. Surveying the Malthusian sublime, Emerson approved its cruel kindness, serving the whole even to the ruin of the member. Emerson warned that no reign of mercy should be allowed to fall on this carnage. However brutal and tragic, the genius of capitalist liturgy required its quotient of human sacrifice. Subverting our relief laws, Malthus's principle of population is always reducing wages to the lowest pittance on which human life can be sustained. Charity only worked to preserve the lives of the underserving losers— the law of self-preservation is surer than any legislation can be. Draped in roseate beauty, the pith and marrow of the soul's economy turned out to be the spirit of Hobbes. Our condition is like that of the poor wolves, wrote the theologian of compensation. If one of the flock wound himself, or so much as limp, the rest eat him up incontinently. Emerson provides a genteel instruction in the enchanting mendacity of power. It's not surprising that Nietzsche, another theologian of power, was one of Emerson's fondest admirers. Indeed, Emerson is the American Nietzsche, conferring divinity on remorseless power and on the self that finds freedom in its service. If Emerson summoned Americans to build altars to the beautiful necessity. The pitiless and austere freedom of the market held his compatriots' love of fate. The divinization of capitalist power would resound through the next two American centuries, in the nostrums of philosopher-business people, in the casuistry of management writers, in the pieties of cheerfully merciless executives, journalists, and libertarians. Though appealing to the deepest human desire for communion with divinity, Emerson's promise of freedom in the soul's economy was a ruse of servitude to mammon. Prisoners of King Cotton, mammon's overseer in the antebellum south, slaves bore the hardest and most horrific burden of Emerson's grinding economy. Yet, they also bore the most arduous and compelling witness against the mercenary beast, especially in the lineage of rebellion that called on the spirits of their sacred cosmos. More populous, lively, and intrepid than transcendentalism, or the evangelical market cosmology, the universe of slave religion was a motley enclave of sacramental imagination and its abiding revolutionary potential. A plebeian form of romanticism, the enchanted world of the slaves both enabled them to fathom the depth of atrocity in slavery and to envision the possibility of deliverance from a world enchained to the spirit of mammon. Despite what John Butler has called the African spiritual holocaust, the fragmentation of tribal beliefs and practices in the African diaspora to the south, by the eve of the Civil War, slave religion had coalesced into a compound of vestigial West African enchantment and Baptist or Methodist Christianity. Conjuring, divination, spirit possession, and folk medicine blended with faith in Christ's amazing grace. Charms, beads, Bones and talismans complemented hymns, crosses, and sermons in African-American communion with divinity. Barred from or surveilled in the churches, controlled by their anxiously reverent owners, slaves had their own sacred spaces. Cabin rooms, praying grounds, and hush harbors, while the preacher who enjoined submission shared authority with witches, sorcerers and conjurers. White evangelicals often complained of the slaves' effervescent and unbecoming enthusiasm, and rude the spiritual miscegenation of African sacramentality and Protestant orthodoxy. After seeing actual Negro dancing at a service, the slaves cavorted, he carped, in the merry chorus manner of the husking frolic method, 
one scandalized Methodist condemned such gross perversions of true religion. Author of one of the South's most popular evangelical catechisms, Charles C. Jones, complained often of the slave's stubbornly creative syncretism. Although the gospel had made inroads in the quarters, paganism persisted among slaves in Georgia, Jones lamented, in second sight, in apparitions, charms, witchcraft, and in a kind of irresistible satanic influence. In part, this admixture stemmed from the long reluctance of the masters to inculcate Christianity in their slaves. Although the gospel was usually recommended as an effective bromide for insurrectionary impulses, masters knew that it could also act as an unpredictable catalyst for sauciness or sedition. But the slaves' religious bricolage also reflected a desire for autonomy and a resistance to the discipline and degradation imposed by planters as a condition of their own servility to the market. Slaves could be acutely aware of evangelical hypocrisy and enthrallment to pecuniary value. In an 1821 letter to one white person, a Georgia slave asserted that the reverend faced the whites and not the blacks when preaching because they give you money, and reminded him that we are the very persons that labor for this money. Indeed, he continued, Money appears to be the object we are carried to market and sold a heathen or Christian. If the question was put, did you not sell a Christian? What would be the answer? he inquired. I can't tell you what he was gave me my price. That's all he was interested in. Harriet Jacobs recalled that one North Carolina clergyman, a sort of god among the slaveholders, left his congregation to go where money was more abundant. One of her earliest religious instructors, a Methodist town constable, also beat his black brothers and sisters at the public whipping post. He was ready to perform that Christian office for fifty cents. Jacobs also remembered that, as one particularly avaricious slaveholder died, he cried that he was going to hell, bury my money with me. Solomon Northup wrote that his owner, Edwin Epps, a man who remarked about the virtue and power of money, could have watched his slaves burned to ashes over a slow fire or gnawed to death by dogs if it only brought him profit. Although Frederick Douglass eventually espoused a liberal, rationalist Protestantism, his denunciations of the hypocritical Christianity of this land were rooted in the slave's perception of white evangelical enchantment by mammon. Corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, and cradle-plundering, southern white Christianity perpetuated these evils enveloped in a mercenary sublime. In his autobiography, Douglas described slave merchants as devils dressed in angels' robes, and the auctions themselves as hell presenting the semblance of paradise. Unbelievers in the cult of capital accumulation that poisoned the souls of the masters, the slaves rejected and fought the new industrial rituals imposed by their overseers. They imagined a world liberated from servitude to the imperatives of the cotton empire subjected to the time and work rhythms decreed in the regime of plantation management the slaves did all they could to retard or circumvent the protestant work ethic because god and the spirits did not follow any schedules as one ex-slave recounted god's message to him i am a time god behold i work after the counsel of my own will and in due time i will visit whomsoever i will Slaves, believed they could follow the counsel of their wills in heaven, Canaan, or the promised land, the kingdom of freedom so often rhapsodized in their spirituals. But Eugene Genovese, Lawrence Levine, and Albert Rabateau have contended the slave's invocation of heaven was not escapist or compensatory. Like the medieval sacramental imagination, the slave's cosmology denied any impermeable, depoliticizing boundary between earth and heaven, 
and so their hope for paradise was political precisely because it was religious. White clergy suspected as much. Preaching about the Exodus to a group of slaves in 1862, one Methodist preacher in Charleston was mortified by the chasm between his own interpretation of the story and that of his captive audience. To the preacher, Exodus was a spiritual tale about relief from the servitude of sin. But his congregation took it literally in the good time coming, which of course could not but make their ebony complexion attractive, very. Perhaps emboldened by the commencement of the Civil War, a year before the preacher's sermon, the slave's herald of a good time coming was terrestrial as well as spiritual. So if, as W. E. B. Du Bois wrote, the spirituals expressed a faith in the ultimate justice of things, they did so because the slaves knew that justice was built into the very nature of the cosmos, and that slavery embodied a perversion of that order. Martin Luther King, Jr. rehearsed the wisdom of the slaves when he asserted that the moral arc of the universe bent toward justice. As the most renowned slave rebellions demonstrated, the enchanted world of antebellum African Americans could reveal moral and metaphysical evil with incisive and terrifying vividness. Two of the insurgencies, Gabriel's Rebellion and the Vesey Conspiracy, testified to the political potential residing in the slave's religious syncretism. Gabriel Prosser's foiled revolt in Richmond, Virginia, in 1800, originated in slave preachings or religious meetings where Gabriel and his brother Martin, himself a preacher, recruited for and planned the insurrection. Declaring that their cause was similar to the Israelites, Martin and Gabriel would engage their co-conspirators in long discussions over biblical exegesis. Though they relied primarily on the Lord, the Prossers did not turn away the African spirits. One conspirator suggested contacting slaves who knew how to deal with witches and wizards. Denmark Vesey's thwarted rebellion in Charleston in 1822 was similarly ecumenical in inspiration. All his religious remarks were mingled with slavery. One witness at his trial testified, Two conspirators were religious instructors in Charleston's African Methodist Episcopal Church. One of Vesey's associates, Gulla Jack Pritchard, was a member of the church and a respected conjurer who allegedly told the rebels that they would be impervious to bullets if they put a crab claw in their mouths after eating parched corn and ground nuts. But the most visionary and unsettling document of rebellious slaves was Nat Turner's confession, given after the failure of the bloody uprising in Southampton, Virginia, in 1831. Although doubts persist about the reliability of Thomas R. Gray, the attorney who was Turner's interrogator, the spiritual odyssey he recounts seems too bizarre for him to have fabricated. Although he professed at one point that he could not decide whether Turner was insane or playing the lunatic, Gray belittled his ill-fated interlocutor, dismissing him as a gloomy fanatic revolving in the recesses of his own dark, bewildered, and overwrought mind, endeavoring to grapple with things beyond its reach. Precisely because Gray found it unlikely that a slave could grapple with things beyond his reach, his appalled condescension to Turner's testimony suggests that his report is dependable. And besides, in all their marvelous and terrible grandeur, Turner's confessions reflect the sacramental and eschatological fervor of slave cosmology. Like those of Augustine, Turner's confessions recount a life story, his preternatural boyhood, revelations in the 1820s, and a call to visit divine retribution on slaveholders and their families. At the age of three or four, he told Gray, he described an incident that had occurred long before with such exactitude that his parents considered him a prophet 
as the Lord had shown me things that happened before my birth. Blessed with a quick and prodigious intelligence, Turner not only learned to read, but also to develop a kind of prescience. Whenever he looked into a book, he would see many things that the fertility of my own imagination had depicted to me before. As he grew up, his superior judgment, perfected by divine inspiration, confirmed him in a sense of some exalted destiny, and so he began to avoid others, wrapped myself in mystery, and devoted himself to fasting and prayer. In or around 1821, a spirit told him to seek ye the kingdom of heaven, the spirit, he clarified to Gray, that spoke to the prophets in former days. And four years later, Turner received revelations that unveiled not only the architecture of the cosmos, but the true magnitude of slavery's horror. The Spirit opened the doors of Turner's perception, revealing the knowledge of the elements, the revolution of the planets, the operation of tides, and changes of the seasons. He saw white spirits and black spirits engaged in battle, and the sun was darkened, the thunder rolled in the heavens, and blood flowed in streams. Laboring one day in a field, he found drops of blood on the corn as though it were dew from heaven. Shortly thereafter, he discovered hieroglyphic characters and numbers on the leaves of trees in a nearby forest. On May 12, 1828, the spirit warned Turner that the serpent was loosened and enjoined him to take on the yoke of Christ, for the time was fast approaching when the first should be the last and the last should be the first. On a sign from heaven, he began to plot the insurgency, and on August 22, 1831, he and his fellow rebels launched their grisly and disastrous insurrection. Do you not find yourself mistaken now? Gray asked with the icy derision of a pilot. Was not Christ crucified? Turner replied to his undoubtedly nonplussed interrogator. Gray thought the prisoner deluded, but Turner's confession was more penetrating and voracious than all the grandiloquence of an Emerson. Supercharged with wonders, signs, and premonitions, Turner's narrative conveyed an account of a world of absolute ontological transparency, in which the material world possessed an emblematic, sacramental corporeality. Seeing no barrier between the world of divinity and that of human affairs, Turner was anything but bewildered and overwrought. He discerned the malevolence of slavery with perfectly lucid precision and judgment. The turbulence of race and class struggle on earth reverberating throughout the heavens, corn bearing the marks of violence that shed the blood of slaves and therefore of Christ, a beatific overturning of the powers and principalities that perverted the order of creation. Turner's revelations raised the iniquity of slavery to the level of cosmic outrage. They recalled the epiphanies of medieval millenarians, Gerard Wynne Stanley, and the romantic adversaries of Mammon. Turner's affidavit of transcendent barbarism and redemption was perhaps the most powerful and disturbing testimony of slave romanticism. Delivered by the poorest of Emerson's poor particulars, crushed by the grinding economy, it captured the truth about the evil of slavery, as well as the industrial capitalism whose growth depended on its blood-stained products, and did so without any erudition in political economy. The sacramental theology of the slaves, inhabitants of an enchanted world bereft of any secular, imminent frame, bore the keenest critique of the enchantments of mammon before the Civil War.